preface to a texas cowboy or fifteen years on the hurricane deck of a spanish pony this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales a texas cowboy or fifteen years on the hurricane deck of a spanish pony by charles a seringo preface my excuse for writing this book is money and lots of it i suppose the above would suffice but as time is not very precious i will continue and tell how the idea of writing a book first got into my head while ranching on the indian territory line close to caldwell kansas in the winter of eighty two and eighty three we boys there being nine of us made an iron-clad rule that whoever was heard swearing or caught picking graybacks off and throwing them on the floor without first killing them would pay a fine of ten cents for each and every offence the proceeds to be used for buying choice literature something that would have a tendency to raise us above the average cowpuncher just twenty-four hours after making this rule we had three dollars in the pot or at least in my pocket i having been appointed treasurer as i was going to town that night to see my sunday girl i proposed to the boys that while up there i send the money off for a year's subscription to some good newspaper the question then came up what paper shall it be we finally agreed to leave it to a vote each man to write the one of his choice on a slip of paper and drop it in a hat there being two young texans present who could neither read nor write we let them speak their choice after the rest of us got our votes deposited at the word given them to cut loose they both yelled police gazette and on asking why they voted for that wicked sheet they both replied as though with one voice cause we can read the pictures we found on counting the votes that the police gazette had won and so it was subscribed for with the first copy that arrived was the beginning of a continued story entitled potts turning paris inside out mr potts the hero was an old stove-up new york preacher who had made a raise of several hundred thousand dollars and was over in paris blowing it in i became interested in the story and envied mr potts very much i wished for a few hundred thousand so i could do likewise i lay awake one whole night trying to study up a plan by which i could make the desired amount but thinks i what can an uneducated cowpuncher do nowadays to make such a vast sum in trying to solve the question my mind darted back a few years when if i had taken time by the forelock i might now have been wallowing in wealth with the rest of the big cattle kings or to use a more appropriate name cattle thieves but alas thought i the days of honourable cattle stealing is past and i must turn my mind into a healthier channel the next morning while awaiting breakfast i happened to pick up a small scrap of paper and read to the young man of high aims literature offers big inducements providing he gets into an untrodden field that night i lay awake again trying to locate some cussed untrodden field where as an author i might soar on high to the extent of a few hundred thousand at least at last just as our pet rooster deacon bates was crowing for day i found a field that i had never heard of any trampling over a nigger love story so that night i launched out on my new novel the title of which was a pair of two-legged coons my heroine miss patsy washington was one shade darker than the ace of spades while her lover mr andrew jackson was three colours darker than herself my plot was laid in african bend on the colorado river in southern texas everything went on nicely until about halfway through the first chapter when mr jackson was convicted and sent to huntsville for stealing a neighbor's hog and while i was trying to find a substitute for him old patsy flew the track and eloped with a yankee carpet-bagger <laughs> 
that was more than i could endure so picking up the manuscript i threw it into the fire thus ended my first attempt at authorship i then began figuring up an easier field for my inexperienced pen and finally hit upon the idea of writing a history of my own short but rugged life which dear reader you have before you but whether it will bring me in shekels enough to capsize paris remains yet to be discovered as the negro says end of preface chapters one two and three of a texas cowboy by charles a seringo this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one my boyhood days it was a bright morning on the seventh day of february eighteen fifty six as near as i can remember that your humble servant came prancing into this wide and wicked world by glancing over the map you will find his birthplace at the extreme southern part of the lone star state on the peninsula of matagorda a narrow strip of land bordered by the gulf of mexico on the south and matagorda bay on the north this peninsula is from one to two miles wide and seventy-five miles long it connects the mainland at caney and comes to a focus at descros point or salura pass about midway between the two was situated the dutch settlement and in the centre of that settlement which contained only a dozen houses stood the little frame cottage that first gave me shelter my father who died when i was only a year old came from the sunny clime of italy while my dear old mother drifted from the bogs of good old ireland am i not a queer conglomerate a sweet scented mixture indeed our nearest neighbor was a kind old soul by the name of john williams whose family consisted of his wife and eleven children in the fall of eighteen fifty nine i took my first lessons in school my teacher being a mr hale from illinois the schoolhouse a little old frame building stood off by itself about a mile from the settlement and we little towheads sister and i had to hoof it up there every morning through the grass burrs barefooted our little sun-browned feet had never been encased in shoe leather up to that time to avoid the grass burrs sometimes on getting an early start we would go around by the gulf beach which was quite a distance out of our way in taking this route though i would generally be late at school for there were so many little things to detain me such as trying to catch the shadow of a flying seagull or trying to lasso sand crabs on my stick horse crowds of cowboys used to come over to the peninsula from the mainland and sometimes have occasion to rope wild steers in my presence hence me trying to imitate them i remember getting into a scrape once by taking the beach route to school sister who was a year older than i was walking along the water edge picking up pretty shells while i was riding along on my stick horse taking the kinks out of my rope a piece of fish line so as to be ready to take in the first crab that showed himself those crabs went in large droves and sometimes ventured quite a distance out from the gulf but on seeing a person would break for the water it was not long before i spied a large drove on ahead pulling their freight for the water i put spurs to my pony and dashed after them i managed to get one old fat fellow headed off and turned towards the prairie i threw at him several times but he would always go through the loop before i could pull it up he finally struck a hole and disappeared i was determined to get him out and take another whirl at him so dropping my horse and getting down on all fours i began digging the sand away with my hands dog fashion about that time sister came up and told me to come on as i would be late at school and so forth i think i told her to please go to halifax as i was going to rope that crab before i quit or bust at any rate she went off leaving me digging with all my might every now and then i would play dog by sticking my snoot down in the hole to smell 
but i rammed it down once too often mr crab was nearer the surface than i thought for he was laying for me i gave a comanche yell jumped ten feet in the air and lit out for home at a two forty gait one of his claws was fastened to my upper lip while the other clamped my nose with an iron-like grip i met mr william berg coming out to the beach after a load of wood and he relieved me of my uncomfortable burden he had to break the crab's claws off to get him loose i arrived at school just as mr hale was ringing the bell after recess he called me up and wanted to know what was the matter with my face it was so bloody being a little george w minus the hatchet i told him the truth suffice to say he laid me across his knee and made me think a nest of bumblebees were having a dance in the seat of my breeches or at least where the seat should have been i never had a pair of pants on up to that time had worn nothing but a long white shirt made of a flour sack after some of the big bugs at matagorda had eaten the flour out the fall of eighteen sixty one mr hale broke up school and left for yankeedom to join the bluecoats and from that time on i had a regular picnic doing nothing and studying mischief billy williams was my particular chum we were constantly together doing some kind of devilment the old women used to say we were the meanest little imps in the settlement and that we would be hung before we were twenty-one our three favorite pastimes were riding the milk calves coon hunting and sailing playboats down on the bay shore shortly after school broke up i wore my first pair of breeches uncle nick and aunt mary mother's brother and sister who lived in galveston sent us a trunk full of clothes and among them was a pair of white canvas breeches for me the first sunday after the goods arrived mother made me scour myself all over and try my new pants on they were large enough for two kids of my size but mother said i could wear them that day if i would be a good boy and that she would take a few tucks in them before the next sunday so after getting me fixed up she told me not to leave the yard or she would skin me alive etc of course i should have been proud of the new addition to my wardrobe and like a good little boy obeyed my mother but i wasn't a good little boy and besides the glory of wearing white pants was insignificant compared to that of an exciting coon hunt with dogs through brush bramble and rushes you see i had promised billy the evening before to go coon hunting with him that day i watched my chance and while mother was dressing sister in her new frock i tiptoed out of the house and skipped billy was waiting for me with the four dogs and off we went for the bay shore arriving there the dogs disappeared in the tall rushes barking at every jump we jumped right in after them up to our waists in the mud we had a genuine good all-day coon hunt killing several coons and one wildcat we gave up the hunt about sundown and i started for home the glory of my new pants having departed i was indeed a sorry-looking sight covered with mud from head to foot i entered the house with some fear and trembling and well i might for mother was laying for me with the old black strap the result was i slept sound that night but couldn't sit down without pain for a week afterwards chapter two my introduction to the late war it was monday morning a day that i despised need you wonder for it was mother's wash day and i had to carry wood from the gulf beach to keep the pot boiling i tried to play off sick that morning but it would not work for mother had noticed that i got away with two plates of mush besides three hard-boiled eggs for breakfast before starting out after my first load of wood i hid the big old strap which hung by the door for i felt it in my bones there was war in the air i always did have a tough time of it on wash days and i knew this monday would bring the same old story at last mother got the fire started under the wash-pot which stood out in the yard and told me for about the twentieth time to go after an armful of wood i hesitated in hopes that she would take a notion to go herself 
but when she stamped her foot and picked up a barrel stave i knew i had better be going for when she got her irish blood up it was dangerous to linger when i got out among the driftwood on the beach i treed a cottontail rabbit up a hollow log and i made up my mind to get mr cottontail out wood or no wood i began digging the sand away from the log as fast as i could so as to be able to roll it down into the gulf and drown the rabbit out it was a very hot day and digging the heavy sand with only my hands and a stick was slow tiresome work the result was i fell asleep with my head under the log and my bare legs sticking out in the hot june sun i dreamt i died and went to a dreadful hot country and satan was there piling hot coals on me finally the sun went under a cloud or at least i suppose it did for the burning pain left me and i began to dream of heaven i thought the lord was there sitting upon his throne of gold in the midst of scores of happy children calling me up to him he pointed to a large pile of fence rails down in a beautiful valley and said my boy you go down and carry every one of those rails up here to me before you stop his words landed up against my happy thoughts like a thunderbolt from a clear sky i had been thinking of what a picnic i would have with the other children a walk of about one mile brought me to the pile of rails there were more in the pile than i could count i shouldered one of the lightest and struck out up the steep hill thinking how i would like to be back with mother even if i had to carry an armful of wood from the beach now and then when about halfway up the hill i heard a terrible noise such as i had never heard before it awakened me and in trying to jump up i bumped my head against the log and also filled my eyes full of sand when i got on to my feet and the sand out of my eyes i discovered the whole beach east of me thronged with men carrying guns and marching right towards me the head ones were not over a hundred yards off beating drums and blowing their horns it is needless to say i was scared and that i ran as fast as my legs could carry me looking back every minute to see if they were after me it was in this way that i ran or sprang right into the midst of mrs zyprian's drove of geese before i knew it there were several old ganders in the drove which used to chase me every chance they got i generally took particular pains to go around them but this time my mind was in a different channel from what it had ever been in before hence my not looking out for them as i flew past two of the old ganders made a dive at me but only one succeeded in catching on he grabbed the tail of my shirt which stuck straight out behind in his mouth and hung on with blood in his eyes my speed seemed to increase instead of slacken every time the old gander would bounce up and come down his claws would rake the skin from the calves of my legs his death-like grip finally broke loose and i felt considerable lighter my mind also felt somewhat relieved bunner was out in the yard washing she had picked up chips enough to boil the water the tub was sitting upon a box and she was rubbing away with all her might her back towards me as i was looking over my shoulder i ran against her knocking her tub and all over into a pile myself with them mother got up first with her right hand in my shirt collar i pled manfully and tried to tell her about the scores of men but she was too mad to listen she dragged me to where the big black strap should have hung i knew she couldn't find it therefore hoped to get off with a few slaps but alas no she spied the mush stick and the way she gave it to me with that was a caution the crowd i saw proved to be dr pearson's company of rebels who had been sent over from matagorda to drill and be ready to fight the blue coats when they came it was then the summer of eighteen sixty two they located their camp on the beach about a mile from our house and i used to march with them all day long sometimes the captain dr pearson gave me an umbrella stick which i used for a gun that coming fall about five thousand yankees landed at dicko's point on the peninsula and marched by our ranch on their way to the rebel camp 
which was stationed forty miles above at the mouth of caney creek they camped one night close to our house and filled me up with hardtack which was quite a treat to a fellow living on mush and milk they had a five or six day fight with the rebels neither of them coming off victorious we could hear the guns plainly from the settlement many dead men were washed ashore on the beach my sister and i stumbled onto one poor fellow one day shot through the heart his clothes were gone and his wrist was marked j t in india ink after the battle the yankees marched back to deckrose point where they remained to the end of the war the rebels still held their ground at the mouth of caney every now and then a squad from each side would meet at the settlement and have a skirmish i remember once after one of these skirmishes a crowd of yankees rounded mr williams up on the prairie billy and i being with him and throwing their pistols in his face told him if they ever found him so far from home again they would kill him their threats didn't scare mr williams the least bit for he afterwards slipped into their camp after dark and stole eleven head of their best horses and gave them to the rebels but on his way back from the rebel camp where he went to take the horses they caught him and took him aboard of a yankee man-o-war to hang him they had the rope around his neck ready to swing him when the general turned him loose on account of his old age and bravery telling him never to be caught from home again fighting was going on nearly every day in sight of us sometimes the yankee gunboats would get into the bay among the rebel boats and at other times they would fight across the narrow strip of land shooting right over the houses at one another many of the cannon-balls dropped on the prairie one of them at one time struck within a few feet of mr williams almost burying him in the sand as it ploughed along on the ground poor fellow he was afterwards killed by one he carried one home and taking all the powder out of it as he supposed set it out in the yard with the hole up and then told billy to get him a coal of fire in the tongs he thought it would just flash a little i was present and not liking the looks of it crept out behind the picket gate a few yards away and peeped between the pickets the whole family was looking on to see the fun matty one of the little girls was sitting with her arms around a dog's neck within a few feet of it billy arriving with the coal handed it to his father who reached over and let it drop down into the hole where he had taken out the lead screw it seemed to me that the coal hadn't reached the hole when the thing exploded for a few seconds everything was enveloped in smoke when the smoke disappeared sufficiently for me to see the whole sky seemed to be a blaze of fire and finally mr williams emerged out of the heavy cloud of smoke hopping on one leg a piece of the bombshell had taken off part of one foot on the left leg and another piece had ploughed through the calf of his right leg part of one ear was also gone he only lived a few days a piece of the shell took off one of the dog's legs without even touching matty the little girl who had her arms around his neck several pieces went through the house and one piece went through the picket gate right over my head the next day billy and i found a large piece sticking in the wall of an old vacant house a mile from where it exploded during the war several ships were driven ashore on the beach by the yankee gunboats the folks at the settlement would get all the plunder one ship was loaded with dry goods and from that time on i wore breeches about a year after the war broke out the rebels gathered up all the cattle on the peninsula and drove them to the mainland where they were turned loose with the thousands upon thousands of wild cattle already over there their idea in doing so was to keep the yankees whom they knew would hold the lower part of the peninsula they having the best gunboats from getting fresh beef to eat there was only one cow left in the whole settlement and that was our old brownie mother had begged manfully for them to leave her for she knew we children would starve to death living on mush straight when the war broke up everybody was happy we cheered for joy when mr joe yeamans brought the good news from town 
shortly after this all of the men and boys that were large enough went over to the mainland to gather up the peninsula cattle on their arrival they found it a bigger job than they had figured on for they were scattered over two or three hundred miles of country and as wild as deer billy and i thought it very hard that we could not go and be cowboys too but we had lots of fun all by ourselves for we had an old mule and two or three ponies to ride so you see we practised riding in anticipation of the near future when we would be large enough to be cowboys after being gone about three months the crowd came back bringing with them several hundred head of cattle which they had succeeded in gathering among them were about twenty head belonging to mother the crowd went right back after more this stimulated billy and i to become a crowd of cowboys all by ourselves therefore we put in most of our time lassoing and riding wild yearlings etc we hardly stayed at home long enough to get our meals mother had to get her own wood in those days for sister had gone to school in galveston of course i always had to come home at night therefore mother would get satisfaction out of me with the black strap or mush stick after i was snugly settled in bed for my waywardness and trifling habits in the spring of eighteen sixty seven a cattleman by the name of faldian brought his family over to the peninsula for their health and rented part of our house to live in after getting his wife and babies located in their new quarters he started back home at matagorda to make preparations for spring work he having to rig up new outfits etc he persuaded mother to let me go with him and learn to run cattle when she consented i was the happiest boy in the settlement for my lifelong wish was about to be gratified chapter three my first lesson in cow punching the next day after arriving in town mr faldeen sent me out to his ranch twenty miles on big boggy i rode out on the grub wagon with the colored cook that night after arriving at the ranch there being several men already there we went out wild boar hunting we got back about midnight very tired and almost used up such a hunt was very different from the coon hunts billy and i used to have at the settlement our dogs were badly gashed up by the boars and it was a wonder some of us hadn't been served the same way in a few days mr faldeen came out to the ranch bringing with him several men after spending a few days gathering up the cow ponies which hadn't been used since the fall before we started for lake austin a place noted for wild cattle during the summer i was taken sick and had to go home i was laid up for two months with typhoid fever everyone thought i would die that fall about october mother married a man by the name of carrier who hailed from yankeedom he claimed that he owned a farm in michigan besides lots of other property he was very anxious to get back to his farm so persuaded mother to sell out lock stock and barrel and go with him she had hard work to find a buyer as money was very scarce but finally she got mr george burkhart a merchant in matagorda to set his own price on things and take them the house and one hundred and seventy-five acres of land only brought one hundred and seventy-five dollars the sixty head of cattle that we had succeeded in getting back from the mainland went at one dollar a head and all others that still remained on the mainland thrown in for good measure at last everything for sale was disposed of and we got chris zipperian to take us to indianola in his schooner we bade farewell to the old homestead with tears in our eyes i hated more than anything else to leave old brownie behind for she had been a friend in need as well as a friend indeed often when i would be hungry and afraid to go home for fear of mother and the mush stick she would let me go up to her on the prairie calf fashion and get my milk she was nearly as old as myself at indianola we took the steamship crescent city for new orleans the first night out we ran into a large brig and came very near going under the folks on the brig were nearly starved to death having been drifting about for thirty days without a rudder 
we took them in tow after getting our ship in trim again and landed them safely in galveston there was a bar-room on our ship and our new lord and master mr carrier put in his spare time drinking whisky and gambling i do not think he drew a sober breath from the time we left indianola until we landed in new orleans by that time he had squandered every cent received for the homestead and cattle so mother had to go down into her stocking and bring out the little pile of gold which she had saved up before the war for hard times as she used to say with this money she now bought our tickets to st louis we took passage i think on the grand republic there was also a bar-room on this boat and after wheedling mother out of the remainder of her funds he drank whisky and gambled as before so we landed in st louis without a cent mother had to pawn her feather mattress and pillows for a month's rent in an old dilapidated frame building on one of the back streets it contained only four rooms two upstairs and two down the lower rooms were occupied by the stingy old landlord and family we lived in one of the upper rooms while a mr socks whose wife was an invalid occupied the other the next day after getting established in our new quarters the old man as i called him struck out to find a job he found one at a dollar a day shoveling coal at first he brought home a dollar every night then a half and finally a quarter at last he got to coming home drunk without a nickel in his pocket he finally came up missing we didn't know what had become of him mother was sick in bed at the time from worrying i went out several times hunting work but no one would even give me a word of encouragement with the exception of an old jew who said he was sorry for me a little circumstance happened shortly after the old man pulled his trifling carcass for parts unknown which made me a better boy and no doubt a better man than i should have been had it never happened everything was white without for it had been snowing for the past two days it was about five o'clock in the evening and the cold piercing north wind was whistling through the unsealed walls of our room mother was sound asleep while sister and i sat shivering over an old broken stove which was almost cold there being no fuel in the house sister began crying and wondered why the lord let us suffer so i answered that maybe it was because we quit saying our prayers up to the time we left texas mother used to make us kneel down by the bedside and repeat the lord's prayer every night before retiring since then she had from worrying lost all interest in heavenly affairs let us say our prayers now then brother said sister drying the tears from her eyes we both knelt down against the old rusty stove and commenced about the time we had finished the door opened and in stepped mr socks with a bundle under his arm here children is a loaf of bread and some butter and i will bring you up a bucket of coal in a few moments for i suppose from the looks of the stove you are cold said the good man who had just returned from his day's work was ever a prayer so quickly heard we enjoyed the bread and butter for we hadn't tasted food since the morning before the next day was a nice sunny one and i struck out uptown to try and get a job shoveling snow from the sidewalks the first place i tackled was a large stone front on pine street the kind lady of the establishment said she would give me twenty-five cents if i would do a good job cleaning the sidewalk in front of the house after an hour's hard work i finished and after paying me the lady told me to call next day and she would give me a job shoveling coal down in the cellar as i had done an extra good job on the sidewalk this was encouraging and i put in the whole day shoveling snow but never found any more twenty-five cent jobs most i received for one whole hour's work was ten cents and then the old fat fellow kicked like a bay steer about the damned snow being such an expense etc from that time on i made a few dimes each day sawing wood or shoveling coal and therefore got along splendid i forgot to mention my first evening in st louis 
i was going home from the bakery when i noticed a large crowd gathered in front of a corner grocery i went up to see what they were doing two of the boys had just gotten through fighting when i got there the storekeeper and four or five other men were standing in the door looking on at the crowd of boys who were trying to cap another fight as i walked up hands shoved clear to the bottom of my pockets the storekeeper called out pointing at me there's a country jake that i'll bet can lick any two boys of his size in the crowd of course all eyes were then turned on to me which no doubt made me look sheepish one of the men asked me where i was from when i told him the storekeeper exclaimed by gum if he is from texas i'll bet two to one that he can clean out any two boys of his size in the crowd one of the other men took him up and they made a sham bet of ten dollars just to get me to fight the two boys were then picked out one was just about my size and the other considerably smaller they never asked me if i would take a hand in the fight until everything was ready of course i hated to crawl out for fear they might think i was a coward everything being ready the storekeeper called out dive in boys we had it up and down for quite a while finally i got the largest one down and was putting it to him in good shape when the other one picked up a piece of brick bat and began pounding me on the back of the head with it i looked up to see what he was doing and he struck me over one eye with the bat i jumped up and the little fellow took to his heels but i soon overtook him and blackened both of his eyes up in good shape before the other boy who was coming at full tilt could get there to help him i then chased the other boy back to the crowd that ended the fight and i received two ginger snaps from the big-hearted storekeeper for my trouble i wore the nickname of tex from that time on during my stay in that neighbourhood and also wore a black eye where the little fellow struck me with the bat for several days afterwards about the middle of january mother received a letter from the old man with ten dollars enclosed and begging her to come right on without delay as he had a good job and was doing well etc he was at lebanon illinois twenty-five miles from the city the sight of ten dollars and the inducements he held out made us hope that we would meet with better luck there so we packed up our few traps and started on the ohio and mississippi railroad on arriving in lebanon about nine o'clock at night we found the old man there waiting for us the next morning we all struck out on foot through the deep snow for moore's ranch where the old man had a job chopping cordwood a tramp of seven miles brought us to the little old log cabin which was to be our future home a few rods from our cabin stood a white frame house in which lived mr moore and his family everything went on lovely for the first week notwithstanding that the cold winds whistled through the cracks in our little cabin and we had nothing to eat but corn bread black coffee and old salt pork that moore could not find a market for the first saturday after getting established in our new home the old man went to town and got on a glorious drunk squandered every nickel he could rake and scrape from that time on his visits to town were more frequent than his visits to the woods to work at last i was compelled to go to work for more at eight dollars a month to help keep the wolf from our door and don't you forget it i earned eight dollars a month working out in the cold without gloves and only half clothed towards spring the old man got so mean and good for nothing that the neighbors had to run him out of the country a crowd of them surrounded the house one night took the old fellow out and preached him a sermon then they gave him till morning to either skip or be hung you bet he didn't wait until morning a short while afterwards mother took sister and went to town to hunt work she left our household goods with one of the near neighbors a mr muck where they still remain i suppose if not worn out but there was nothing worth hauling off except the dishes i must say the tableware was good we had gotten them from a spanish vessel wrecked on the gulf beach during the war mother found work in a private boarding-house and sister with a mrs bell a miller's wife while i still remained with moore at the same old wages 
along in june some time i quit moore on account of having the ague i thought i should have money enough to take a rest until i got well but bless you i only had ninety cents to my credit moore had deducted thirty-five dollars the old man owed him out of my earnings i pulled for town as mad as an old setting hen but i soon found work again with an old fellow by the name of john sargent who was to give me eight dollars a month board and clothes and pay my doctor bills about the first of september mother and sister went to st louis where they thought wages would be higher they bade me good-bye promising to find me a place in the city so i could be with them also promised to write shortly afterwards i quit mr sargent with only one dollar to my credit and that i haven't got yet he charged me up with everything i got in the shape of clothes doctor bills medicine etc i then went to work for a carpenter to learn the trade for my board clothes etc i was to remain with him three years my first day's work was turning a big heavy stone for him to grind a lot of old rusty tools on that night after supper i broke my contract as i concluded that i knew just as much about the carpenter's trade as i wished to know and skipped for the country by moonlight i landed up at a mr jacobs farm twelve miles from town and got a job of work at twelve dollars a month i didn't remain there long though as i had a chill every other day regular and therefore couldn't work much i made up my mind then to pull for st louis and hunt mother and sister i had never heard a word from them since they left after buying a small satchel to put my clothes in and paying for a ticket to the city i had only twenty-five cents left and part of that i spent for dinner that day i arrived in east st louis about midnight with only ten cents left i wanted to buy a ginger cake or something as i was very hungry but i hated to as i needed the dime to pay my way across the river next morning i wasn't very well posted then in regard to the ways of getting on in the world or i would have spent the dime for something to eat and then beat my way across the river End of chapters one two and three Chapters four, five, and six of A Texas Cowboy by Charles A. Seringo. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter four My Second Experience in St. Louis. Bright and early next morning, I gave my dime to the ferryman and pulled out for the bustling city, where I was soon lost in the large crowd which thronged the levee. I left my satchel in a saloon and struck out to find mr socks hoping he could give me some information as to mother and sister's whereabouts but i was sadly disappointed he had left that part of the city in which he lived when i knew him i put in the rest of the day gazing through the show windows especially of the bakeries at the fat pies cakes etc for i was getting very hungry my last meal being dinner the day before about dark i strolled up to a second-hand bookstore and asked how much a bible nearly new would bring the man behind the counter told me to bring it around and he would give whatever it was worth so i struck out after my satchel i hated the idea of parting with the book for it had been presented to me by my late employer's mother mrs moore a nice old lady who had taken a liking to me but you know how it is when a fellow is hungry or would have known had you been in my shoes i got twenty-five cents for the bible and immediately invested fifteen cents of it in a mince pie that night i stowed myself away in an empty dry-goods box i did not sleep well and when i did sleep it was to dream of snakes and other venomous reptiles i put in the whole of the next day hunting work but failed to find it i had bought a five-cent ginger cake for my dinner and now i got a five-cent pie for my supper this broke me flat and i had nothing else that i could sell so i put up for the night in a pile of baled hay which was stacked up behind a store the next morning i struck out again hunting work but this time on an empty stomach 
about two o'clock in the afternoon i found a hack driver who said he wanted to hire a boy to take care of his horses he said he would not be going home until about one o'clock that night and for me to wait for him in front of the courthouse on fourth street just as soon as dark came i went to the appointed place and stayed there for fear my man would conclude to go home earlier than he expected i was exceedingly happy when the long looked-for hour drew near for i thought it wouldn't be long until i would have a good square meal and a warm bed to sleep in about two o'clock while leaning against a lamp-post gazing up and down fourth street a policeman punched me in the ribs and told me to hunt my hole and that if he caught me out again so late at night he would put me in the cooler i pulled out across the street and waited until he got out of sight then i went back to my same old stand thinking that my man would certainly be along in a few moments at the outside every hack that drove by would cause me to have a spell of the blues until another hove in sight soon to disappear again finally about three o'clock my courage and what few sparks of hopes that still remained wilted for an empty stomach and sitting up so late had given me a terrible headache which was almost past endurance i was sitting on the edge of the sidewalk with my face buried in both hands crying when some one touched me on the shoulder i was scared at first for i thought it was a peeler but my fears vanished when i looked up into the gleaming countenance of a small red-complexioned man who said in a pleasant tone is there anything i can do for you my little man his kindness proved too much for me i burst out crying and it was quite a while before i could tell him my trouble he was terribly mad when i told him how the hackman had served me he told me to watch for the hard-hearted wretch next day and if i saw him to point him out and he would teach him how to play jokes on innocent children he took me to his boarding place a fancy restaurant right across the street he said he was just fixing to go to bed when he spied me across the street acting as though in trouble when he found out that i hadn't had a square meal for three days he remarked that it was a damned shame and then told the night clerk who appeared to be half asleep to have me a good supper fixed up and give me a good room he then bid me good night and started to bed telling me to remain there until i found work if it was a month that he would arrange everything with the proprietor in the morning before he went to work i thanked him with tears in my eyes for his kindness i was so tired and sleepy that i never woke up until nearly noon next day after eating breakfast i struck out to hunt a job but failed as usual three days after while out hunting work i stopped an old man and asked him if he knew where i could find a job he smiled and said my boy this is the fourth time you have asked me that same question in the last three days you must like my looks for i have noticed you pass scores of men without stopping them i told him i never tackled a man unless he had a pleasing countenance for i had been snapped up short by so many i also told him that i did not remember asking him before he finally after asking me a few questions said follow me and i will find you work before i stop the first place we went into was the planter's house on fourth street between pine and chestnut and he asked the clerk if they needed a bell-boy no was the short answer he received he then asked where he could find the proprietor up in his room number blank on first floor was the answer we found the boss busily writing my new friend pled my case like a dutch uncle and told him if i didn't prove to be just what he recommended me to be a wide-awake get-up-and-get honest boy that he would pay all damages etc that seemed to settle it for i was told to go down to the office and wait for orders i was too happy to live i thanked the kind old gentleman from the bottom of my heart and offered to pay him for his trouble as soon as i earned some money he told me i could pay him for his trouble by being a good boy after waiting a few minutes in the office the proprietor came down and made a bargain with me my wages were to be ten dollars a month he gave me one month's wages in advance to buy clean clothes with 
i was put on the forenoon watch which went on duty at eight in the morning and came off at one in the afternoon there were five of us on at a time we would always make from twenty-five cents to five dollars a day while on duty for we hardly ever went to wait on a person but what they would give us something in the shape of money gamblers generally gave us the most sometimes a lot of them would get together in a room to play cards and send down to the bar after their drinks and maybe send a ten or twenty dollar bill and tell the bell-boy to keep the change with this money we used to have some gay old time taking in the city after coming off guard the next fall nearly one year after landing at the planters i had a fight with one of the bell-boys jimmy byron he called me a liar and i jumped aboard of him when it was over with the clerk mr cunningham called me up to the counter and slapped me without saying a word i went right straight to my room packed up my grip sack and went to the proprietor for a settlement he was surprised and wanted to know what in the world had gotten into me i told him the whole thing just as it happened he tried to get me to stay but i was still mad and wouldn't listen to him i had made up my mind to buy a pistol come back and get square with mr cunningham for slapping me i left the house with eighteen dollars in my pocket jumped aboard of a street car and rode down to the levee i left my valise at a saloon and then started back to find a gun store i finally found one and gave ten dollars for a fancy little ivory handled five shooter i then started for the planters still as mad as an old setting hen i had not gone far when i came across a large crowd gathered around one of those knife rackets where you pay a quarter for five rings and try to ring a knife i watched the thing a while and finally invested a quarter i got a little jim crow barlow the first throw that made it interesting so i bought another quarter's worth and another until five dollars was gone this did not satisfy me so i kept on until i didn't have a nickel left but wasn't i mad when i realized what i had done i forgot all about my other troubles and felt like breaking my own head instead of cunningham's i went to the levee and found out that the bart abel would start for new orleans in a few minutes so i ran to get my satchel not far off determined on boarding the steamer and remaining there until kicked off anything to get nearer the land of my birth i thought even if i had to break the rules of a gentleman in doing so when the purser came around collecting fares i laid my case before him with tears in my eyes i told him i was willing to work and hard too to pay my fare he finally after studying a while said well go ahead i'll find something for you to do everything went on lovely with me until one evening when we stopped at a landing to take on some freight mostly grain we pulled up by the side of an old disabled steamer which was being used for a wharf boat and went to work loading the job given to me was sewing sacks whenever one was found out of order there were two sets of men loading one in the stern and the other in the bow and i was supposed to do the sewing at both ends when they came across a holy sack if i happened to be at the other end they would hello for me and i would go running through the narrow passageway leading from one end to the other i was in the stern when the sound of my name came from the other end i grabbed my ball of twine and struck out in a dog trot through the passage the sides of which were formed of grain piled to the ceiling when about halfway through i thought i heard my name called from the end i had just left i stopped to listen and while waiting being tired i went to lean over against the wall of sacked grain but instead of a wall there was an old vacated hatchway and over into that i went there being no flooring in the boat there was nothing but the naked timbers for my weary bones to alight upon chapter five a new experience the next day about noon i came to my senses i found myself all alone in a nice little room on a soft bed i tried to get up but it was useless my back felt as if it was broken i couldn't think what had happened to me but finally the door opened and in stepped a doctor who explained the whole matter he said the captain just as the boat was fixing to pull out was walking through the passageway when he heard my groans down in the hold 
and getting a lantern ladder and help fished me out almost lifeless i was in the captain's private room and having the best of care the back of my head was swollen out of shape it having struck on one of the cross timbers while my back landed across another the doctor said i owed my life to the captain for finding me for said he if you had remained in there twenty minutes longer your case would have been hopeless at last we arrived in memphis tennessee we had been travelling very slowly on account of having to stop at all the small landings and unload freight or take on more after landing at memphis i took a notion that a little walk would help my lame back so i struck out along the river bank very slowly during my walk i came across a drove of small snipe and having my pistol with me i shot at them the pistol report attracted the attention of two boys who were standing not far off they came over to me and one of them the oldest who was on crutches having only one leg asked how much i would take for my shooter i told him i would take ten dollars for it as i was in need of money he examined it carefully and then said it's a trade buddy but you will have to go up to that little house yonder to get the money as i haven't got that much with me the house he pointed out stood off by itself to the right of the town which was situated about a mile from the river the house in question being half a mile off i told him that i was too weak to walk that far on account of my back being out of whack well said he you go with us as far as that sand hill yonder pointing to a large red sand hill a few hundred yards from where we stood and my chum here who has got two good legs will run on and get the money while we wait i agreed not suspecting anything wrong and when behind the sand hill out of sight of the steamboat landing mr one leg threw down on me with my own shooter and ordered me to throw up my hands i obeyed and held mighty still while the other young ruffian went through my pockets they walked off with everything i had in my pockets even took my valise key i felt considerably relieved i can assure you when the cocked revolver was taken down from within a few inches of my nose i was in dread for fear of his trembling finger might accidentally touch the trigger as soon as i was released i went right back to the landing and notified a policeman who struck out after them but whether he caught them or not i never knew as the bart abel steamed down the river shortly afterwards the same evening after arriving in new orleans the bart abel pulled back for st louis leaving me there flat broke and among strangers i looked terribly blue late that evening as i walked up and down the crowded levee studying what to do i had already been to the morgan steamship landing and begged for a chance to work my way to texas but met with poor success i could not hire out even if i had applied and got a job for my back was still stiff so much so that i couldn't stoop down without terrible pain that night i laid down under an old tarpaulin which was spread over a lot of sugar after getting up and shaking the dust off next morning i went down the river about a mile where scores of small boats were being unloaded among them were several boatloads of oranges bananas etc which were being unloaded in carrying the bananas on shore the overripe ones would drop off on those i made my breakfast but i wished a thousand times before night that i had not eaten them for oh lord how my head did ache that night i went to sleep on a pile of cotton bales that is i tried to sleep but my headache was terrible i could get but little repose the next morning i found there was a morgan steamship in from texas and i struck out to interview the captain in regard to a free ride to texas but the old pot-bellied sinner wouldn't talk to me in the afternoon i began to grow weak from hunger and my back ached badly i sat down on an old stove at the foot of canal street and never moved for three long hours finally a well-dressed old man about fifty years of age with an umbrella over his head came out of cohen's office a small building a short distance from where i sat and walking up to me said in a gruff voice young man what are you sitting out here in the sun for so upright and stiff as if nailed to an old stove 
i told him i was compelled to sit upright on account of a lame back in fact i laid my case before him in full he then said in a much more pleasant voice my boy i'm going to make you an offer and you can take it or let it alone just as you like i will give you four dollars a month to help my wife around the house and at the end of four months will give you a free pass to texas you see i am agent for Coon's red river line of boats and therefore can get a pass cheap i accepted his offer at once and thanked him with all my heart for his kindness being on his way home we boarded a canal street car it was then almost sundown about a half hour's ride brought us within half a block of our destination walking up a pair of nicely finished steps at number eighteen Durbigny street he rang a bell a negro servant whom he called anne answered the call everything sparkled within for the house was furnished in grand style the old gentleman introduced me to his wife as a little texas hoosier that had strayed off from home and was about to starve after supper miss mary as the servants called mrs myers and as i afterwards called her showed me to the bath-house and told me to give myself an extraordinary good scrubbing i do not know as this improved my looks any as i hadn't any clean clothes to put on my valise having been stolen during my illness coming down the river the next day miss mary took me to a clothing-house and fitted me out in fine style i admired all but the narrow-brimmed hat and peaked-toed gaiters i wanted a broad-brimmed hat and star-top boots but she said i would look too much like a hoosier with them on that evening i got a black eye after mr myers came home from his work about four o'clock we all went out on the front steps to breathe the fresh air there being a crowd of boys playing at the corner i asked mr and mrs myers if i could go over and watch them a while both consented but told me not to stay long as they didn't want me to get into the habit of mixing with the street loafers on arriving there all eyes were turned towards me one fellow yelled out hello dandy when did you arrive and another one remarked he is a stiff cuss ain't he i concluded there was nothing to be seen and turned back just as i turned around a yellow negro boy slipped up behind me and pulled my hair the white boys had put him up to it no doubt i jumped aboard of him quicker than a flash and forgot all about my sore back it was nip and tuck for a while we both being about the same size but i finally got him down and blooded his nose in good shape as i went to get up he kicked me over one eye with his heavy boot hence the black eye which was swollen up in a few minutes to an enormous size i expected to get a scolding from mr and mrs myers but they both gloried in my spunk for taking my own part they had witnessed the whole thing somehow or another that fight took the kink out of my back for from that time on it began to get well i am bothered with it though to this day when i take cold or do a hard day's work chapter six adopted and sent to school mr and mrs myers had no children and after i had been with them about a month they proposed to adopt me or at least they made me promise to stay with them until i was twenty-one years of age they were to send me to school until i was seventeen and then start me in business they also promised to give me everything they had at their death so they prepared me for school right away as i was not very far advanced in book learning having forgotten nearly all that mr hale taught me they thought i had better go to fisk's public school until i got a start i had not been going to this school long when i had trouble with the lady teacher miss finley it happened thus a boy sitting behind me struck me on the neck with a slate pencil and when i turned round and accused him of it he whispered you lie i gave him a lick on the nose that made him bawl like a calf of course the teacher heard it and called us up to take our medicine she made the other boy hold out his hand first and after giving him five raps told him to take his seat it was then my time and i stuck out my hand like a little man 
she gave me five licks and was raising the rule to strike again when i jerked my hand away at the same time telling her that it wasn't fair to punish me the most when the other boy caused the fuss she insisted on giving me a little more so finally i held out my hand and received five more licks and still she was not satisfied but i was and went to my seat she told me two or three times to come back but i would not do it so she sent out a boy upstairs after mr dyer the gentleman who taught the large boys i had seen mr dyer try his hand on boys at several different times therefore didn't intend to let him get hold of me if i could help it she saw me looking towards the door so she came over and stood between me and it i heard mr dyer coming down the stairs that was enough i flew for the door i remember running against something soft and knocking it over and suppose it must have been miss finley when i got to the street i pulled straight for home about a week afterwards mr myers sent me to pay school where i was taught german french and english my teacher was an old gentleman who only took a few select scholars everything went on fine until the following spring in may or june when i got into a fuss with one of the scholars and skipped the country the way it happened one day when school let out for dinner we all after emptying our dinner baskets struck out for the green to play foot and a half there was one boy in the crowd by the name of stem camp who was always trying to pick a fuss with me he was twice as large as i was therefore i tried to avoid him but this time he called me a liar and i made for him during the scuffle which followed i got out my little pearl-handled knife one miss mary had given me just a few days before and was determined to use it the first opportunity i was down on all fours and he astride of my back putting it to me in the face underhanded the only place i could get at with the knife was his legs so i stuck it in up to the handle on the inside of one leg just below the groin and ripped down he jumped ten feet in the air and roared out holy moses as soon as i regained my feet he took to his heels but i soon overtook him and got another dig at his back i thought sure i had done him up for good this time but found out afterwards that i had done no harm with the exception of ripping his clothes down the back the next day at that time i was on my way to st louis i had stowed myself away on board of the molly abel among the cotton bales the second night out we had a blow-up one of the cylinder heads blew out of the engine it nearly killed the engineer and fireman also several other persons a little negro boy who was stealing his passage and i were sleeping on a pile of lumber close to the engine when she went off we both got pretty badly scalded the steamer ran ashore and laid there until morning and then went the balance of the way on one wheel it took us just eight days from that time to get to st louis i remained in st louis one day without food not caring to visit the planters or any of my acquaintances and then walked to lebanon illinois twenty-five miles i thought maybe i might find out through some of my lebanon friends where mother and sister were it was nearly noon when i struck out on my journey and nine o'clock at night when i arrived at my destination i went straight to mrs bell's where sister had worked but failed to hear a word of mother and sister's whereabouts mrs bell gave me a good bed that night and next morning i struck out to hunt a job after considerable tramping around i found work with one of my old employers a mr jacobs who lived twelve miles from town i only worked a short while when i began to wish i was back under miss mary's wing so one morning i quit and pulled for st louis i had money enough to pay my fare to st louis and i arrived there just as the robert e lee and natchez were fixing to pull out on their big race for new orleans the robert e lee being my favorite boat i jumped aboard just as she was shoving off of course i had to keep hidden most of the time especially when the captain or purser were around i used to get my chuck from the cook who thought i was a bully boy the natchez would have beaten no doubt but she got too smart by trying to make a cut-off through an old canal opposite memphis 
and got stuck in the mud the first thing after landing in new orleans i hunted up one of my boy friends and found out by him how my victim was getting on he informed me that he was up and hobbling about on crutches he also stated that the poor fellow came very near losing his leg i concluded if they did have me arrested that mr myers was able to help me out so i braced up and struck out for home mr and mrs myers were terribly tickled over my return they had an awful time though getting me scrubbed up again as i was very black and dirty a few days after my return mr myers went to see my same old teacher to find out whether he would take me back or not at first he said that no money could induce him to be bothered with me again but finally mr myers talked him into the notion of trying me once more so the next morning i shouldered my books and struck out for school to take up my same old studies german french and english end of chapters four five and six chapters seven eight and nine of a texas cowboy by charles a seringo this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven back at last to the lone star state everything went on lovely until the coming fall about the latter part of november when i skipped the country for good i will tell you how it happened one afternoon a fire broke out close to the schoolhouse and as everybody was rushing by i became excited and wanted to go too to see the fun i asked the teacher if i could go but he refused in a gruff voice this did not keep me i made a break for the door and was soon lost among the surging mass of people the next heard of me was on the rolling deep i had boarded a morgan steamship and stowed myself away until the vessel was at sea where i knew they wouldn't land to put me ashore st mary was the name of the ship she lost one of her wheelhouses and was considerably out of shape when we landed in galveston texas it had stormed terribly during the whole trip during the few hours that the ship remained in galveston i put in my time hunting an old uncle of mine by the name of nick white whom i had never seen he had been living there seventeen years therefore i experienced but little difficulty in finding his place but after finding it i didn't have courage enough to go in and make myself known one reason was i thought he might think i was beholden to him or in other words trying to get his sympathy i just stood at the gate a few minutes viewing the beautiful shrubbery which filled the spacious yard and went back to the boat which by that time was just fixing to pull out we arrived in indianola one morning about sun-up i recognized several of my old acquaintances standing on the wharf before the ship landed among them was my old godfather mr haggerty who stood for me when i was being christened by the catholic priest they were all surprised to see me back mr haggerty took me home with him and told me to content myself until i could find work in about a week i went to work for mr h selickson who ran a packing-house five miles below town he gave me fifteen dollars a month all winter the next month's wages went for a fancy pistol the next or at least part of it for a pair of star-topped boots and all the balance on monte a mexican game there were lots of mexicans working there and after working hours some of them would deal monte while the rest of us bucked about the first of february i quit the packing-house and went to matagorda where i was welcomed by all my old acquaintances from there i took a trip over to the settlement on the peninsula to see the old homestead everything looked natural the cedar and fig trees were covered with little red-winged black birds seemingly the same ones that were there when i left nearly three years before after a week's stay in the settlement i went back to matagorda and went to work for mr joseph yeamans a baptist preacher my work was farming and my wages part of the crop mr yeamans farm was a thirty-acre sand patch on the peninsula about forty miles above the settlement our aim was to raise a big crop of watermelons and sweet potatoes but when i left everything pointed to a big 
crop of grass burrs and a very slim layout of sweet potatoes and watermelons the old gentleman and i lived all alone in a little dilapidated shanty with a dirt floor our chuck consisted of black coffee hardtack and coon or possum meat we had three good coon dogs therefore had plenty of fresh meat such as it was there being plenty of mavericks close at hand and being tired of coon meat i used to try and get the old man to let me butcher one now and then for a change but he thought it wicked to kill cattle not our own as some of you may not know what a maverick is i will try and explain in early days a man by the name of maverick settled on the lavaca river and started a cow ranch he being a chicken-hearted old rooster wouldn't brand nor earmark any of his cattle all his neighbors branded theirs therefore mr maverick claimed everything that wore long ears when the war broke out mr maverick had to bid adieu to wife and babies and go far away to fight for his country's good when the cruel war was ended he went home and found his cattle roaming over a thousand hills everywhere he went he could see thousands upon thousands of his long-eared cattle but when his neighbors and all the men in the surrounding country came home and went to branding their five years increase mr maverick did not feel so rich he made a terrible fuss about it but it did no good as in a very few years his cattle wore some enterprising man's brand and he was left out in the cold hence the term maverick at first people used to say yonder goes one of mr maverick's animals and now they say yonder goes a maverick about the time we got our crops sweet potatoes melons etc in the ground i swore off farming and skipped out for town leaving mr yeamans my share of the crop free gratis after arriving in matagorda i hired out to a mr tom nye who was over there from rancho grande hiring some cowboys rancho grande was owned by shanghai pierce and allen and at that time was considered one of the largest ranches in the whole state of texas to give you an idea of its size will state that the next year after i went to work we branded twenty five thousand calves that is just in one season altogether there were five of us started to rancho grande to work all boys about my own age we went in a sailboat to palacious point where the firm had an outside ranch and where they were feeding a large lot of cow ponies for spring work it was about the middle of april eighteen seventy one that we all about twenty of us pulled out for the headquarter ranch at the head of trespalacious creek it took us several days to make the trip as we had to brand calves and mavericks on the way up a few days after arriving at the ranch mr or old shang pierce as he was commonly called arrived from old mexico with about three hundred head of wild spanish ponies therefore we kids had a high old time learning the art of riding a pitching horse we put in several days at the ranch making preparations to start out on a two months trip being a store there we rigged up in good shape i spent two or three months wages for an outfit spurs etc trying to make myself look like a thoroughbred cowboy from bitter creek there were three crowds of us started at the same time one to work up the colorado river the other around home and the third which was ours to work west in jackson and lavaca counties our crowd consisted of fifteen men one hundred head of ponies mostly wild ones and a chuck wagon loaded down with coffee flour molasses and salt tom nye was our boss chapter eight learning to rope wild steers arriving on the navidad river we went to work gathering a herd of trail beeves and also branding mavericks at the same time some days we would brand as high as three or four hundred mavericks none under two years old after about a month's hard work we had the herd of eleven 1 hundred ready to turn over to mr black who had bought them delivered to him at the snodgrass ranch they were all old mossy horn fellows from seven to twenty-seven years old 
mr black was a kansas shorthorn and he had brought his outfit of shorthorn men and horses to drive the herd up the trail some of the men had never seen a texas steer consequently they crossed red river into the indian territory with nothing left but the grub wagon and horses they had lost every steer and mr black landed in kansas flat broke lots of the steers came back to their old ranges and mr shanghai had the fun of selling them over again to some other greeny maybe shanghai pierce went to kansas the next year and when he returned he told of having met mr black up there working at his old trade blacksmithing he said mr black cursed texas shamefully and swore that he never would even if he should live to be as old as isaac son of jacob dabble in longhorns again after getting rid of mr black's herd we turned our whole attention to branding mavericks about the first of august we went back to the ranch and found that it had changed hands in our absence shanghai pierce and his brother jonathan had sold out their interests to allen pool and company for the snug little sum of one hundred and ten thousand dollars that shows what could be done in those days with no capital but lots of cheek and a branding iron the two pierces had come out there from yankeedom a few years before poorer than skimmed milk everything had taken a change even to the ranch it had been moved down the river four miles to mr john moore's place mr moore had been appointed big chief hence the ranch being moved to his place about the middle of august we pulled out again with a fresh supply of horses six to the man and a brand new boss mr wiley koikendall some of the boys hated to part with mr nye but i was glad of the change for he wouldn't allow me to rope large steers nor fight when i got on the warpath i remember one time he gave me fits for laying a negro out with a four-year-old club and another time he laid me out with his open hand for trying to carve one of the boys up with a butcher knife we commenced work about the first of september on big sandy in lavaca county a place noted for wild brush cattle very few people lived in that section hence so many wild unbranded cattle to illustrate the class of people who lived on big sandy we'll relate a little picnic a negro and i had a few days after our arrival there while herding a bunch of cattle gathered the day before on a small prairie we noticed a footman emerge from the thick timber on the opposite side from where we were and make straight for a spotted pony that was hobbled and grazing out on the open space he was indeed a rough-looking customer being half naked he had nothing on his head but a thick mat of almost gray hair and his feet and legs were bare we concluded to rope him and take him to camp so taking down our ropes and putting spurs to our tired horses we struck out he saw us coming and only being about a hundred yards from the spotted pony he ran to him and cutting the hobbles which held his two front legs together jumped aboard of him and was off in the direction he had just come like a flash the pony must have been well trained for he had nothing to guide him with a four hundred yard race for dear life brought him to the brush that is timber thickly covered with an underbrush of live oak runners he shot out of sight like an arrow he was not a minute too soon for we were right at his heels we gave up the chase after losing sight of him for we couldn't handle our ropes in the brush the next day the camp was located close to the spot where he disappeared at and several of us followed up his trail we found him and his three grown daughters his wife having died a short while before occupying a little one-room log shanty in a lonely spot about two miles from the little prairie in which we first saw him the whole outfit were tough-looking citizens the girls had never seen a town so they said they had about two acres in cultivation and from that they made their living their nearest neighbor was a mr penny who lived ten miles west and the nearest town was columbus on the colorado river fifty miles east as the cattle remained hidden out in the brush during the daytime only venturing out on the small prairies at night we had to do most of our work early in the morning commencing an hour or two before daylight 
as you might wish to know exactly how we did we'll try and explain about two hours before daylight the cook would hollow chuck and then mr wiley would go around and yell breakfast boys damned you get up two or three times in our ears breakfast being over we would saddle up our ponies which had been staked out the night before and strike out for a certain prairie maybe three or four miles off that is all but two or three men just enough to bring the herd previously gathered on as soon as it became light enough to see arriving at the edge of the prairie we would dismount and wait for daylight at the first peep of day the cattle which would be out in the prairie quite a distance from the timber would all turn their heads and commence grazing at a lively rate towards the nearest point of timber then we would ride around through the brush so as not to be seen until we got to the point of timber that they were steering for when it became light enough to see good we would ride out rope in hand to meet them and apt as not one of the old-timers may be a fifteen or twenty-year-old steer which were continuously on the lookout would spy us before we got twenty yards from the timber then the fun would begin the whole bunch maybe a thousand head would stampede and come right towards us they never were known to run in the opposite direction from the nearest point of timber but with cattle raised on the prairies it's the reverse they will always leave the timber after coming in contact every man would rope and tie down one of the finest animals in the bunch once in a while some fellow would get more beef than he could manage under those circumstances he would have to worry along until some other fellow got through with his job and come to his rescue if there was another prairie close by we would go to it and tie down a few more but we would have to get there before sun-up or they would all be in the brush it was their habit to graze out into the little prairies at nightfall and go back to the brush by sunrise next morning finally the herd which we had gathered before and which was already broke in would arrive from camp where we had been night herding them and then we would drive it round to each one of the tied down animals letting him up so he couldn't help from running right into the herd where he would generally stay contented once in a while though we would strike an old steer that couldn't be made to stay in the herd just as soon as he was untied and let up he would go right through the herd and strike for the brush fighting his way under those circumstances we would have to sew up their eyes with a needle and thread that would bring them to their milk as they couldn't see the timber i got into several scrapes on this trip by being a new hand at the business one time i was going at full speed and threw my rope onto a steer just as he got to the edge of the timber i couldn't stop my horse in time therefore the steer went on one side of a tree and my horse on the other and the consequence was my rope being tied hard and fast to the saddle horn we all landed up against the tree in a heap at another time on the same day i roped a large animal and got my horse jerked over backwards on top of me and in the horse getting up he got me all wound up in the rope so that i couldn't free myself until relieved by jack a negro man who was near at hand i was certainly in a ticklish predicament that time the pony was wild and there i hung fast to his side with my head down while the steer which was still fastened to the rope was making every effort to gore us just before christmas moore selected our outfit to do the shipping at palacious point where a morgan steamship landed twice a week to take on cattle for the new orleans market we used to ship about five hundred head at each shipping after getting rid of one bunch we would strike right back to meet one of the gathering outfits after another herd there were three different outfits to do the gathering for us we kept that up all winter and had a tough time of it too as it happened to be an unusually cold and wet winter towards spring the cattle began to get terribly poor so that during the cold nights while night herding them a great many would get down in the mud and freeze to death having seen as high as fifty head of dead ones scattered over the ground where the herd had drifted during the night 
it's a pity if such nights as those don't try our nerves sometimes it would be twelve o'clock at night before we would get the cattle loaded aboard of the ship but when we did get through we would surely have a picnic filling up on mr george burkhart's red eye mr burkhart kept a store at the point well filled with cowboys delight in fact he made a specialty of the stuff our camping ground was three miles from the point and some mornings the cook would get up and find several saddled horses standing around camp waiting for their corn their riders having fallen by the wayside chapter nine owning my first cattle when spring opened our outfit under the leadership of mr robert parton mr wiley having quit struck out up the colorado river in wharton and colorado counties to brand mavericks about the last of july we went to the home ranch where mr wiley was put in charge of us again we were sent right out on another trip west to jackson county it was on this trip that i owned my first cattle mr wiley concluded it would look more business-like if he would brand a few mavericks for himself instead of branding them all for allen pool and company so he began putting his own brand on all the finest looking ones to keep us boys from giving him away he gave us a nest egg apiece that is a few head to draw to my nest eggs were a couple of two-year-olds and my brand was a t connected the t on top of the a of course after that i always carried a piece of iron tied to my saddle so in case i got off on the prairie by myself i could brand a few mavericks for myself without mr wiley being any the wiser of it the way i would go about it would be to rope and tie down one of the long-eared fellows and after heating the straight piece of round iron bolt in the brush or cow chip fire run my brand on his hip or ribs it was then my property everything ran along as smooth as if on greased wheels for about two months when somehow or another mr moore our big chief heard of our little private racket and sent for us to come home mr wiley got the g b at once and a mr logan was put in his place now this man logan was a very good man but he was out of his latitude he should have been a second mate on a mississippi steamboat i worked with logan one trip until we got back to the ranch and then i settled up for the first time since going to work nearly two years before an old irishman by the name of hunky dory brown kept the store and did the settling up with the men when he settled with me he laid all the money in silver dollars that i had earned since commencing work which amounted to a few hundred dollars out on the counter and then after eyeing me a while said allen pool and company owe you three hundred dollars or whatever the amount was and you owe allen pool and company two hundred ninety nine dollars and a quarter which leaves you seventy five cents he then raked all but six bits into the money drawer to say that i felt mortified wouldn't near express my feelings i thought the whole pile was mine and therefore had been figuring on the many purchases that i intended making my intentions were to buy a herd of ponies and go to speculating i had a dozen or two ponies that i knew were for sale already picked out in my mind but my fond expectations were soon trampled under foot you see i had never kept an account consequently never knew how i stood with the company after pocketing my six bits i mounted fanny a little mare that i had bought not long before and struck out for w b grimes ranch a few miles up the river i succeeded in getting a job from the old gentleman at fifteen dollars per month mr grimes had a slaughter-house on his ranch where he killed cattle for their hides and tallow the meat he threw to the hogs about two hundred head per day was an average killing did you ask kind reader if those were all his own cattle that he butchered if so we'll have to say that i never tell tales out of school after working around the ranch a short while mr grimes gave me the job of taking care of his stock horses that is mares colts and horses that weren't in use 
there were about two hundred head of those and they were scattered in two hundred and fifty different places over fifty square miles of territory and of course before i could take care of them i had to go to work and gather them up into one bunch a little circumstance happened shortly after going to work at the w b g ranch which i am going to relate an old gentleman by the name of kinchlow who owned a large horse ranch up on the colorado river in wharton county came down and told mr grimes that his outfit was fixing to start on a horse hunt and for him to send a man along as there were quite a number of w b g horses in that country as i had the job taking care of the horses it fell to my lot to accompany the old gentleman mr kinchlow to his ranch fifty miles distance it was bright and early one morning when we pulled out aiming to ride the fifty miles by ten o'clock that night mr kinchlow was mounted on old beauregard a large chestnut sorrel while i rode a fiery little bay our journey was over a bald wet prairie night overtook us at the head of blue creek still twenty miles from our destination a few minutes after crossing blue creek just about dusk we ran across a large panther which jumped up out of the tall grass in front of us it was a savage-looking beast and appeared to be on the war-path after jumping to one side it just sat still growling and showing its ugly teeth i started to shoot it but mr kinchlow begged me not to as it would frighten his horse who was then almost beyond control from seeing the panther we rode on and a few minutes afterwards discovered the panther sneaking along after us through the tall grass i begged mr kinchlow to let me kill it but he wouldn't agree as he said a pistol shot would cause old beauregard to jump out of his hide it finally became very dark our guide was a certain bright little star we had forgotten all about the panther as it had been over half an hour since we had seen it the old man was relating an indian tale which made my hair almost stand on end as i imagined that i was right in the midst of a wild band of reds when all at once old beauregard gave a tremendous loud snort and dashed straight ahead at a breakneck speed mr kinchlow yelled whoa every jump finally his voice died out and i could hear nothing but the sound of his horse's hoofs and finally the sound of them too died out of course i socked spurs to my pony and tried to keep up for i imagined there were a thousand and one indians and panthers right at my heels after running about a quarter of a mile i heard something like a faint human groan off to my right about fifty yards i stopped and listened but could not hear anything more except now and then the lonely howl of a coyote off in the distance i finally began to feel lonesome so i put spurs to my pony again but i hadn't gone only a few jumps when i checked up and argued with myself thusly now suppose that groan came from the lips of mr kinchlow who maybe fell from his horse and is badly hurt then wouldn't it be a shame to run off and leave him there to die when maybe a little aid from me would have saved him i finally spunked up and drawing my pistol started in the direction from whence came the groan my idea in drawing the pistol was for fear the panther who i felt satisfied had been the cause of the whole trouble might tackle me suffice it to say that i found the old gentleman stretched out on the ground apparently lifeless and that a half hour's nursing brought him to he finally after several trials got so he could stand up with my aid i then helped him into my saddle while i rode behind and held him on and we continued our journey both on one horse he informed me after he came to his right senses that old beauregard had fallen and rolled over him we landed at our destination about ten o'clock next morning but the good old man only lived about two weeks afterwards he died from the effects of the fall so i heard about christmas i quit mr grimes and went to work on my own hook skinning dead cattle and adding to the nest egg mr wiley gave me i put my own brand on quite a number of mavericks while taking care of mr grimes horses which began to make me feel like a young cattle king 
the only trouble was they were scattered over too much wild territory and mixed up with so many other cattle when a fellow branded a maverick in those days it was a question whether he would ever see or realize a nickel for it for just think one or even a hundred head mixed up with over a million of cattle and those million heads scattered over territory one hundred miles square and continually drifting around from one place to another after leaving daddy grimes i made my home at mr horace yeaman's an old mexican war veteran who lived five miles from grimes his family consisted of two daughters and two sons all grown but the youngest daughter sally who was only fourteen and who i was casting sheep eyes at the old gentleman had brought his children up very pious which was a glorious thing for me as during the two years that i made my home there i got broke of swearing a dirty mean habit which had fastened itself upon me and which i thought was impossible to get rid of i had become so that it was almost an impossibility for me to utter a sentence without using an oath to introduce it and another to end it to show how the habit was fastened upon me mr parton one of my former bosses made me an offer of three dollars more wages on the month if i would quit cursing but i wouldn't do it horace yeamans who was about my own age and i went into partnership in the skinning business cattle died by the thousands that winter on account of the country being overstocked therefore horace and i had a regular picnic skinning and branding mavericks only those that looked as if they might pull through the winter to give you an idea how badly cattle died that winter will state that at times right after a sleet a man could walk on dead animals for miles without stepping on the ground this of course would be along the bay shore where they would pile up on top of one another not being able to go further on account of the water about five miles east of mr yeaman's was a slough or creek called turtle bayou which lay east and west a distance of several miles and which i have seen bridged over with dead cattle from one end to the other you see the solid mass of half-starved animals in drifting ahead of a severe norther would undertake to cross the bayou which was very boggy and consequently the weakest ones would form a bridge for the others to cross on my share of the first hides we shipped to indianola amounted to one hundred and fourteen dollars you bet i felt rich i never had so much money in all my life i went at once and bought me a twenty-seven dollar saddle and sent mother twenty-five dollars i had found out mother's address in st louis by one of my old peninsula friends getting a letter from sister our next sale amounted to more than the first that time horace and i went to indianola with the hides for we wanted to blow in some of our surplus wealth we were getting too rich when spring opened i bought five head of horses and thought i would try my hand at trading horses the first trade i made i cleared twenty five dollars i gave an old mare which cost me twenty dollars for a pony which i sold a few days afterwards for forty five along in may i fell head over heels in love for the first time in my life a pretty little fourteen-year-old miss cousin to horace and the girls came over on a month's visit and when she left i was completely rattled couldn't think of anything but her her beautiful image was continually before my eyes her father who was sheriff of matagorda county lived on the road to matagorda fifteen miles from mr yeaman's therefore during the coming summer i went to town pretty often to get a new brand recorded was generally my excuse you see as she lived about half way between the yeaman's ranch and town i could be near her two nights each trip one going and one returning i had very poor success that summer in my new enterprise horse trading i was too badly locoed to tell a good horse from a bad one in fact i wasn't fit for anything unless it would have been a mail carrier between dennings bridge and matagora End of chapters 7, 8, and 9
Chapters ten, eleven, and twelve of A Texas Cowboy by Charles A. Seringo. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter ten A Start Up the Chisholm Trail. I put in the following winter branding mavericks, skinning cattle, and making regular trips to Matagorda. I still remained in partnership with Horace Yeamans in the skinning business i made considerable money that winter as i sold a greater number of mavericks than ever before but the money did me no good as i spent it freely that coming spring it being eighteen seventy four i hired to leander ward of jackson county to help gather a herd of steers for the muckleroy brothers who were going to drive them to kansas i had also made a contract with muckleroy's boss tom merrill to go up the trail with him therefore i bid my friends good-bye not expecting to see them again until the coming fall my wages were thirty-five dollars per month and all expenses including railroad fare back home after a month's hard work we had the eleven hundred head of wild and woolly steers ready to turn over to the muckleroy outfit at thirteen mile point on the mustang where they were camped ready to receive them their outfit consisted mostly of kansas shorthorns which they had brought back with them the year before it was a cold rainy evening when the cattle were counted and turned over to tom merrill henry coates george gifford and myself were the only boys who were turned over with the herd that is kept right on we were almost worn out standing night guard half of every night for the past month and then starting in with a fresh outfit made it appear tough to us that night it began to storm terribly the herd began to drift early and by midnight we were five or six miles from camp the steers showed a disposition to stampede but we handled them easy and sang melodious songs which kept them quieted but about one o'clock they stampeded in grand shape one of the shorthorns a long-legged fellow by the name of st clair got lost from the herd and finally when he heard the singing came dashing through the herd at full speed yelling let him slide we'll stay with him at every jump they did slide sure enough but he failed to stay with them for towards morning one of the cowboys came across him lying in the grass sound asleep when he came dashing through the herd a stampede followed the herd split up into a dozen different bunches each bunch going in a different direction i found myself all alone with about three hundred of the frightened steers of course all i could do was to keep in front or in the lead and try to check them up i finally about three o'clock got them stopped and after singing a few lullaby songs they all lay down and went to snoring after the last steer dropped down i concluded i would take a little nap too so locking both legs around the saddle horn and lying over on the tired pony's rump with my left arm for a pillow while the other still held the bridle reins i fell asleep i hadn't slept long through when from some unaccountable reason every steer jumped to his feet at the same instant and was off like a flash my pony which was sound asleep too i suppose became frightened and dashed off at full speed in the opposite direction of course i was also frightened and hung to the saddle with a death grip i was unable to raise myself up as the pony was going so fast therefore had to remain as i was until after about a mile's run i got him checked up just as soon as i got over my scare i struck out in a gallop in the direction i thought the cattle had gone but failed to overtake them i landed in camp almost petered out about nine o'clock next morning the rest of the boys were all there just eating their breakfast tom merrill and henry coates had managed to hold about half of the herd while the balance were scattered and mixed up with range cattle for twenty miles round after eating our breakfast and mounting fresh horses we struck out to gather up the lost steers we could tell them from the range cattle by the fresh road brand a brand that had been put on a few days before therefore by four o'clock that evening we had all but about one hundred head back to camp and those leander ward bought back at half price that is he just bought the road brand or all cattle that happened to be left behind on arriving at camp we all caught fresh horses before stopping to eat dinner or supper whichever you like to call it it being then nearly night 
the pony i caught was a wild one and after riding up to camp and dismounting to eat dinner he jerked loose from me and went flying with my star-spangled saddle i mounted a pony belonging to one of the other boys and went in hot pursuit i got near enough once to throw my rope over his rump and that was all after a run of fifteen miles i gave it up as a bad job and left him still headed for the rio grande i got back to camp just at dark and caught a fresh horse before stopping to eat my supper it was still raining and had kept it up all day long mr jim muckleroy had an extra saddle along therefore i borrowed it until i could get a chance to buy me another one after eating a cold supper the rain having put the fire out i mounted and went on guard the first part of the night until one o'clock being my regular time to stay with the herd while the last guard remained in camp and slept about ten o'clock it began to thunder and lightning which caused the herd to become unruly every time a keen clash of thunder would come the herd would stampede and run for a mile or two before we could get them to stop it continued in that way all night so that we lost another night's rest but we managed to stay with them this time didn't even lose a steer that morning we struck out on the trail for kansas everything went on smoothly with the exception of a stampede now and then and a fuss with jim muckleroy who was a regular old sorehead charlie his brother was a white man where the trouble began he wanted coats and i we being the only ones in the crowd who could ride wild horses or at least who were willing to do so to do the wild horse riding for nothing we finally bolted and told him that we wouldn't ride another wild horse except our regular mount unless he gave us extra pay you see he expected us to ride a horse a few times until he began to get docile and then turn him over to one of his muley pets while we caught up a fresh one at high hill in fayette county i got the bounce from old jim and a little further on coates got the same kind of a dose while nearing the northern state line george gifford and tom merrill the boss were fired so that left old jim in full charge he hired other men in our places he arrived in wichita kansas with eight hundred steers out of the eleven hundred we started with after leaving the outfit i rode to the sunset railroad at schuschenberg and boarded a train for columbus on the colorado river pat muckleroy charlie's son who was about eighteen years old quit and went with me his home was in columbus and he persuaded me to accompany him and have a good time on arriving in columbus i went with pat to his home where i remained during my stay in that place i found mrs m pat's mother to be a kind-hearted old lady and i never shall forget the big fat apple cobblers she used to make she could beat the world making them there were also two young misses in the family nanny and mary who made time pass off pleasantly with me it being seventy-five miles to trespalacious and there being no railroad nearer than that i had to wait for a chance to get home i could have bought a horse and saddle when i first struck town but after remaining there a week i began to get light in the pocket for it required quite a lot of money to keep up my end with the crowd that pat associated with at last after about a three weeks stay i struck asa dowdy an old friend from trespalacious he was there with a load of stock and was just fixing to load them on the cars to ship them to galveston when i ran afoul of him he had sold his saddle and was going to put his pet pony one that he wouldn't sell into a pasture until some other time when he happened up there so you see i was in luck he turned the pony over to me to ride home on after buying and rigging up a saddle i left town flat broke i spent my last dime for a glass of lemonade just before leaving thus ended my first experience on the trail chapter eleven buys a boat and becomes a sailor a three days ride brought me to grimes ranch where i hoped to strike a job but the old gent informed me that he was full-handed had more men than he really needed but he offered me a job cutting cordwood at a dollar a cord until there should be an opening for me which he thought might be when the branding outfit arrived from jackson county where it had gone quite a while before 
cutting cordwood sounded tough to me but i finally agreed to try it a round or two for i hated the idea of being busted mr grimes was to advance me about two weeks provisions on tick so i concluded i couldn't lose anything unless it was a few pounds of muscle and i had grave doubts about that for i knew my failing when it came to dabbling in wood before launching out into the wood business i borrowed a horse and struck out to hunt up old satan so that i could ride around and find easy trees to cut down i found him about thirty miles from grimes ranch he was fat and wild i had to get help to put him in a corral and when i mounted him he pitched like a wolf he had forgotten that he had ever been ridden the wood camp was three miles from the ranch in a thinly timbered bottom i had to camp all by myself which made it a disagreeable job the first day after locating camp was spent in building a kind of jim crow shanty out of rotten logs was saving my muscles to cut cordwood next morning bright and early i mounted satan and rode around hunting some easy trees ones that i thought would cut nicely i marked about a dozen and went back to camp it being noon by that time after dinner i lay down to take a nap until evening when it would be cooler about five o'clock i rolled up my sleeves and waded into a small sickly pin oak tree and the way chips flew for half an hour was a caution i then put in the balance of the evening cording it up that is what i had cut it lacked considerable of being half a cord but i filled in a lot of rotten chunks to make it pan out fifty cents worth i slept sound that night for i was tired bright and early next morning i shouldered my axe and struck out to tackle another sickly pin oak tree while spitting on my hands and figuring on how many licks it would take to down the little sapling i spied a large coon in a neighboring live oak now catching coons you all know by this time was a favorite pastime with me so dropping the axe i went for him by the time i got part of him cooked it was noon and after dinner i fell asleep and dreamt happy dreams until after sundown after supper i went turkey hunting and killed a fat gobbler thus ended my third day in a wood camp i became tired of the cordwood business after two weeks time it was too lonesome a work for a boy of my restless disposition i mounted satan one morning after devouring the last speck of grub in camp and struck out for the ranch on my arrival there mr grimes asked me how much wood i had i told him i thought there was enough to balance my grub bill he said all right he would send a man up there with me next morning to measure it i finally informed him that it wasn't in shape for measuring with the exception of half a cord that i cut the first day as it was scattered over a vast territory two or three sticks in a place i suppose he balanced my grub bill as he has never presented it yet just then i came across a factory hand john collier by name who had a boat for sale he had bought it for a pleasure boat but found he couldn't support such a useless piece of furniture he offered it to me for forty dollars and he had paid one hundred for it i tried to sell satan so as to buy it but no one would have him as a gift as they said they would have to get their lives insured before mounting him i wanted the boat but how to get her i did not know i finally studied up a scheme mr collier wanted to buy a horse in case he sold the boat so i began talking horse trade nothing but a gentle animal would suit he said i then described one to him and asked how much he would take to boot if the pony proved to be as i represented ten dollars said he she pops continued i so i started over to cash's creek to trade horace yeomans out of an old crippled pony that he couldn't get rid of he was a nice-looking horse and apparently as sound as a dollar but on trotting him around a short while he would become suddenly lame in both of his front legs before starting to cash's creek next morning mr collier told me to try and get the horse there that night as in case we made the trade he and mr murphy would start next morning on a pleasure trip to columbia a town forty miles east i assured him that i would be back by dark you see that was a point gained making the trade after dark i succeeded in making the trade with horace he gave me old gray as he called him and fourteen dollars in money for my interest in three different brands of cattle 
he afterwards sold the cattle for enough to buy a whole herd of crippled ponies i rode back to grimes's ranch very slowly so as not to cause old gray to become lame i arrived there about sundown but remained out in the brush until after dark mr collier on being notified of my arrival came out lantern in hand bringing his friend murphy along to do the judging for him he confessed that he was a very poor judge of a spanish pony not having been long in america he was from hengland after examining old gray all over they both pronounced him a model of beauty an honor to the mustang race you see he was hog fat not having been used for so long the trade was sealed that night and next morning mr collier and murphy who already had a pony of his own started on their forty-mile journey when within five miles of elliott's ferry on the colorado river which was fifteen miles from grimes's old gray gave out entirely so that poor collier had to hoof it to the ferry where he secured another horse now kind reader you no doubt think that a shabby trick if so all i can say is such is life in the far west now that i was owner of a ship i concluded it policy to have a partner for company if nothing more so i persuaded a young factory hand by the name of scheisenhammer or some such name to go in with me in my new enterprise he only had ten dollars to invest therefore i held the controlling interest our ship was schooner rigged and would carry about three tons her name was great eastern but we changed it to the bloodhound i turned satan loose to rustle for himself i afterwards sold him to a stranger for thirty dollars and then pulled down the river for matagorda bay a distance of fifteen miles i concluded to go to the peninsula and buy a load of melons that trip as there were none in trespalacious we struck the bay just at dark the water was terribly rough and the wind was so strong that it made the bloodhound dip water and slide along as though it was fun my young pard who had never been on salt water before having been raised in st louis turned pale behind the gills and wanted to turn back when the low streak of land behind us began to grow dim but as i owned the controlling interest in the ship i told him he would have to grin and bear it he swore that would be his last trip and it was he sold me his interest on the way back for eight dollars he lost just two dollars besides his time in the speculation finally we hove in sight of the lighthouse at salura pass then we were all right for i could tell just where to head for although i hadn't been on the bay much since leaving there in sixty seven but i had learned it thoroughly before then it was fifteen miles across the bay to fred Voggs's landing where i had concluded to land we arrived there about midnight and next morning walked up to mr Voggs's house about half a mile for breakfast the whole family were glad to see me for the first time in eight years i bought a load of melons delivered at the landing for five cents a head or peace i should have said the next evening we started back home and arrived at grimes's just as the whistle was tooting for dinner next day the whole crowd of factory hands there being about seventy-five made a break for the boat to fill up on melons the largest i sold at fifty cents and the smallest at twenty-five by night i had sold entirely out and started back after another load all by myself this time with the exception of a dog a stray that i had picked up i bought my melons at a different place this time from a mr joe berg who lived a few miles above mr vogg i got them for two and a half cents apiece therefore made a better speck than before i struck a terrible storm on my return trip and came very near swamping i made my next trip to indianola as i had four passengers to take down at two dollars and a half a head shortly after landing in indianola i got two passengers one of them a pretty young lady miss ruthie ward to take to sand point in lavaca county just across the bay from indianola i remained in indianola two days bucking monte i left there broke after paying for a load of melons chapter twelve back to my favorite occupation that of a wild and woolly cowboy <laughs> 
when the oyster season began i abandoned the melon trade in favor of the former i would load up at one of the many oyster reefs in the bay and take them either to the factory or indianola where they sold for one dollar a barrel in the shell along in october some time i worked up a scheme by which i thought i could make a stake my scheme was to get into the colorado river where there were no boats and speculate among the africans that lined the river banks on both sides just as far up as it was navigable which was fifty miles or more the worst job was to get the boat into the river the mouth of it being stopped up with a raft or drift about eighteen miles long my only show was to snake her across the prairie from the head of wilson's creek a distance of five miles and that i concluded to do if it took all the oxen in matagorda county as i needed a partner in my new enterprise i managed to find one in the person of an old irishman by the name of big jack he only had a capital of eighteen dollars but i agreed to give him half of the profits which i figured on being very large you see my intentions were to swap for hides pecans etc which i could have hauled overland to wilson's creek and from there to indianola by sailboat our plans being laid we struck out for indianola to buy our goods all kinds of articles that we thought would fetch the negro's eye including a good supply of tanglefoot which i am sorry to say cost me dear besides being the cause of smashing my little scheme into a thousand fragments we finally started back from indianola with our load of goods and jack being an irishman couldn't resist the temptation of taking a wee drop of the critter every fifteen or twenty minutes the consequences were everything but edifying i hired anthony moore a gentleman of color to haul the bloodhound and all of our traps to the river we fixed rollers under the boat and after getting her out high and dry on the ball prairie found that we didn't have oxen enough to carry out the job while anthony moore was off rustling for a couple more yoke of cattle i hired a horse to ride up to the post office after my mail but before starting i gave jack a raking over for remaining drunk so long he hadn't drawn a sober breath since leaving town when i returned next evening jack was gone no one there but my faithful dog ranger i found jack had taken a negro skiff and pulled down wilson's creek taking all of my snide jewelry tobacco etc along i traced him up to where he had sold a lot of the stuff he sold an old englishman a lot of tobacco for seven dollars that didn't cost less than twenty being discouraged i sold the bloodhound to anthony moore for twenty-five dollars right where she lay on the open prairie i then hired to wiley koikendall who was buying and shipping beeves at houston at twenty-five dollars per month i left my companion ranger with anthony paying him two dollars and a half a month for his board but poor dog he met a sad fate the next winter during one of my rash moments i was out after a wild bunch of horses one day and while trying to slip up on them unobserved ranger and three others belonging to a neighbor made a break after a little calf that jumped up out of the tall grass which of course scared the horses i wanted to run after them as that was my best and only chance but i hated to go off and let the dogs kill the poor little calf which they all four had hold of by that time i finally galloped back and yelled myself hoarse trying to get them off but no use so drawing my pistol i began firing right and left when the smoke cleared away i discovered two of the dogs lifeless and poor ranger crawling up towards me howling with pain he was shot through both shoulders no no i didn't feel bad it was some other youngster about my size i dismounted and caressed the poor dumb brute with tears in my eyes it was ten miles to camp or the nearest ranch therefore i had no alternative but to kill him or leave him there to suffer and finally die i had tried to lift him on my horse so as to take him to camp and try and doctor him up but he was too heavy being a large powerful brute i made several attempts to kill him but every time i would raise the pistol to shoot he would look up into my eyes so pitifully as much as to say please don't kill me 
i at last mounted my horse and after starting off wheeled around in my saddle and put a bullet between his eyes thus ended the life of as faithful a dog as ever lived after new year's i quit mr wiley and went to work again on my own hook skinning cattle and branding mavericks i had bought me a twenty-five dollar horse for the occasion i established my camp at the head of cassius creek three miles above mr yeamans the only company i had was ranger and i didn't have him but a short while as you already know cattle died pretty badly that winter and therefore i made quite a pile of money besides branding a great many mavericks about the middle of april i met with a painful and almost fatal accident got shot through the knee with one of those old-time dragoon pistols which carry a very large ball the bullet entered the top of my knee and came out or at least was cut out on the opposite side went right through the kneecap the doctor who waited on me said i would be a cripple for life but he missed his guess although i have received another bullet hole through the same knee since then after getting wounded i remained at mr yeamans a while and then went down to mr morris's on trespalacious bay to board when i got so that i could move around on crutches i went up to mr john pierce's ranch to live mr pierce had persuaded me to put in my time going to school while unable to work he gave me my board and washing free and all i had to do was to take care of the children little johnny pierce eight years old mamie pierce shang's only child twelve years old and a miss fanny elliott sweet sixteen the schoolhouse being two miles off we had to ride on horseback i would have had a soft time of it all summer but before two weeks rolled around i had a fuss with the red-complexioned schoolmaster i then mounted bonaparte and struck out for houston ninety miles east i arrived in houston during the state fair everything was lively there in fact too lively for me the first thing i did was to strike a monte game and the second thing was lose nearly all the money i had after quitting the monte game i struck out to hunt aunt mary whom i heard had moved to houston from galveston i had never seen her that i remembered of but held her in high esteem for her kindness in sending me the white canvas breeches during the war i found her after hunting all day she kept a private boarding-house close to the union depot she appeared to be glad to see me the next day aunt mary's husband mr james mclean took me out to the fair ground to see the sights the biggest sight to me was jeff davis although i was deceived as to his make-up i expected to see a portly-looking man on a gray horse maybe the following song that i used to sing during the war had something to do with that for it ran thus jeff davis is our president and lincoln is a fool jeff davis rides a big gray horse while lincoln rides a mule End of chapters 10, 11, and 12、Chapters 13, 14, and 15 of A Texas Cowboy by Charles A. Seringo. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 Mother and I Meet at Last. After spending a week with Aunt Mary, I grew restless and pulled for Galveston to visit my Uncle Nick. I went by way of steamboat down Buffalo Bayou, leaving my horse and saddle in Houston. I landed in the island city one evening about dark. The first man I met, I inquired of him if he knew where Mr. Nicholas White lived. Why, of course, was his quick answer. I have known him for seventeen years. He then gave me the directions how to find him. His wife, whom he had just married a short while before, she being his second wife, met me at the door and escorted me to the bedroom, where I found the old fellow three sheets in the wind. He soon braced up, though, and tendered me a hearty welcome. The next day he spent in showing me around the city and introducing me to his friends as his little nephew who had to skip from western Texas for stealing cattle. I remember there were several high-toned officials among the ones he introduced me to. One of them, I think, was Tom Ochiltree, a red-headed congressman or senator, I forget which. 
the old gentleman had a horse and buggy consequently i had a regular picnic during my stay driving up and down the beach watching the pretty girls go in bathing i remained there two weeks and on taking my departure uncle nick presented me with a spencer carbine one he had captured from a yankee while out scouting during the war i was very proud of the gift for i had never owned a repeating rifle before i landed in houston flat broke but wasn't long in making a raise of ten dollars from aunt mary bonypart had been taken good care of during my absence which made him feel too rollicky he tried to pitch me off when i got on him after bidding aunt mary and uncle jim good-bye i struck out for allen pool and company's ranch on sims bayou there i hired to a mr joe davis of clear creek who had the contract furnishing beef to the gulf colorado and santa fe railroad which was just building out from galveston about the first of september i mounted ranger a pony i swapped bony part for and lit out for trespalacious my wound by that time was about well on arriving at mr tom koikendall's at the head of trespalacious river i learned that mother was at mr morris's at the mouth of cassius creek waiting for me she had arrived there just a few days after my departure for parts unknown as no one knew where i was going you see after getting shot i wrote to mother telling her of the accident and also sending her some money as i was in the habit of doing when flush hence like a kind mother she came out to be of service to me but arrived too late it is needless to say we were glad to meet for the first time in several long years i went right to work trying to rig up a home for her she had brought some money with her and i sold a lot of mavericks some of those i branded the winter previous for two dollars a head therefore we both together had money enough to build and furnish a shanty as mr morris was just going to indianola in his schooner we sent by him after our lumber etc but before he got there the big storm which swept nearly every soul from the peninsula and nearly wiped indianola out of existence struck him and scattered his boat money and everything he had aboard to the four winds of heaven he and his son tom barely escaped with their own lives mother and i experienced a share of the same storm too we were still at mr morris's the storm came about ten o'clock at night and blew the morris mansion down leaving us mrs morris her three children and a stepson jim mother and myself to paddle around in water up to our waists until morning when daylight came the bay shore was lined with dead cattle just as far as the eye could reach cattle that had blown into the water and drowned when mr morris got back he started a new ranch up at the head of cassius creek where i had camped the winter before and i built mother a shanty a few hundred yards from his so she wouldn't get lonesome while i was away i built it out of an old torn-down house that i bought from mr john pierce on tick for i was then financially busted cattle didn't die very badly that coming winter therefore i did not make much money but towards spring i got my work in branding mavericks some days i would brand as high as fifteen or twenty head that spring there was a law passed prohibiting the carrying of pistols and i was the first man to break the law for which they socked a heavier fine to me than i was able to pay but i found a good friend in the person of mr john pierce who loaned me the desired amount without asking for it the first of april i hired to w b grimes to go up the trail at thirty dollars per month i bade mother good-bye promising to return sure that coming fall our outfit consisted of twenty five hundred head of old mossy horn steers a cook and twenty-five riders including the boss asa dowdy with six head of good horses to the man everything went on lovely with the exception of swimming swollen streams fighting now and then among ourselves and a stampede every stormy night until we arrived at the canadian river in the indian territory there we had a little indian scare when within a few miles of the river dowdy went on ahead to look up a good crossing 
it wasn't long until we discovered a terrible dust on the trail between us and the river it looked like it might be a cyclone coming but instead of that it was our boss returning he galloped up almost out of wind telling us to stop the herd and make preparations for war as the woods along the river were covered with indians on the warpath after getting everything in shape for war he selected two of his best armed men which happened to be otto drab and myself to go back with him and try to make peace with the red devils we scoured the woods out thoroughly but only succeeded in finding one old blind buck asa had no doubt seen him and imagined the rest from that time on though we were among indians all the time and they used to try and scare asa into giving them wohas cattle but he wasn't one of the scaring kind except when taken by surprise everything went on smoothly again until we arrived at salt fork close to the kansas line it was raining and storming terribly when we hove in sight of the above-named river asa went on ahead with the wagons we having an extra one along then to haul wood and water in to find a crossing but on arriving there he found it very high almost swimming he succeeded in getting both wagons over though he then galloped back to hurry the herd up we were just about a mile from the river when he came dashing up saying whoop em up boys for she's rising a foot every second when we got there she was bank full and still rising it was at least half a mile to the opposite side and driftwood was coming down at a terrible rate which made it dangerous to cross but the wagons being over made it a groundhog case or at least we thought so the old lead steers went right into the foaming water without a bit of trouble and of course the balance followed henry coates was in the lead of the herd asa dowdy and otto drab on the left point while negro gabe and i kept them from turning to the right we were all that is we fellows on the points out in swimming water when henry coates horse went under which scared the leaders causing the whole herd to turn back amidst terrible confusion coates came very near drowning we worked for half an hour or more trying to get the herd to take water again but failed the river continued to rise until she was over a mile wide suffice it to say we remained there seven days without anything to eat except fresh meat without salt it rained during the whole time nearly so that we didn't get much sleep on account of having to stay with the cattle night and day the first grub we got was from a lot of soldiers camped on the opposite side of the wicked little stream wild horse they were waiting for it to go down so they could proceed to wichita kansas their destination the boss dowdy a fellow by the name of hastings and myself found the blue coats while out hunting a lot of steers lost the night before during a severe storm we had spied the white tents off to the southward and pulled out for them in a gallop on arriving within a few hundred yards we found out that a swift stream of muddy water laid between us they were camped right on the opposite bank from where we stood dowdy yelled over asking if they could spare some chuck yes was the quick response if you will come over after it dowdy and hastings both looked at me as much as to say charlie it all depends on you i was considered an extra good swimmer after shedding my heaviest clothes there being officers wives in camp so that i couldn't undress altogether i put spurs to yankee doodle and went into her it was at least two hundred yards across but i made it all o okay. k when the captain found out how long we had been without grub he ordered the cook to bring out some cold biscuits he brought out a large pan full and after i got my fists full a lot of the soldiers took the balance and selecting a narrow place threw them over one by one to dowdy and hastings after hiding a dozen or two fat government biscuits under my belt i began studying up a plan by which i could get some flour and salt also coffee over at last i hit upon a plan i got a wash-tub from the captain's wife and filling it full of such stuff as we needed launched her out into the water i swam by the side of it and landed on the opposite side about half a mile below where i started in at 
i then took the tub back thanked our benefactors mounted yankee doodle and pulled for the other shore feeling a thousand percent better we arrived at camp about sundown and the boys went to work baking bread by rolling the dough round a stick and holding it over the fire some of them sat up all night eating trying to make up for lost time the sun came out next morning for the first time in eight long days and towards evening we made it across the river the wagons we found at the pond creek ranch on the kansas side the cooks had been having a soft time chapter fourteen on a tear in wichita kansas on the fourth day of july after being on the trail just three months we landed on the ninnesqua river thirty miles west of wichita kansas nearly all the boys the boss included struck out for wichita right away to take the train for houston texas the nearest railroad point to their respective homes mr grimes paid their railroad fares according to custom in those days i concluded i would remain until fall mr grimes had come around by rail consequently he was on hand to receive us he already had several thousand steers besides our herd on hand some that he drove up the year before and others he bought around here he had them divided up into several different herds about eight hundred to the herd and scattered out into different places that is each camp off by itself from five to ten miles from any other with each herd or bunch would be a cook and chuck wagon four riders a boss included and five horses to the rider during the day two men would herd or watch the cattle until noon and the other two until time to bed them which would be about dark by bedding we mean take them to camp to a certain high piece of ground suitable for a bed ground where they would all lie down until morning unless disturbed by a storm or otherwise the nights would be divided up into four equal parts one man on at a time unless storming tormented with mosquitoes or something of the kind when every one except the cook would have to be out singing to them the herd i came up the trail with was split into three bunches and i was put with one of them under a man by the name of phillips but shortly afterwards changed and put with a mr taylor i spent all my extra time when not on duty visiting a couple of new york damsels who lived with their parents five miles east of our camp they were the only young ladies in the neighborhood the country being very thinly settled then therefore the boys thought i was very cheeky getting on courting terms with them so quick one of them finally put a head on me or in grammatical words gave me a black eye which chopped my visit short off she didn't understand the texas way of proposing for one's hand in marriage was what caused the fracas she was cleaning roasting ears for dinner when i asked her how she would like to jump into double harness and trot through life with me the air was full of flying roasting ears for a few seconds one of them striking me over the left eye and shortly afterwards a young cowpuncher rode into camp with one eye in a sling you can imagine the boys giving it to me about monkeying with civilized girls etc after that i became very lonesome had nothing to think of but my little texas girl the only one on earth i loved while sitting on herd in the hot sun or lounging around camp in the shade of the wagon there being no trees in that country to supply us with shade my mind would be on nothing but her i finally concluded to write to her and find out just how i stood as often as i had been with her i had never let her know my thoughts she being only fourteen years of age i thought there was plenty of time i wrote a long letter explaining everything and then waited patiently for an answer i felt sure she would give me encouragement if nothing more a month passed by and still no answer can it be possible that she don't think enough of me to answer my letter thought i no i would finally decide she is too much of an angel to be guilty of such at last the supply wagon arrived from wichita and among the mail was a letter for me 
i was on herd that afternoon and when the other boys came out to relieve collier and i they told me about there being a letter in camp for me written by a female judging from the fine handwriting on the envelope i was happy until i opened the letter and read a few lines it then dropped from my fingers and i turned deathly pale mr collier wanted to know if some of my relations wasn't dead suffice it to say that the object of my heart was married to my old playmate billy williams the letter went on to state that she had given her love to another and that she never thought i loved her only as a friend etc she further went on advising me to grin and bear it as there were just as good fish in the sea as ever was caught etc i wanted some one to kill me so concluded to go to the black hills as every one was flocking there then mr collier the same man i traded the crippled horse to agreed to go with me so we both struck out for wichita to settle up with daddy grimes mr collier had a good horse of his own and so did i mine was a california pony that i had given fifty-five dollars for quite a while before my intention was to take him home and make a race-horse of him he was only three years old and according to my views a lightning striker after settling up we like other locoed cow-punchers proceeded to take in the town and the result was after two or three days carousing around we left there busted with the exception of a few dollars as we didn't have money enough to take us to the black hills we concluded to pull for the medicine river one hundred miles west we arrived in kiowa a little one-horse town on the medicine about dark one cold and disagreeable evening we put up at the davis house which was kept by a man named davis by the way one of the whitest men that ever wore shoes collier made arrangements that night with mr davis to board us on tick until we could get work but i wouldn't agree to that the next morning after paying my night's lodging i had just one dollar left and i gave that to mr collier as i bade him adieu i then headed southwest across the hills not having any destination in view i wanted to go somewhere but didn't care where to tell the truth i was still somewhat rattled over my recent bad luck that night i lay out in the brush by myself and next morning changed my course to southeast down a creek called driftwood and about noon i accidentally landed in gus johnson's cow camp at the forks of driftwood and little mule creeks i remained there all night and next morning when i was fixing to pull out god only knows where the boss bill hudson asked me if i wouldn't stay and work in his place until he went to hutchison kansas and back i agreed to do so finally if he would furnish whiskey pete my pony all the corn he could eat over and above my wages which were to be twenty five dollars a month the outfit consisted of only about twenty five hundred texas steers a chuck wagon cook and five riders besides the boss a few days after mr hudson left we experienced a terrible severe snowstorm we had to stay with the drifting herd night and day therefore it went rough with us myself especially being from a warm climate and only clad in common garments while the other boys were fixed for winter when mr hudson came back from hutchison he pulled up stakes and drifted south down into the indian territory our camp was then on the territory and kansas line in search of good winter quarters we located on the eagle chief river a place where cattle had never been held before cattlemen in that section of country considered it better policy to hug the kansas line on account of indians about the time we became settled in our new quarters my month was up and mr hudson paid me twenty five dollars telling me to make that my home all winter if i wished my pile now amounted to forty-five dollars having won twenty dollars from one of the boys ike berry on a horse race they had a race horse in camp called gray dog who had never been beaten so they said but i and whiskey pete done him up to the extent of twenty dollars in fine shape i made up my mind that i would build me a dugout somewhere close to the johnson camp and put in the winter hunting and trapping 
therefore as hudson was going to kiowa with the wagon after a load of provisions etc i went along to lay me in a supply also on arriving at kiowa i found that my old pard mr collier had struck a job with the cattleman whose ranch was close to town but before spring he left for good old england where a large pile of money was waiting him one of his rich relations had died and willed him everything he had we suppose he is now putting on lots of agony if not dead and telling his green countrymen of his hairbreadth escapes on the wild texas plains we often wonder if he forgets to tell of his experience with old gray the pony i traded to him for the boat after sending mother twenty dollars by registered mail and laying in a supply of corn provisions ammunition etc i pulled back to eagle chief to make war with wild animals especially those that their hides would bring me in some money such as gray wolves coyotes wild cats buffaloes and bears i left kiowa with just three dollars in money the next morning after arriving in camp i took my stuff and moved down the river about a mile to where i had already selected a spot for my winter quarters i worked like a turk all day long building me a house out of dry poles covered with grass in the north end i built a sawed chimney and in the south end left an opening for a door when finished it lacked about two feet of being high enough for me to stand up straight it was almost dark and snowing terribly when i got it finished and a fire burning in the low jim crow fireplace i then fed whiskey peat some corn and stepped out a few yards after an armload of good solid wood for morning on getting about half an armful of wood gathered i heard something crackling and looking over my shoulder discovered my mansion in flames i got there in time to save nearly everything in the shape of bedding etc some of the grub being next to the fireplace was lost i slept at johnson's camp that night the next morning i went about two miles down the river and located another camp this time i built a dugout right on the bank of the stream in a thick bunch of timber i made the dugout in a curious shape started in at the edge of the steep bank and dug a place six feet long three feet deep and three feet wide leaving the end next to the creek open for a door i then commenced at the further end and dug another place same size in an opposite direction which formed an l i then dug still another place same size straight out from the river which made the whole concern almost in the shape of a z in the end furthest from the stream i made a fireplace by digging the earth away in the shape of a regular fireplace and then to make a chimney i dug a round hole with the aid of a butcher knife straight up as far as i could reach then commencing at the top and connecting the two holes the next thing was to make it draw and i did that by cutting and piling sods of dirt around the hole until about two feet above the level i then proceeded to build a roof over my three by eighteen mansion to do that i cut green poles four feet long and laid them across the top two or three inches apart then a layer of grass and finally to finish it off a foot of solid earth she was then ready for business my idea in making it so crooked was to keep the indians should any happen along at night from seeing my fire after getting established in my new quarters i put out quite a number of wolf baits and next morning in going to look at them found several dead wolves besides scores of skunks etc but they were frozen too stiff to skin therefore i left them until a warmer day the next morning on crawling out to feed my horse i discovered it snowing terribly accompanied with a piercing cold norther i crawled back into my hole after making whiskey peat as comfortable as possible and remained there until late in the evening when suddenly disturbed by a horny visitor it was three or four o'clock in the evening while humped up before a blazing fire thinking of days gone by that all at once before i had time to think a large red steer came tumbling down head first just missing me by a few inches 
in travelling ahead of the storm the whole johnson herd had passed right over me but luckily only one broke through talk about your ticklish places that was truly one of them a steer jammed in between me and daylight and a hot fire roasting me by inches i tried to get up through the roof it being only a foot above my head but failed finally the old steer made a terrible struggle just about the time i was fixing to turn my wicked soul over to the lord and i got a glimpse of daylight under his flanks i made a dive for it and by tight squeezing i saved my life after getting out and shaking myself i made a vow that i would leave that god-forsaken country in less than twenty-four hours and i did so chapter fifteen a lonely trip down the cimarron the next morning after the steer racket i pulled out for kiowa kansas it was then sleeting from the north consequently i had to face it about three o'clock in the evening i changed my notion and concluded to head for texas so i turned east down the eagle chief to where it emptied into the cimarron and thence down that stream knowing that i was bound to strike the chisholm trail the one i came up on the spring before i camped that night at the mouth of eagle chief and went to roost on an empty stomach not having brought any grub with me i was then in the western edge of what is known as the blackjack country which extends east far beyond the chisholm trail the next morning i continued down the cimarron through blackjack timber and sand hills to avoid the sand hills which appeared fewer on the opposite side i undertook to cross the river but bogged down in the quicksand and had to turn back that night i camped between two large sand hills and made my bed in a tall bunch of blue stem grass i went to bed as full as a tick as i had just eaten a mule-eared rabbit one i had slipped up on to and killed with a club i was afraid to shoot at the large droves of deer and turkeys on account of the country being full of fresh indian signs i crawled out of my nest next morning almost frozen i built a roaring big fire on the south edge of the bunch of tall grass so as to check the cold piercing norther after enjoying the warm fire a few moments i began to get thirsty and there being no water near at hand i took my tin cup and walked over to a large snowdrift a short distance off to get it full of clean snow which i intended melting by the fire to quench my burning thirst while filling the cup i heard a crackling noise behind me and looking over my shoulder discovered a blaze of fire twenty feet in the air and spreading at a terrible rate i arrived on the scene just in time to save whisky pete from a horrible death he was tied to a tree the top limbs of which were already in a blaze i also managed to save my saddle and an old piece of saddle blanket they being out under the tree that whisky pete was tied to i didn't mind losing my leather leggings saddle blankets etc so much as i did the old dilapidated overcoat that contained a little silver-plated match-box in one of the pockets that day i travelled steady but not making very rapid progress on account of winding around sand-hills watching for indians and going around the heads of boggy sloughs i was certain of striking the chisholm trail before night but was doomed to disappointment i pitched camp about nine o'clock that night and played a single-handed game of freeze-out until morning not having any matches to make a fire with i hadn't gone more than two miles next morning when i came across a camp-fire which looked as though it had been used a few hours before on examination i found it had been an indian camp just vacated that morning the trail which contained the tracks of forty or fifty head of horses led down the river after warming myself i struck right out on their trail being very cautious not to run on to them every now and then i would dismount and crawl to the top of a tall sand hill to see that the road was clear ahead about noon i came to a large creek which proved to be turkey creek the reds had made a good crossing by digging the banks down and breaking the ice after crossing i hadn't gone but a short distance when i came in sight of the chisholm trail 
i never was so glad to see anything before unless it was the little streak of daylight under the steer's flanks the indians on striking the trail had struck south on it and after crossing the cimarron i came in sight of them about five miles ahead of me i rode slow so as to let them get out of sight i didn't care to come in contact with them for fear they might want my horse and possibly my scalp about dark that evening i rode into a large camp of government freighters who informed me that the fifty indians who had just passed being on their way back to the reservation were kiowas who had been on a hunting expedition i fared well that night got a good supper and a warm bed to sleep in besides a good square meal of corn and oats for my horse the next morning before starting on my journey an old irish teamster by the name of long mike presented me with a pair of pants mine being almost in rags and a blue soldier coat which i can assure you i appreciated very much about dusk that evening i rode into cheyenne agency and that night slept in a house for the first time since leaving kiowa in fact i hadn't seen a house since leaving kiowa the next morning i continued south and that night put up at bill williams ranch on the south canadian river shortly after leaving the williams ranch next morning i met a crowd of chickasaw indians who bantered me for a horse race as whiskey pete was tired and footsore i refused but they kept after me until finally i took them up i put up my saddle and pistol against one of their ponies the pistol i kept buckled around me for fear they might try to swindle me the saddle i put up and rode the race bareback I came out ahead, but not enough to brag about. They gave up the pony without a murmur, but tried to persuade me to run against one of their other ponies, a much larger and finer-looking one. I rode off thanking them very kindly for what they had already done for me. That night I put up at a ranch on the Washita River, and next morning, before leaving, swapped my Indian pony off for another one and got ten dollars to boot that morning i left the chisholm trail and struck down the washita river in search of a good lively place where i might put in the balance of the winter i landed in aaron springs late that evening and found a grand ball in full bloom at frank murray's mansion the dancers were a mixed crowd the ladies being half-breeds and the men mostly americans and very tough citizens of course i joined the mob being in search of excitement and had a gay old time drinking kill me quick whiskey and swinging the pretty indian maidens after breakfast next morning the whole crowd ladies and all went down the river five miles to witness a big horse race at kickapoo flat after the big race which was for several thousand dollars was over the day was spent in running pony races and drinking whiskey by night the whole mob were gloriously drunk your humble servant included there were several fights and fusses took place during the day but no one seriously hurt it being against the laws of the united states to sell or have whiskey in the indian territory you might wonder where it came from a man by the name of bill anderson said to have been one of quantrell's men during the war did the selling he defied the United States Marshals, and it was said that he had over a hundred indictments against him. He sold it at ten dollars a gallon, therefore, you see, he could afford to run quite a risk. The next day, on my way down the river to Paul's Valley, I got rid of my extra pony. I came across two apple peddlers who were on their way to Fort Sill with a load of apples, and who had had the misfortune of losing one of their horses by death the night before thereby leaving them on the prairie helpless unable to move on they had no money to buy another horse with having spent all their surplus wealth in arkansas for the load of apples when i gave them the pony they felt very happy judging from their actions on taking my departure one of them insisted on my taking his silver watch as a token of friendship i afterwards had the watch stolen from me well patient reader i will now drop the curtain for a while just suffice it to say i had a tough time of it during the rest of the winter and came out carrying two bullet wounds but i had some gay times as well as tough 
and won considerable money running whiskey peak the following may i landed in gainesville texas right side up with care and from there went to st joe on the chisholm trail where i succeeded in getting a job with a passing herd belonging to captain littlefield of gonzales the boss's name was jim wells and the herd contained thirty five hundred head of stock cattle it being a terribly wet season we experienced considerable hardships swimming swollen streams etc we also had some trouble with indians we arrived at dodge city kansas on the third day of july and that night i quit and went to town to whoop em up liza jane i met an old friend that night by the name of wes adams and we both had a gay time until towards morning when he got severely stabbed in a free-to-all fight on the morning of july fifth i hired to david t beals or the firm of bates and beals as the outfit was commonly called to help drive a herd of steers twenty five hundred head to the panhandle of texas where he intended starting a new ranch the next morning we struck out on the old fort bascom trail in a southwesterly direction the outfit consisted of eight men besides the boss bill allen and deacon bates one of mr beale's silent partners who was going along to locate the new range and o m johnson the whole-souled ex-rebel cook we had six extra good horses apiece my six being named as follows comanche allison last chance creeping moses dam fido and beaten be damned the last named was afterwards shot full of arrows because he wouldn't hurry while being driven off by a band of indians who had made a raid on the camp end of chapters thirteen fourteen and fifteen Chapters sixteen, seventeen, and eighteen of A Texas Cowboy by Charles A. Seringo. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter sixteen. My first experience roping a buffalo. About the sixth day out from Dodge, we crossed the Cimarron, and that evening I had a little excitement chasing a herd of buffaloes. After crossing the river about noon, we drove out to the divide five or six miles and made a dry camp it was my evening to lay in camp or do anything else i wished therefore concluded i would saddle my little indian mare one i had traded for from an indian and take a hunt about the time i was nearly ready to go mr bates seeing some of the cattle slipping off into a bunch of sand hills which were near the herd asked me if i wouldn't ride out and turn them back i went leaving my pistol and gun in camp thinking of course that i would be back in a few minutes but instead of that i didn't get back until after dinner the next day just as i was starting back to camp after turning to cattle a large herd of buffaloes dashed by camp headed west the boys all ran out with their guns and began firing i became excited and putting spurs to my pony struck out to overtake and kill a few of them forgetting that i didn't have anything to shoot with as they had over a mile the start it wasn't an easy matter to overtake them it was about four o'clock in the afternoon and terribly hot which of course cut off my pony's wind and checked her speed to a great extent about sundown i overtook them their tongues were sticking out a yard i took down my rope from the saddle horn having just missed my shooting irons a few minutes before and threw it on to a yearling heifer when the rope tightened the yearling began to bleat and its mammy broke back out of the herd and took after me i tried to turn the rope loose so as to get out of the way but couldn't as it was drawn very tight around the saddle horn to my great delight after raking some of the surplus hair from my pony's hindquarters she turned and struck out after the still fleeing herd now the question arose in my mind how are you going to kill your buffalo break her neck was the only way i could think of after trying it several times by running against the rope at full speed i gave it up as a failure i then concluded to cut the rope and let her go so getting out my old frog sticker an old pocket-knife i had picked up a few days before and which i used to clean my pipe 
i went to work trying to open the little blade it being the only one that would cut hot butter the big blade was open when i found it consequently it was nothing but a sheet of rust the little blade had become rusted considerably which made it hard to open previous to that i always used my bowie knife which at that time was hanging to my pistol belt in camp to open it with after working a few minutes i gave up the notion of opening the little blade and went to work sawing at the rope with the big one but i soon gave that up also as i could have made just as much headway by cutting with my finger at last i dismounted and went to him or at least her with nothing but my muscle for weapon i finally managed to get her down by getting one hand fastened to her under jaw and the other hold of one horn and then twisting her neck as some of you might wonder why i had so much trouble with this little animal when it is a known fact that one man by himself can tie down the largest domestic bull that ever lived i will say that the difference between a buffalo and a domestic bull is that the latter when you throw him hard against the ground two or three times will lie still long enough to give you a chance to jump aboard of him while the former will rise to his feet instantly just as long as there's a bit of life left after getting her tied down with my sash a silk concern that i kept my breeches up with i went to work opening the little blade of my knife i broke the big one off and then used it for a pry to open the other with when i got her throat cut i concluded it a good idea to take the hide along to show the boys that i didn't have my run for nothing so went to work skinning which i found to be a tedious job with such a small knife blade it was pitch dark when i started towards camp with the hide and a small chunk of meat tied behind my saddle after riding east about a mile i abandoned the idea of going to camp and turned south facing the cool breeze in hopes of finding water my pony and i both being nearly dead for a drink it was at least twenty miles to camp over a level dry plain therefore i imagined it an impossibility to go that distance without water as the streams all lay east and west in that country i knew by going south i was bound to strike one sooner or later about midnight i began to get sleepy so pulling the bridle off my pony so she could graze i spread the buffalo hide down hair up and after wrapping the end of the rope that my pony was fastened to around my body once or twice so she couldn't get loose without me knowing it fell asleep i hadn't slept long when i awoke covered from head to foot with ants the fresh hide had attracted them after freeing myself of most of the little pests i continued my journey in search of water about three o'clock in the morning i lay down again but this time left the hide on my saddle i think i must have been asleep about an hour when all at once my pony gave a tremendous snort and struck out at full speed dragging me after her you see i had wrapped the rope around my body as before and it held me fast some way or another i suppose by getting tangled luckily for me though it came loose after dragging me about a hundred yards you can imagine my feelings on gaining my feet and finding myself standing on the broad prairie afoot i felt just like a little boy does when he lets a bird slip out of his hand accidentally that is exceedingly foolish the earth was still shaking and i could hear a roaring noise like that of distant thunder a large herd of buffaloes had just passed while standing scratching my head a faint noise greeted my ear it was my pony snorting a tramp of about three hundred yards brought me to her she was shaking as though she had a chill i mounted and continued my journey south determined on not stopping any more that night about ten o'clock next morning i struck water on the head of sharps creek a tributary to beaver or head of north canadian when i got to camp it having been moved south about twenty miles from where i left it the boys had just eaten dinner and two of them were fixing to go back and hunt me up thinking some sad misfortune had befallen me when we got to blue creek a tributary to south canadian 
camp was located for a while until a suitable location could be found for a permanent ranch mr bates struck out across the country to the canadian river taking me along to hunt the range one large enough for at least fifty thousand cattle after being out three days we landed at tascosa a little mexican town on the canadian there were only two americans there howard and reinhardt who kept the only store in town their stock of goods consisted of three barrels of whiskey and half a dozen boxes of soda crackers from there we went down the river twenty-five miles where we found a little trading point consisting of one store and two mexican families the store which was kept by a man named pitcher had nothing in it but whiskey and tobacco his customers were mostly transient buffalo hunters they being mostly indians and mexicans he also made a business of dealing in robes furs etc which he shipped to fort lyons colorado where his partner an officer in the united states army lived there were three hundred apache indians camped right across the river from cold springs as pitcher called his ranch a few miles below where the little store stood mr bates decided on being the center of the l x range and right there wheeler post office now stands and that same range which was then black with buffaloes is now stocked with seventy five thousand fine-blooded cattle and all fenced in so you see time makes changes even out here in the western wilds chapter seventeen an exciting trip after thieves after arriving on our newly located ranch we counted the cattle and found the herd three hundred head short bill allen the boss struck back to try and find their trail he found it leading south from the rifle pits the cattle had stolen out of the herd without any one finding it out and of course finding themselves free they having come from southern texas they headed south across the plains allen came back to camp and taking me and two horses apiece struck down the river to head them off we made our headquarters at fort elliott and scoured the country out for a hundred miles square we succeeded in getting about two hundred head of them some had become wild and were mixed up with large herds of buffalo while others had been taken up by ranchmen around the fort and the brands disfigured we got back to camp after being absent a month about the first of october four more herds arrived three from dodge and one from granada colorado where bates and beals formerly had a large ranch we then turned them all loose on the river and established sign camps around the entire range which was about forty miles square the camps were stationed from twenty-five to thirty miles apart there were two men to the camp and our duty was to see that no cattle drifted outside of the line on their ride which was halfway up to the next camp on each side or in plainer words one man would ride south towards the camp in that direction while his pard would go north until he met the man from the next camp which would generally be on a hill as near halfway as possible if any cattle had crossed over the line during the night they would leave a trail of course and this the rider would follow up until he overtook them he would then bring them back inside of the line sometimes though they would come out so thick that half a dozen men couldn't keep them back for instance during a bad storm under such circumstances he would have to do the best he could until he got a chance to send to the home ranch for help a young man by the name of john robinson and myself were put in a sign camp ten miles south of the river at the foot of the staked plains it was the worst camp in the whole business for three different reasons the first one being cattle naturally want to drift south in the winter and secondly the cold storms always came from the north and the third and most objectionable cause was if any happened to get over the line on to the staked plains during a bad snowstorm they were considered gone as there were no breaks or anything to check them for quite a distance for instance drifting southwest they would have nothing but a level plain to travel over for a distance of three hundred miles to the pecos river near the old mexico line 
john and i built a small stone house on the head of bonetta canyon and had a hog killing time all by ourselves hunting was our delight at first until it became old we always had four or five different kinds of meat in camp buffalo meat was way below par with us for we could go a few hundred yards from camp any time of day and kill any number of the woolly brutes to give you an idea how thick buffaloes were around there that fall we'll say at one time when we first located our camp on the bonetta there was a solid string of them from one to three miles wide going south which took three days and nights to cross the canadian river and at other times i have seen them so thick on the plains that the country would look black just as far as the eye could reach late that fall we had a change in bosses mr allen went home to corpus christi texas and a man by the name of moore came down from colorado and took his place about christmas we had a little excitement chasing some mexican thieves who robbed mr pitcher of everything he had in his little jim crow store john and i were absent from our camp six days on this trip there were nine of us in the pursuing party headed by mr moore our boss we caught the outfit which consisted of five men all well armed and three women two of them being pretty maidens on the staked plains headed for mexico it was on this trip that i swore off getting drunk and i have stuck to it with the exception of once and that was over the election of president cleveland it happened thus we rode into tascosa about an hour after dark having been in the saddle and on a hot trail all day without food or water supper being ordered we passed off the time waiting by sampling howard and reinhardt's bug juice supper was called and the boys all rushed to the table a few sheepskins spread on the dirt floor when about through they missed one of their crowd a fellow about my size on searching far and near he was found lying helplessly drunk under his horse whiskey pete who was tied to a rack in front of the store a few glasses of salty water administered by mr moore brought me to my right mind moore then after advising me to remain until morning not being able to endure an all-night ride as he thought called come on fellers and mounting their tired horses they dashed off at almost full speed there i stood leaning against the rack not feeling able to move whisky pete was rearing and prancing in his great anxiety to follow the crowd i finally climbed into the saddle the pony still tied to the rack i had sense enough left to know that i couldn't get on him if loose in the fix i was in then pulling out my bowie knife i cut the rope and hugged the saddle horn with both hands i overtook and stayed with the crowd all night but if ever a mortal suffered it was me my stomach felt as though it was filled with scorpions wild cats and lizards i swore if god would forgive me for getting on that drunk i would never do so again but the promise was broken as i stated before when i received the glorious news of cleveland's election after new year's moore took jack ryan van dozen and myself and went on an exploring expedition south across the staked plains with a view of learning the country the first place we struck was canyon paladuro head of red river the whole country over there was full of indians and mexicans we laid over two days in one of their camps watching them lance buffaloes from there we went to mulberry where we put in three or four days hunting when we pulled out again our pack pony was loaded down with fat bear meat chapter eighteen seven weeks among indians on our arrival back to the ranch moore rigged up a scouting outfit to do nothing but drift over the plains in search of strayed cattle the outfit consisted of a well-filled chuck-wagon, a number one good cook, Mr. O. M. Johnson, and three warriors, Jack Ryan, Van Dusen, and me. We had two good horses apiece, that is, all but myself. I had three, counting Whiskey Pete. 
about the sixth day out we struck three thousand comanche indians and became pretty badly scared up we had camped for the night on the plains at the forks of mulberry and canyon paladuro a point from whence could be seen one of the roughest and most picturesque scopes of country in the west the next morning jack ryan went with the wagon to pilot it across mulberry canyon while van and i branched off down into canyon paladuro to look for cattle signs we succeeded in finding two little knotty-headed two-year-old steers with a bunch of buffalo they were almost as wild as their woolly associates but we managed to get them cut out and headed in the direction the wagon had gone about noon on turning a sharp curve in the canyon we suddenly came in full view of our wagon surrounded with a couple of thousand redskins on horseback and others still pouring down from the hills on the east it was too late to figure out what to do for they had already seen us only being half a mile off you see the two wild steers had turned the curve ahead of us and attracted the indians attention in that direction we couldn't see anything but the white top of our wagon on account of the solid mass of reds hence couldn't tell whether our boys were still among the living or not we thought of running once but finally concluded to go up and take our medicine like little men in case they were on the warpath leaving whiskey pete who was tied behind the wagon kept me from running more than anything else on pushing our way through the mass we found the boys winchesters in hand telling the old chiefs where to find plenty of buffalo there were three thousand in the band and they had just come from fort sill indian territory on a hunting expedition they wanted to get where buffaloes were plentiful before locating winter quarters from that time on we were among indians all the time the pawnee tribe was the next we came in contact with close to the indian territory line we ran afoul of the whole cheyenne tribe they were half starved all the buffalo having drifted south and their ponies being too poor and weak to follow them up we traded them out of lots of blankets trinkets etc for a pint of flour or coffee they would give their whole soul and body thrown in for good measure we soon ran out of chuck too having swapped it all off to the hungry devils we then circled around by fort elliott and up the canadian river to the ranch arriving there with eighteen head of our steers after an absence of seven weeks we only had to remain at the ranch long enough to get a new supply of chuck etc and a fresh lot of horses as moore sent us right back to the plains in a south-westerly direction this time we remained on the plains scouting around during the rest of the winter only making short trips to the ranch after fresh horses and grub we experienced some rough times too especially during severe snowstorms when our only fuel buffalo chips would be covered up in the deep snow even after the snow melted off for several days afterwards we could not get much warmth out of the buffalo chips on account of them being wet about the first of april moore called us in from the plains to go up the river to fort bascom new mexico on a rounding up expedition we were gone on that trip over a month on our arrival back moore went right to work gathering up everything on the range in the shape of cattle so as to close herd them during the summer his idea in doing that was to keep them tame during the winter they had become almost beyond control the range was too large for so few cattle and another thing buffalo being so plentiful had a tendency to make them wild about the first of june moore put me in charge of an outfit which consisted of twenty five hundred steers a wagon and cook four riders and five horses to the man or rider he told me to drift over the plains wherever i felt like just so i brought the cattle in fat by the time cold weather set in it being an unusually wet summer the scores of basins or dry lakes as we called them contained an abundance of nice fresh water therefore we would make a fresh camp every few days the grass was also fine being mostly buffalo grass and nearly a foot high if ever i enjoyed life it was that summer no flies or mosquitoes to bother lots of game and a palmy atmosphere 
towards the latter part of july about ten thousand head of through cattle arrived from southern texas to keep the wintered ones from catching the texas fever mr moore put them all on the plains leaving the new arrivals on the north side of the river there was three herds besides mine and i was put in charge of the whole outfit that is the four herds although they were held separate as before with the regular number of men horses etc to each herd i then put one of my men in charge of the herd i had been holding and from that time on until late in the fall i had nothing to do but ride from one herd to the other and see how they were getting along sometimes the camps would be twenty miles apart i generally counted each bunch once a week to be certain they were all there about the first of october moore came out and picked eight hundred of the fattest steers out of the four herds and sent them to dodge to be shipped to chicago he then took everything to the river to be turned loose on to the winter range until the next spring when the hardest work was over winter camps established etc i secured moore's consent to let me try and overtake the shipping steers and accompany them to chicago so mounted on whiskey pete i struck out accompanied by one of the boys john ferris it was doubtful whether we would overtake the herd before being shipped as they had already been on the road about fifteen days long enough to have gotten there the night after crossing the cimarron river we had a little indian scare about three o'clock that afternoon we noticed two or three hundred mounted reds off to one side of the road marching up a ravine in single file being only a mile off john proposed to me that we go over and tackle them for something to eat we were terribly hungry as well as thirsty i agreed so we turned and rode towards them on discovering us they all bunched up as though parleying we didn't like such manoeuvring being afraid maybe they were on the warpath so turned and continued our journey along the road keeping a close watch behind for fear they might conclude to follow us we arrived on Crooked Creek, where there was a store and several ranches just about dark. On riding up to the store, where we intended stopping all night, we found it vacated and everything turned upside down as though the occupants had just left in a terrible hurry. Hearing some ox bells down the creek, we turned in that direction in hopes of finding something to eat. About a mile's ride brought us to a ranch where several yoke of oxen stood grazing near the door. Finding a sack of corn in a wagon, we fed our horses, and then burst open the door of the log house, which was locked. Out jumped a little playful puppy, who had been asleep, his master having locked him up there, no doubt in his anxiety to pull for dodge hanging over the still warm ashes was a pot of nice beef soup which had never been touched and in the old box cupboard was a lot of cold biscuits and a jar of nice preserves besides a jug of molasses after filling up we struck out for dodge still a distance of twenty-five miles we arrived there a short while after sun-up next morning and the first man we met an old friend by the name of willingham informed us of the indian outbreak there had been several men killed on crooked creek the evening before hence john and i finding the ranches deserted on riding through the streets that morning crowds of women some of them crying seeing we were just in from the south flocked around us inquiring for their absent ones fathers brothers lovers and sons some of whom had already been killed no doubt there having been hundreds of men killed in the last few days john and i of course laughed in our boots to think that we turned back instead of going on to the band of bloodthirsty devils that we had started to go to the first thing after putting our horses up at the livery stable we went to wright and beverly's store and deposited our wealth john had a draft for one hundred and fourteen dollars while i had about three hundred and fifty dollars we then shed our old clothes and crawled into a brand-new rig out and out erskine clement one of mr beale's partners was in town waiting to ship the herd which should have been there by that time but he hadn't heard a word from it since getting moore's letter which by the way had to go around through las vegas new mexico and down through the southern part of colorado 
stating about what time it would arrive in dodge he was terribly worried when i informed him that john and i had neither seen nor heard anything of the outfit since it left the ranch that night about ten o'clock john who had struck a lot of his old chums came and borrowed twenty-five dollars from me having already spent his one hundred and fourteen dollars that he had when he struck town i went to bed early that night as i had promised to go with clement early next morning to make a search for the missing herd the next morning when clement and i were fixing to strike out john came to me looking bad after his all-night rampage to get his horse and saddle out of soap i done so which cost me thirty-five dollars and never seen the poor boy afterwards shortly after that he went to fort sumner and was killed by one of billy the kid's men a fellow by the name of barney mason thus ended the life of a good man who like scores of others let the greatest curse ever known to mankind whisky get the upper hand of him clement and i pulled south our ponies loaded down with ammunition so in case the indians got us corralled we could stand them off a few days at least we were well armed both having a good winchester and a couple of colt's pistols apiece we found the outfit coming down crooked creek they having left the main trail or road on the cimarron and came over a much longer route to avoid driving over a dry stretch of country forty miles between water hence john and i missing them no doubt but that it was a lucky move in them taking that route for on the other they would have just about come in contact with the three or four hundred cheyenne reds whose bloody deeds are still remembered in that country on arriving in town with the herd we split it in two making four hundred head in each bunch and put one half on the cars to be shipped to chicago i accompanied the first lot while clement remained to come on with the next in burlington iowa i met mr beals we lay there all day feeding and watering the cattle on arriving in chicago i went right to the palmer house but after paying one dollar for dinner i concluded its price too high for a common clodhopper like myself so i moved to the irvin house close to the washington street tunnel a two dollar a day house that night i turned myself loose taking in the town or at least a little corner of it i squandered about fifteen dollars that night on bootblacks alone every one of the little imps i met struck me for a dime or something to eat they knew at a glance from the cut of my jib that they had struck a bonanza they continued to work me too during my whole stay in the city at one time while walking with mr beals and another gentleman a crowd of them who had spied me from across the street yelled yonder goes our texas ranger let's tackle him for some stuff about the third day i went broke and from that time on i had to borrow from mr beals i left there about a hundred dollars in his debt after spending six days in the city i left for dodge city kansas in company with mr beals and erskine clement who instead of stopping at dodge continued on to granada colorado where the beals cattle company still held their headquarters arriving in dodge city i found whiskey pete whom i had left in anderson's stable all o k and mounting him i struck out all alone for the l x ranch two hundred and twenty five miles arriving at the ranch i found the noted billy the kid and his gang there among his daring followers were the afterwards noted tom o'falliard and henry brown leader of the medicine lodge bank tragedy which happened in eighteen eighty four who was shot in trying to escape while his three companions were hung the kid was there trying to dispose of a herd of ponies he had stolen from the seven river warriors in lincoln county new mexico his bitter enemies whom he had fought so hard against that past summer in what is known as the bloody lincoln county war of seventy eight during his stay at the ranch and around tascosa i became intimately acquainted with him and his jovial crowd i mention these facts because i intend to give you a brief sketch of billy's doings in the closing pages of this book End of chapter 16, 17, and 18
chapters nineteen twenty and twenty one of a texas cowboy by charles a seringo this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen a lonely ride of eleven hundred miles after laying around the ranch a couple of weeks mr moore put me in charge of a scouting outfit and sent me out on the south plains to drift about all winter watching for cattle thieves etc also to turn back any cattle that might slip by the sign riders and drift across the plains during that winter we that is my crowd went to church several times a little colony of christians headed by the rev cahart had settled on the head of salt fork a tributary of red river and built a church house in which the little crowd numbering less than fifty souls would congregate every sunday and pray that same little church house now ornaments the thriving little city of clarendon county seat of donley county the old inhabitants point to it with pride when telling of how it once stood solitary and alone out on the great buffalo range two hundred miles from nowhere the colony had come from illinois and drifted away out there beyond the outskirts of civilization to get loose from that demon whiskey and early that coming spring a lot of ruffians started a saloon in their midst a meeting was called in the little church house and resolutions passed to drive them out if in no other way with powder and lead they pulled their freight and i am proud to state that i had a hand in making them pull it for the simple reason that they had no business encroaching upon those good people's rights when spring opened mr moore called me in from the plains and put me in charge of a rounding up outfit which consisted of twelve riders and a cook to begin rounding up we went over to canyon paladuro where charles goodnight had a ranch and where a great many of the river cattle had drifted during the winter there was about a hundred men and seven or eight wagons in the outfit that went over we stopped over sunday in the little christian colony and went to church the rev cahart preached about the wild and woolly cowboy of the west how the eastern people had him pictured off as a kind of animal with horns etc while to him looking down from his dry-goods box pulpit into the manly faces of nearly a hundred of them they looked just like human beings minus the standing collar etc about the first of july moore sent me to nickerson kansas with a herd of eight hundred shipping steers my outfit consisted of five men a chuck wagon etc our route lay over a wild strip of country where there were no trails nor scarcely any ranches that is until reaching the southern line of kansas we arrived at nickerson after being on the road two months deacon bates mr beale's partner was there waiting for us he had come through with several herds that had left the ranch a month ahead of us he was still holding some of the poorest ones south of town where he had a camp established after loading my wagon with a fresh supply of grub mr bates or the deacon as he was more commonly called sent me back over the trail he and his outfits had come to gather lost steers some they had lost coming through i was gone about a month and came back with eighteen head we had a soft trip of it as most of our hard work was such as buying butter eggs etc from the scattering grangers along the kansas border we never missed a meal on the trip and always had the best the country afforded regardless of cost deacon bates was always bragging on some of his bosses how cheap they could live etc i just thought i would try him this time being in a country where luxuries were plentiful and see if he wouldn't blow on me as being a person with good horse sense an animal of course as we all know will eat the choicest grub he can get and why not man when he is credited with having more sense than the horse one of the most intellectual animals that exists on our return to nickerson i concluded to quit and spend the winter with mother whom i received letters from every now and then begging me to come home as i wasn't certain of coming back i thought it best to go overland and take whiskey pete along for i couldn't even bear the thought of parting with him and to hire a car to take him round by rail would be too costly i got all ready to start and then went to deacon bates for a settlement he took my account book and after looking it over said 
why dumb it to hell i can't pay no such bills as those why dumb it all old jay gould would groan under the weight of these bills he then went on to read some of the items aloud they ran as follows codfish ten dollars eggs forty dollars butter seventy dollars milk five dollars bacon a hundred and fifty dollars flour two hundred dollars canned fruits four hundred dollars sundry six hundred dollars etc etc suffice it to say the old gent told me in plain yankee english that i would have to go to chicago and settle with mr beals i hated the idea of going to chicago for i knew my failings i was afraid i wouldn't have money enough left when i got back to pay my expenses home that same evening a letter came from mr beals stating that he had just received a letter from moore at the ranch in which he informed him that there were two more herds on the trail for nickerson and as it was getting so near winter for joe hargraves better known as jingle bob joe and i to go and turn them to dodge city the nearest shipping point after putting whisky pete and my missouri mare one i had bought to use as a pack-horse going home in care of an old granger to be fed and taken care of until my return joe and i struck out with only one horse apiece just the ones we were riding on our arrival at dodge i pulled out for chicago to get a settlement with the first train-load we shipped i took my saddle bridle spurs etc along and left them in atchison missouri the first point we stopped to feed at until my return arriving in chicago i told mr beals that i was going home to spend the winter and therefore wanted to settle up he set him up to a fine havana and then proceeded every time he came to one of those big bills which caused the deacon's eyes to bulge out he would grunt and crack about a forty-cent smile but never kicked when he had finished there was a few hundred dollars to my credit he then asked me if i could think of anything else that i had forgotten to charge the company with of course i couldn't because i didn't have time his question was put to me too sudden if i could have had a few hours to myself to figure the thing up just right i think i could have satisfied the old gent i remained in the city three days taking in the sights and feeding the hungry little bootblacks when leaving mr beals informed me that he was going to buy a lot of southern texas cattle to put on his panhandle ranch the coming spring and if i wanted a job to hold myself in readiness to boss one of the herds up the trail for him of course that just suited me providing i couldn't make up my mind to remain at home landing in nickerson i hired a horse and went out to the old granger's ranch where i had left my two ponies they were both fat and feeling good before starting out on my little journey of only eleven hundred miles i bought a pack saddle and cooking outfit that is just a frying pan small coffee pot etc i used the mare for a pack animal and rode whisky pete i had just six dollars left when i rode out of nickerson i went through fort reno and fort sill indian territory and crossed red river into texas on the old military road opposite henrietta when within ten miles of denton texas on pecan creek whisky pete became lame so much so that he could scarcely walk i was stopping overnight with a mr cobb and next morning i first noticed his lameness i lacked about twenty-five cents of having enough to pay mr cobb for my night's lodging that morning i had sold my watch for five dollars a short while before and now that was spent whisky pete being too lame to travel i left him with mr cobb while i rode into denton to try and make a raise of some money i tried to swap my mare off for a smaller animal and get some boot but every one seemed to think that she had been stolen i being so anxious to swap I rode back to Mr. Cobb's that night in the same fix, financially, as when I left that morning. The next day I made a raise of some money. Mr. Cobb and I made a saddle swap, he giving me twenty dollars to boot. He and I also swapped bridles, I getting four dollars and a half to boot. One of his little boys then gave me his saddle and one dollar and a half for my pack saddle, which had cost me ten dollars in Nickerson. I then had lots of money whisky pete soon got over his lameness having just stuck a little snag into the frog of his foot 
which i succeeded in finding and pulling out before it had time to do serious damage and i started on my journey again on arriving in denton that time a negro struck me for a horse swap right away i got a three-year-old pony and six dollars in money for my mare the pony suited just as well for a pack animal as the mare the next day after leaving denton i stopped in a negro settlement and won a fifty-dollar horse running whisky peat against a sleepy-looking gray i had up twenty dollars in money and my winchester a fine silver-mounted gun i won the race by at least ten open feet but the negroes tried to swindle me out of it while riding along that evening three negroes rode up and claimed the horse i had won they claimed that the parties who bet him off had no right to him as they had just borrowed him from one of them to ride to the settlement that morning i finally let them have him for twenty dollars i went through the following towns after leaving denton fort worth Glenburn, hillsborough waco harine bryant brenham and columbus besides scores of smaller places i rode up to mother's little shanty on cache creek after being on the road just a month and twelve days to say that mother was glad to see me would only half express it she bounced me the first thing about not coming back the next fall after leaving as i had promised i had been gone nearly four years chapter twenty another start up the chisholm trail i hadn't been at home but a few days when i came very near getting killed by a falling house mother had become tired of the neighborhood she lived in and wanted me to move her and her shanty down the creek about a mile to mr cornelius's so hiring a yoke of oxen although a pair of goats would have answered the purpose i hauled her household goods down to the spot selected i then went to work tearing the shanty down in building it i had set eight pine posts two feet in the ground and then nailed the sidings etc to them there was only one room and it was eight feet wide and fourteen long the roof had been made of heavy pine boards after tearing both ends out i climbed onto the roof to undo that i was a straddle of the sharp roof about midway axe in one hand and a large chisel in the other when all at once the sides began spreading out at the top of course i began sinking slowly but surely until everything went down with a crash the pine posts had become rotten from the top of the ground down and just as soon as the roof and i had struck bottom the sides flopped over on to us a neighbor's little boy by the name of benny williams had been monkeying around watching me work and unluckily he was inside of the shanty when the collapse came i was sensible but unable to move there being so much weight on me finally little benny who was one thickness of boards under me woke up and began squalling like a six months old calf being put through the process of branding after squalling himself hoarse he began to moan most piteously that was too much for me i could stand his bleeding but his moaning for help put new life into my lazy muscles causing me to exert every nerve in my body so as to get out and render the poor boy assistance i had before the boy's cries disturbed me made up my mind to lie still and wait for something to turn up in exerting myself i found that i could move my body down towards my feet an inch at a time the weight was all on my left shoulder but it soon came in contact with something else which relieved my bruised shoulder of most of the weight i got out finally after a long and painful struggle and securing help from the morris ranch fished benny out he had one leg broken below the knee besides other bruises i was slightly disfigured but still in the ring i put in the winter visiting friends hunting etc i had sold my cattle the mavericks branded nearly four years before to mr george hamilton at the market price from five to ten dollars a head according to quality to be paid for when he got his own brand put on to them every now and then he would brand a few and with the money received for them i would buy grub and keep up my dignity about the first of march i received a letter from mr rosencrans one of d t beale's partners 
stating that mr beals had bought his cattle in middle texas instead of southern as he had expected and as he had told me in chicago but continued the letter we have bought a herd from charles word of goliad on the san antonio river to be delivered at our panhandle ranch and have secured you the job of bossing it now should you wish to come back and work for us go out and report to mr word at once the next day i kissed mother good-bye gave whisky pete a hug patted chief a large white dog that i had picked up in the indian territory on my way through a few farewell pats on the head mounted gotch a pony i had swapped my star-spangled winchester for and struck out for goliad ninety miles west leaving whisky pete behind was almost as severe on me as having sixteen jaw teeth pulled i left him in horace yeaman's care so that i could come back by rail the coming fall i failed to come back though that fall as i expected therefore never got to see the faithful animal again he died the following spring a three days ride brought me to goliad the place where fannin and his brave followers met their sad faith during the mexican war it was dark when i arrived there after putting up my horse i learned from the old gent mr ward who was a saddler and whom i found at work in his shop that his son charlie was out at beeville gathering a bunch of cattle next morning i struck out for beeville thirty miles west arriving there about four o'clock in the afternoon about sundown i found charles word and his crowd of muddy cowpunchers five miles west of town they were almost up to their ears in mud it having been raining all day trying to finish road branding that lot of steers before dark the corral having no chute the boys had to rope and wrestle with the wild brutes until the hot iron could be applied to their wet and muddy sides when i rode up to the corral charlie came out and i introduced myself he shook my hand with a look of astonishment on his brow as much as to say i'll be blank if beals mustn't be crazy sending this smooth-faced kid here to take charge of a herd for me he finally after talking a while told me that i would have to work under mr stevens until we got ready to put up the beals herd or at least the one i was to accompany he also told me to keep the boys from knowing that i was going to boss the next herd as several of them were fishing for the job and might become stubborn should they know the truth i went on night guard after supper and it continued to rain all night so that i failed to get any sleep but then i didn't mind it as i was well rested the next day after going to work was when i caught fitz though working in a muddy pen all day when night came i didn't feel as much like going on guard as i did the night before a laughable circumstance happened that morning after going into the branding pen as the pen had no chute we had to rope and tie down while applying the brand the men working in pairs one whichever happened to get a good chance to catch the animal by both forefeet as he run by which would bump him that is capsize him the other fellow would then be ready to jump aboard and hold him until securely fastened there being only seven of us to do the roping that morning it of course left one man without a pard and that one was me each one you see is always anxious to get a good roper for a pard as then everything works smoothly mr word told me to sit on the fence and rest until ike word an old negro who used to belong to the word family and who was the best roper in the crowd returned from town where he had been sent with a message it wasn't long till old ike galloped up wearing a broad grin he was very anxious to get in the pen and show dem fellows de art of catching em by both front feet but when his boss told him he would have to take me for a pard his broad grin vanished calling mr word to one side he told him that he didn't want that yankee for a pard as he would have to do all the work etc he was told to try me one round and if i didn't suit he could take some one else shortly afterwards while passing mr word old ike whispered and said dog gone me if dat yankee don't surprise de natives when night came and while i was on herd old ike sat around the camp-fire 
wondering to the other boys where that yankee learned to rope so well you see mr word had told the boys that i was from the panhandle and old ike thought the panhandle was way up in yankeedom somewhere hence he thinking i was a yankee a few days after that though i satisfied old ike that i was a thoroughbred mr word bought a bunch of ponies new arrivals from mexico and among them was a large iron gray which the mexicans had pointed out as being mucho diablo none of the boys not even old ike cared to tackle him so one morning i caught and saddled him he fought like a tiger while being saddled and after getting it securely fastened he threw it off and stamped it into a hundred pieces with his front feet which caused me to have to buy a new one next day i then borrowed mr stevens saddle and after getting securely seated in it raised the blinds and gave him the full benefit of spurs and quirt after pitching about half a mile me saddle and all went up in the air the girths having broken but having the hackamore rope fastened to my belt i held to him until help arrived i then borrowed another saddle and this time stayed with him from that on old ike recognized me as a genuine cowpuncher we finally got that herd of thirty seven hundred steers ready for the trail but the very night after getting them counted and ready to turn over to mr stevens the next morning they stampeded half of them getting away and mixing up with thousands of other cattle mr stevens thought he would try a new scheme that trip up the trail so he bought a lot of new bull's-eye lanterns to be used around the herd on dark stormy nights so that each man could tell just where the other was stationed by the reflection of his light this night in question being very dark and stormy stevens thought he would christen his new lamps he gave me one although i protested against such nonsense about ten o'clock some one suddenly flashed his bull's-eye towards the herd and off they went as though shot out of a gun in running my horse at full speed and trying to get to the lead or in front of them me horse bull's-eye and all went over an old rail fence where there had once been a ranch in a pile i put the entire blame on to the lamp the light of which had blinded my horse so that he didn't see the fence i wasn't long in picking myself up and mounting my horse who was standing close by still trembling from the shock he received i left the lamp where it lay swearing vengeance against the use of them around cattle and dashed off after the flying herd when daylight came i and a fellow of the name of glass found ourselves with about half of the herd at least ten miles from camp the rest of the herd was scattered all over the country badly mixed up with other cattle it took us several days to get the lost ones gathered and the herd in shape again after bidding stevens and the boys who were to accompany him adieu to meet again on red river where he was to wait for us we pulled for goliad to rig up a new outfit horses wagon etc the horses word bought out of a mexican herd which had just arrived from old mexico he gave eighteen dollars a head for the choice out of several hundred head being all ready to start for kimball county two hundred miles northwest where the herd was to be gathered mr word turned the outfit over to me while he went around by stage chapter twenty one a trip which terminated in the capture of billy the kid we went through san antonio and lay there long enough to have all of our horses shod as we were going into a mountainous country where they couldn't stand it without shoes while there i visited the almo building where poor davy crockett and his brave companions bit the dust we arrived at our destination joe taylor's ranch on paint creek a small tributary to the llano at last and it was one of the roughest rockiest god-forsaken countries i ever put foot on we finally after three weeks hard work got the herd of twenty five hundred head started towards the north star we were awful glad to get out of there too for our horses were all nearly petered out and the men on the warpath from having to work twenty-six hours a day at red river we overtook stevens and changed herds with him his being the ones to go to beale's ranch while the others were for the wyoming market 
after parting with stevens again we turned in a northwesterly direction and arrived at the lx ranch on the first day of july moore sent me right out on the plains to hold the herd i came up with until fall that just suited me as i needed a rest after turning the herd loose on the range about the first of september i was put in charge of a branding outfit our work then was drifting over the range branding calves late in the fall when all the branding was done moore put me in charge of a scouting outfit and sent me out on the plains to drift around the same as previous winters i hadn't been there long enough when he sent word for me to turn my outfit over to james mcclockety and come into the ranch and to bring three of my picked men along on arriving at the ranch i found that he wanted me to take an outfit and go to new mexico after a lot of cattle that billy the kid had stolen and run over there the cattlemen along the canadian river had hired a fellow by the name of frank stewart to keep a lookout for stolen cattle in new mexico and along in the summer he came to the panhandle and notified the different cattlemen who had him employed that billy the kid and his gang were making a regular business of stealing panhandle cattle and selling them to an old fellow named pat coughlin who had a large ranch on three rivers close to fort stanton the outfits then made up a crowd between them and sent with stewart giving him orders to go right to the coughlin ranch and take all the cattle found there in their brands but mr stewart failed to go nearer than forty miles from where the cattle were reported to be he claimed that coughlin who had a bloodthirsty crowd around him sent him word that if he got the cattle he would have to take some hot lead with them or something to that effect so stewart came back claiming he didn't have men enough this made moore mad so he concluded to rig up an outfit of his own and send them over after the cattle hence he sending out after me my outfit after getting it rigged up consisted of a chuck wagon with four good mules to pull it a cook and five picked men named as follows james east lee hall lon chambers cal pope and last but not by any means least bigfoot wallace they all except me had one extra good horse apiece i had two moore thought it best not to have many horses to feed as corn would be scarce and high he thought it best to buy more if we needed them on starting moore gave me these orders stay over there until you get those cattle or bust the l x company i will keep you supplied in money just as long as they have got a nickel left that i can get hold of and when you get the cattle if you think you can succeed in capturing billy the kid do so you can hire all the men you need but don't undertake his capture until you have first secured the cattle at tascosa we met stewart who had succeeded in raising a little crowd to join us mr mccarty boss of the l i t ranch had furnished five men a cook and chuck wagon and tory whose ranch was further up the river a wagon and two men while a man by the name of johnson furnished a man and wagon the l i t outfit was in charge of a fellow by the name of bob roberson whose orders were to get the stolen cattle before trying to capture the kid but in the meantime to be governed by stewart's orders this placed bob in bad shape as you will see later stewart after we all got strung out took the buckboard on the mail line and went on ahead to las vegas to put in a week or so with his solid girl on arriving at san lorenzo new mexico i mounted a buckboard and struck out ahead to las vegas to buy a lot of corn grub ammunition etc to be delivered at anton chico twenty-five miles south of vegas by the time the crowd got there so as not to cause any delay bob roberson also gave me money to buy a lot of stuff for his outfit arriving in vegas during a severe snowstorm i found there wasn't fifty bushels of corn in town the snowstorm having delayed the freight trains one merchant had just got a bill of several carloads which he expected to arrive any minute so i concluded i would wait and help stewart hold the town down i wrote a letter to anton chico telling the boys to lay there and take it easy as i might be detained several days waiting for corn 
every morning i would go to the grain merchant and receive this reply am looking for it every minute twill certainly be here by night not being acquainted in town time passed off very slowly so i finally got to bucking at my old favorite game monte i won for a while but finally my luck took a turn and i lost nearly every dollar i had in my possession most of which belonged to my employers the one hundred dollars that bob roberson gave to buy stuff for his outfit also went while standing over the exciting game after my pile had dwindled down to an even seventy dollars i put just half of it thirty-five dollars on the queen or horse as it is called being the picture of a woman on horseback and made a vow if i lost that bet that i would never as long as i lived buck at monte again i lost and my vow has been sacredly kept the corn finally arrived but having no money i had to run my face by giving an order on the lx company payable on demand the other stuff ammunition etc also things bob had sent for i had to buy in the same manner of course i hated to give orders so soon after leaving the ranch with a pocketful of money but then that was the best i could do under existing circumstances after getting the goods started for anton chico stewart and i hired a rig and followed arriving in chico we found barney mason an ex-chum of the kids but now a deputy sheriff under pat garrett there with a message from garrett telling stewart to meet him in vegas at a certain date on important business so stewart struck right back to vegas accompanied by mason as the date fixed was only a few days off i found the boys all well and having a fat time the only thing that bothered me they had run in debt head over heels on the strength of me having lots of money the merchants expected their pay according to contract immediately after my arrival i had to satisfy them with orders on the lx firm the boys had lots of news to relate things that had happened after i left one of bob's men had had a shooting scrape with some mexicans and billy the kid and his crowd had been in town they having come in afoot and went out well mounted he and his five men having hoofed through deep snow from the great house ranch over a hundred miles southwest of there after getting everything in shape we pulled out for white oaks one hundred and fifty miles southwest the second night out we camped at the llewellyn wells where bright and early next morning stewart overtook us accompanied by pat garrett and barney mason they came with a scheme all cut and dried by which they could get the big reward offered for the kid garrett knew the kid and his few remaining followers had been to chico and left for fort sumner a few days before and that they were wore out from having been chased all over the country by a gang of ninety men from white oaks and vicinity now was his time to strike if he could just get stewart to go in cahoots with him that was soon accomplished a promise of half of the reward i suppose done the work hence he sending for stewart to come and see him in vegas on important business after eating breakfast stewart broke the ice by telling a lie he knew our orders were strictly to get the cattle first and then if we could assist in the capture of the kid to do so therefore he branched out thus well boys we have got a job on our hands kid is on his way to old mexico with a bunch of panhandle cattle and we want every man in the outfit except just enough to accompany the wagons to white oaks to go with garrett and i to overtake them how can that be someone asked when kid and his men just left anton chico a few days ago don't know was the quick answer unless some of his outfit had the cattle under herd somewhere down the river waiting for him if you doubt my word about it just ask mr garrett there of course we all did doubt his word and were well satisfied that it was a put-up job to gain the reward bob roberson and i went to one side and talked the matter over while stewart and his little party remained at camp wondering whether their little scheme would have strength to hold out on its weak legs or not bob was in favor after we had talked the thing over of going right back and telling stewart in plain english that he lied but i wouldn't agree to that for fear it might accidentally be true 
i thought it strange that garrett who had the reputation of being a model of a man would sit by with his mouth shut and listen to such a falsehood of course garrett couldn't be blamed very much for he being sheriff was interested in the kid's capture no matter what became of the cattle we had come after bob and i finally concluded for fear the statement might be true to let them have a few men but not enough to completely cripple us so that we couldn't go on after the cattle should we think it best after getting to white oaks i let them take three out of my crowd jim east lon chambers and lee hall while bob gave up two tom emory and louis bozeman stuart wasn't satisfied he wanted more but not being successful in getting his whole want supplied they all rode off down the pecos valley shortly after they left we pulled out on the white oaks road that night it began to snow and kept it up for several days until the whole ground was covered to the depth of from two to three feet so that it was slow work getting our wagons along through it a few days afterwards we came to the great house ranch or at least to the hot ashes where it once stood where the kid and six of his daring followers were surrounded by ninety men one whole night and day it was as follows a squad of men left white oaks to hunt the kid who was lurking in the neighborhood they suddenly came upon him and bill wilson cooking their breakfast one morning on discovering their enemies they both after firing a shot apiece sped through the mountains like deer leaving their horses saddles coats and breakfast behind one of the shots fired at the white oaks party took effect in the brain of a good horse that a young man by the name of johnny hudgens was riding while the other went through a hat on the head of a young man after following the trail through the deep snow a while and after satisfying themselves that the two young outlaws couldn't hide their tracks the party struck back to white oaks after something to eat and more men when they returned that same evening there was ninety men in the crowd they got on the trail and followed it until shortly after dark when it brought them to within a few hundred yards of the great house ranch on the vegas and white oaks road to satisfy themselves that the game was bagged they circled around the ranch to see that no trails were leading out from it they then stationed themselves in a circle around the house and dismounting began to make breastworks out of pine logs the ranch being in the midst of a large pine grove when daylight came great house sent a negro who was stopping with him out after the horses which had been hobbled the night before mr nigg hadn't gone but a few hundred yards when he was captured by the white oak boys after learning from him that the kid and five of his men were in the house they sent him back with a note to the kid telling him if he and his party would come out with their hands up they would be treated as prisoners of war if not they would have to stand the consequences etc in a few minutes the negro returned with a note from the kid stating you fellers go to hell or something to that effect a consultation was then held and finally decided to give the boys one more chance for their lives before storming the house so they sent mr coon back with another note stating that that would be their last chance etc in a short while a new messenger came forward it was jim greathouse proprietor of the ranch he stated that the kid desired to have a talk with their leader on asking him what assurance he could give that their leader wouldn't be harmed he replied myself he told them that they could hold him a prisoner and if anything happened to carlyle he was willing to stand the consequences so mr jim carlyle he being the leader marched forward never more to return to have a talk with the kid arriving in the house where there was also a saloon kept there to accommodate the thirsty traveller he was made to go up to the bar and drink health to billy the kid this of course went against the grain with jim but then what else could he do now being at their mercy finally the kid spied one of the gloves he had left behind in his retreat the day before sticking out of jim's coat pocket this revived the hardship he and billy wilson were compelled to endure nearly all day the day before travelling through snow up to their knees so pulling the glove out of jim's pocket and holding it up at arm's length he asked 
jim was you with that mob yesterday who caused me such a tramp through the snow yes was the answer well then come up and take your last drink on this earth for i'm going to blow your light out jim of course didn't relish the half pint of rock gut that he was forced to drink at the point of a colt's forty five after drinking a full glass himself the kid threw his pistol down in jim's face full cocked telling him at the same time to say his prayers while he slowly counted three the one two three was uttered and then a pistol shot rang out upon the still air re-echoing from the mountain sides in every direction the bullet had struck its mark a tin can hanging on the wall a few inches above jim's head well jim was the first words that broke the death-like silence within you are worth several dead men yet ain't you said kidd grabbing jim's trembling hand and leading him up to the bar over which billy wilson handed the fiery bug juice you didn't think i would be brute enough to shoot you in such a cowardly manner did you jim continued the kid setting his empty glass down on the counter the shot from within had excited the crowd outside almost to fever heat they thinking that it meant their leader's death one fellow during the exciting moment scribbled off a note which read thus if carlyle ain't out here in ten minutes by the watch your friend greathouse will be a corpse and sent it to the kid by the negro who had returned after delivering the last message which brought greathouse out the note was read in the presence of carlyle so that he heard every word it contained kidd then answered it by stating carlyle is safe but we can't give him up just yet now remember if we hear a shot from the outside we will take it for granted that you have carried out your threats by killing greathouse and will have to pay you back by killing our prisoner etc jim knew the substance of the note and trembled in his boots at the thoughts of an accident shot being fired by his party he was satisfied that his men wouldn't do as they threatened in the note after hearing from the negro's own lips that he was still alive it was the accident shot that disturbed his mind the negro hadn't more than got behind the breastworks with the note when a man stationed behind another breastwork who knew nothing of the threat having been made fired a shot at the house just for fun carlyle on hearing the shot made a leap at the only glass window in the house taking sash and all with him but before striking the ground several bullets from the kid's well-aimed forty-five had pierced his body he crawled a few yards and then fell over dead in plain view of his eighty-odd companions kid claimed afterwards that he was sorry for having had to kill jim their intentions were to hold him prisoner until dark when they would tie him down so he couldn't give the alarm and then make their escape from that on the mad crowd outside kept up a continued firing at the log house until dark but doing no damage as the boys had breastworks built of sacks of flour boxes bedding etc jim greathouse during the excitement gave his guards the slip and pulled for tall timber up in the mountains where it was almost impossible for a mounted man to follow i have often afterwards heard greathouse laugh over the matter and tell how he just hit the high places and beat goldsmith maid's fastest time for the first half mile about ten o'clock that night the white oakers began to get tired and hungry so concluded they would go back to town forty miles fill up get a fresh mount and return by daylight without the kid and his men knowing anything of it they stole off very slyly without making any noise and when they got about a mile put their horses down to their best licks about midnight the little party inside made a bold break for liberty they headed northeast with cocked winchesters determined on fighting their way out but they were happily disappointed a ten-mile tramp through snow brought them to the spencer ranch which was kept by a kind old man by the name of spencer who lived there all alone and was trying to establish a shorter route from vegas to the oaks by turning the road by his place where there was a fine spring of water a luxury the great house ranch lacked they having to haul water a distance of several miles from up in the rough mountains just as the day was breaking the crowd returned from the oaks and finding their game had fled they set fire to the house and struck out on the newly made footprints 
arriving at the spencer ranch they learned from the old gentleman that the kid and his party of five had been gone about two hours and that they had eaten breakfast with him after continuing on the trail about an hour longer until it brought them to a rough strip of country where they would be compelled to take it afoot they gave up the chase and turned back to take their spite out on poor old spencer for feeding the kid and his crowd they took the poor old harmless fellow out to a neighboring tree after setting fire to his ranch and put a rope around his neck but before they had time to swing him up a few of the men who had been opposed from the start interfered in the old man's behalf thus his neck was saved and he is to-day a highly respected citizen in that community which has since that time become a rich mining district the kid and his men made it into anton chico where as i stated before they stole a good horse and saddle apiece while the boys were there waiting for me to arrive from vegas and pulled down the rio pecos end of chapters nineteen twenty and twenty one chapters twenty two twenty three and twenty four of a texas cowboy by charles a seringo this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two billy the kid's capture we arrived in the beautifully located town of white oaks on the twenty-third day of december eighteen eighty the town which consisted of a thousand inhabitants mostly american miners was then not quite two years old and pretty lively for its age it contained eight saloons and saturday nights when the boys would come in from the surrounding mountains to spend the sabbath is when the little burg would put on city airs we rented a large log house in the lower end of town and went to living like white folks we had no money but we struck two of the merchants who gave us an unlimited credit until we could make a raise our greatest expense was feeding the horses corn which cost five cents a pound and hay two cents a pound the grub we ate wasn't very expensive as we stole all of our meat and shared with our honest neighbors who thought it a great sin to kill other people's cattle you see bob and i still clung to the old texas style which is never kill one of your own beeves when you can get somebody else's we had concluded not to go after the stolen cattle until the rest of the boys got there by which time the deep snow would be melted maybe so that we could scour the white mountains where the cattle were reported to be out thoroughly new year's night we had a bushel of fun making the citizens think that billy the kid had taken the town billy was in the habit of shooting the town up a lot every now and then hence every time a few dozen shots were fired at an unusually late hour they putting it down as being one of his devilment we first sent one of our crowd up town to the billiard hall where most of the men generally congregated and especially pinto tom the marshal whose manoeuvres we were anxious to learn to watch and see what kind of an effect our shooting had on the people at precisely twelve o'clock we got out with winchesters and six-shooters cooks and all and turned ourselves loose about one hundred shots were fired in quick succession we then went up town to note the effect arriving at the billiard hall we found old uncle jimmy our man standing in the door laughing fit to kill himself the hall was empty with the exception of a few who were still hid under tables chairs etc most of them had gone out of the back door there being a rough canyon within a few yards of it leading to the mountains right at the marshal's heels it was said that pinto tom didn't get in from the mountains for two days and when he did come he swore he had been off prospecting shortly after new year's some of our men arrived bringing the news of the kid's capture while the rest jim east and tom emory had accompanied garrett and stewart to vegas with the prisoners stewart sent a letter by one of the boys stating that he east and emory would be in the oaks just as quickly as they could get there after turning the prisoners over to the authorities in vegas so knowing that we were destined to remain around the oaks a week or two at least we pulled out in the mountains and camped so as to save expenses by letting our horses eat grass instead of hay 
that night after the boys arrived and after we had moved camp out in the timber while seated around a blazing pinion fire lon chambers who was a splendid single-handed talker began relating how they captured the kid etc which ran about this way as near as i can remember after leaving you fellers we caught blank it began snowing that night and kept it up for two or three days and nights arriving at fort sumner garrett got word that the kid and outfit would be in town that night from los potales where the kid's ranch or cave was situated so he secured a house near the road leading to potales to secret his men in he then kept a man outdoors on guard watching the road about ten o'clock that night while we were all inside playing a five-cent game of poker the guard opened the door and said garrett here comes a crowd down the road we all dashed out winchesters in hand and hid behind an adobe fence close by which they would be compelled to pass the moon was shining and we could tell who it was or at least garrett and mason could they being well acquainted with them there were six in the approaching crowd and thirteen of us when they rode up within speaking distance garrett yelled throw up your hands his voice had hardly died out when thirteen shots from our nervously gripped winchesters were fired into their midst when the smoke cleared off we found that they had all vanished with the exception of tom ophiliard who was mortally wounded and died shortly after he had several bullet holes through his body these pointing down to his feet are his overshoes and this pulling off a finely finished mexican sombrero and displaying it is the hat i pulled from his head before he had quit kicking the next morning we struck out on the trail which led back towards los potales the white snow along the road was red with blood having flowed from the wounds in rudabaugh's horse the poor animal died though after carrying his heavy master through twelve miles of deep snow about midnight we hove in sight of a little rock house standing on the banks of a small arroyo the trail led right up to the door which faced the south right near the door stood four shivering horses knowing we had the little band trapped we took things cool until daylight when we stationed ourselves around the house there being no opening in the building except the door garrett and lee hall crawled up to the end wall so they could watch the door from around the corner while the rest of us concealed ourselves behind knolls etc we had left our horses behind a hill quite a distance from the house when it became light enough to see charlie bowdry stepped outdoors to see about his horse but he hadn't more than hit the ground when two bullets fired by garrett and hall who were still at the corner not a dozen feet from the door sent him to his long home he only uttered a few words which were i wish i wish before his last breath left him of course that caused a stirring around inside they knew what it meant and began making preparations for an escape the kid had his pony inside out of the cold and the other four rudabaugh having secured another one were tied to the door frame so that they could reach the ropes without exposing their bodies now thought they if we can pull three of the horses inside we will mount and make a bold dash out of the door but when they got the first animal about halfway into the house garrett sent a bullet through its heart the dead animal of course blocked the way so they had to give up that scheme they then tried picking portholes through the thick rock walls but had to give it up also as they had nothing to do it with but their knives and firearms the kid and garrett finally opened up a conversation the former seemed to be in fine humour every now and then he would crack some kind of a joke and then laugh so that every one of us could hear him at one time he asked in a jovial way garrett have you got a fire out there oh yes a good one was the answer can we come out and warm if we behave ourselves yes replied garrett but come with your hands up oh you go to hell won't you you old long-legged son of a you see they were without fire water or provisions consequently we had the advantage we had a good fire out behind one of the knolls and would take turns about during the day and coming night going to warm they had held out until next day when they surrendered after being promised protection from mob violence 
kidd was the last man to come out with his hands up he said he would have starved to death before surrendering if the rest had stayed with him chambers after finishing gave a heavy sigh and wondered whether garrett and stewart would act white and whack up the reward evenly among the whole outfit or not bob and i made arrangements with the boys to loan us their part of the reward which would amount to considerable over a hundred dollars apiece until we got back to the ranch to pay our debts with chapter twenty three a trip to the rio grande on a mule about the time we were getting out of patience waiting the two boys east and emory arrived with the good news that stuart would be along in a few days he having to remain over to get their part of the reward etc stuart arrived finally he came in a buggy with a gentleman from vegas his orders to roberson and tory's men were boys you fellows pull right back to the ranch as i have got some important business to look after in vegas we can get back after those cattle in the spring etc the boys who had helped capture the kid and outfit rounded him up for their part of the reward but he said it was already spent oh no they wasn't mad some of them swore that he would be a corpse before morning but luckily for him he pulled for vegas that night i am not certain whether he was aware of his danger or not but there is one thing i am certain of and that is it wouldn't have been healthy for him to remain in that locality very long bob had even consented to the crowd hanging him i was the only one who protested for the simple reason that i do not believe in mob law of course i thought it very wrong in swindling the boys out of equal share of the reward after they had shared equally in the danger and hardships bob was in a bad fix in debt no money and ordered home by one whose orders his boss had told him to obey the question was how to stand his creditors off and get grub corn etc enough to last him home i finally came to his rescue as i intended remaining i went to the merchants and told them his fix and guaranteed that he would send the money he owed as soon as he got home or else i would let them take it out of my four mules and wagon which were worth a thousand dollars at least they let him off also let him have grub corn etc enough to last him home which would take fifteen days to make the trip as some of my boys became homesick on seeing roberson's outfit getting ready to pull back and as i was anxious to cut down expenses knowing that i would have to lay there the rest of the winter waiting for money to pay up my bills before the merchants would let me move my wagon i let three of them go along with bob those three were james east cal pope and lee hall bob let tom emory one of his men who was stuck on the light mountain air of new mexico remain with me this left me there with a cook and three warriors emory chambers and bigfoot wallace as soon as bob had pulled out i moved into town and rented a house so that we could put on style while waiting for the money i had written to the ranch for the mails were so irregular on account of the deep snow which lay on the ground up there in the mountains nearly all winter that i didn't get a letter from moore for three weeks in the letter were drafts for three hundred dollars and moore stated that i had done just right by not taking stuart's advice and coming home he also reminded me that i mustn't come back until i got the cattle if it took two years and also that i must scour out the sand hills on the plains around los potales kid's den on my return i distributed the three hundred dollars among my creditors and then wrote back to the ranch for some more as that was already gone etc we found the citizens of white oaks to be sociable and kind and everything went on lovely with the exception of a shooting scrape between a schoolteacher and bigfoot about the last of february i received another three hundred dollars and i then struck out accompanied by tom emory to hunt the noted pat coughlin and find out if he would let us have the cattle without bloodshed or not as he had a slaughter-house in fort stanton i struck out for there first we left the oaks one morning early emory mounted on his pet gray and i on one of the fat work mules and arrived in stanton about sundown we rode up to coughlin's slaughter pen the first thing and found a man by the name of pepin in charge on examining the hides which hung on the fence we found five bearing the lx brand 
i laid them to one side and next morning brought two men crawford and harley down from the post to witness the brands i then told mr peppin or old pap as he was called not to butcher any more of those cattle sold by billy the kid he promised he wouldn't unless he got new orders from coughlin from there we pulled for tularosa where coughlin lived the first night out we stopped at the mescalero apache indian agency which is known as south fork there i learned from the storekeeper of a bunch of eight hundred cattle having passed there in a terrible hurry about three weeks before going west he said that they were undoubtedly stolen cattle for they drove night and day through the deep snow i came to the conclusion that maybe it was tom cooper one of kidd's right-hand bowers with a stolen herd of panhandle cattle so made up my mind to keep on his trail we rode into tularosa the next evening about sundown a young man from the panhandle by the name of sam coleman who was on his way to wilcox arizona was with us we found the town to be a genuine mexican plaza of about one thousand souls we put up for the night at coughlin's store and learned from the clerk morris that the king of tularosa as coughlin was called was down on the rio grande on trail of a bunch of cattle stolen from him by tom cooper i put that down as a very thin yarn having reasons to believe that he and cooper stood in with one another i made up my mind that it was our cattle he was trying to get away with after hearing of us being in the oaks the clerk had told the truth though for he was after cooper the way it happened coughlin had only paid cooper and the kid half down on the last bunch of panhandle cattle he bought from them and cooper hearing of kid's capture and of us being in the oaks on our way after the cattle came on to coughlin for the rest of the money so he could leave the country on being refused he got his crowd together and stole three hundred head of the latter's best cattle and pulled for arizona with them after supper emory and coleman went to bed while i struck out to a mexican dance at the outskirts of town to keep my ears open for news connected with panhandle cattle etc there being plenty of wine or mescal on the ground the greasers began feeling pretty good about midnight of course i had to join in their sports so as to keep on the good side of them there was only one american in the crowd besides myself i became pretty intimate with one old fellow of whom i made scores of inquiries in regard to mr coughlin and the herd the one i heard about at south fork that had passed there a few weeks before he knew nothing of the herd no further than having seen it but he pointed out a long-haired greaser who was three sheets in the wind and swinging his pistol around on his forefinger who could tell me all about it as he had piloted it through san augustine pass i learned that the herd was owned by charlie slaughter and that their destination was the healy river near tombstone arizona marking out a lot of brands which i had never heard of on a piece of paper i asked the long-haired fellow if he noticed any of them on the cattle he did not so i then marked off a lot of panhandle brands he picked out several the l x among them this time that he remembered of seeing in the herd this satisfied me that the herd would bear inspection the next morning i told emory what the old mexican had said and that my intentions were to kill two birds with one stone find coughlin and then follow the herd this didn't impress emory very favorably he advised me to return and get the wagon and outfit i couldn't see the point for we would lose at least a week by the operation he took the back track while i continued single-handed accompanied by sam coleman whose route was the same as mine until arriving on the rio grande where he would change his course to southward chapter twenty four waylaid by unknown parties after leaving tularosa our route lay across a young desert called the white sands a distance of sixty miles that night sam and i camped at a lonely spot called whitewater where there wasn't a stick of wood in sight we had to make a fire out of a bush called the oil weed to keep warm by the next night we put up with an old man by the name of shedd who kept a ranch on the east side of oscuro mountains near san augustine pass on arriving in the pass next morning on our way to las cruces 
we could see the whole rio grande valley dotted with green fields for at least a hundred miles up and down and by looking over our shoulder in the direction we had come we could see the white-looking plain or desert which extends for two hundred miles north and south it was indeed a beautiful sight to one who had just come from a snowy country and we were loath to leave the spot arriving at las cruces city of the crosses on the rio grande twenty-five miles from sheds where we had left that morning i went to making inquiries about mr pat coughlin's whereabouts i found out by the postmaster cunnafy who was an intimate friend of his that he was in el paso texas fifty miles below and would be up to cruces the next day that night sam and i proceeded to take in the town which was booming on account of the a t and s f r r being only forty miles above and on its way down the river to el paso the next morning sam bid me adieu and struck out on his journey for wilcox arizona about two hundred miles distant that evening mr coughlin whom i found to be a large portly looking half-breed irishman drove up to mr cunnafy's store in a buggy drawn by a fine pair of black horses i introduced myself as having been sent from the panhandle after the cattle he had purchased from the kid he at first said i couldn't have them but finally changed his tone when i told him that i had a crowd at white oaks and that my instructions were to take them by force if i couldn't secure them in any other way he then began giving me taffy as i learned afterwards he promised faithfully that as he didn't like to have his whole herd which was scattered through the whole white mountain district disturbed at that season of the year if i would wait until the first of april at which time the new grass would be up he would help me round up every hoof of panhandle cattle on his range i agreed to do so providing he would promise not to have any more of them butchered at stanton the old fellow was worried considerably about the three hundred head of cattle cooper had stolen from him he told me about having followed him with a crowd of mexicans into the black range near the arizona line where he succeeded in getting back a few of the broken down ones there being a fellow by the name of hurricane bill of fort griffin texas notoriety in town direct from tombstone arizona i concluded to lay over a few days and play in with him and his gang of four or five in hopes of learning something about slaughter and his herd the one i was on trail of i went under an assumed name and told them that i was on the dodge for a crime committed in southern texas i found out all about their future plans from one of the gang by the name of johnson who seemed to be more talkative than the rest he said they were waiting for the railroad to get to el paso and then they were going into the butchering business on a large scale he wanted me to join them and said the danger wouldn't be very great as they intended stealing the cattle mostly from ignorant mexicans one morning while johnson and i were eating breakfast at a restaurant a man sat down at the same table and recognizing me said hello calling me by name where did you come from he then continued although i winked at him several times to keep still so you fellows succeeded in capturing billy the kid did you etc johnson gave a savage glance at me as much as to say damn you you have been trying to work us have you i kept my hand near old colt's forty five for i expected from his nervous actions for him to make a break of some kind he finally got up and walked out without saying a word this man who had so suddenly bursted our friendship was a friend of frank stewart's and had met me in las vegas with his chum stewart i concluded it wouldn't be healthy for me to remain there till after dark nor to undertake the trip to tombstone for i had manifested such an interest in the slaughter herd etc that they might follow me up on hearing that i had left town so i wrote a letter to mr moore telling him of the whole circumstances and asking him if i had better take my men and follow the herd to the jumping off place or not i then struck back to white oaks over the same route i had come that night i stopped at shedd's ranch and so did coughlin he being on his way back to tularosa the next day i rode the entire sixty miles across the white sands and landed in tularosa about a half hour behind coughlin and his fast steppers i was tired though and swore off ever riding another mule on a long trip 
i had figured on being in mountains all the time where i would have lots of climbing to do is why i had rode the mule instead of a horse the next morning i made up my mind that i would take a new route to the oaks by going around the mountains through mr coughlin's range which was on three rivers twenty odd miles north so before starting i inquired of coughlin's clerk as to the best route etc i stopped at the coughlin ranch that night and was treated like a whitehead by mr nesbeth and wife who took care of the ranch that is done the cooking gardening milking etc the herders or cowboys were all mexicans with the exception of bill gentry the boss who was away at the time while getting ready to start for white oaks next morning one of the eight or ten mexicans who were sitting on the fence sunning themselves came to me and told me of a near cut to the oaks by taking an old indian trail over the white mountains and advised me to take that route as i could save at least twenty miles it being forty around by the road mr nesbeth spoke up and said it would be better for me to travel on the road even if it was further as i might experience some difficulty in finding the old indian trail etc the greaser then offered me his service saying that he would go and put me on the trail so that it would be impossible for me to miss my way agreed so he mounted a pony and we rode east up a rough canyon a ride of about five miles brought us to the almost obliterated trail it led up an awful brushy and rocky canyon towards the snowy crags of the white mountain range about an hour after bidding the greaser adieu i came to where the trail made a short curve to the left but i could tell from the lay of the ground that by keeping straight ahead i would strike it again so i left it and luckily for me that i did for there was some one laying for me not far from there i hadn't gone but a rod or two when bang 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 went three shots in quick succession not over fifty yards to the left and at the same time my mule gave a lunge forward on the ice-covered stones and fell broadside throwing me over a precipice about eight feet to the bottom my winchester and pistol both were hanging to the saddle-horn but i managed to grab and pull the latter out of the scabbard as i went off and took it with me the first thing i done on striking bottom was to hunt a hole i found a nice little nook between two boulders and lay there with cocked pistol expecting every second to see three indians or greasers peep over the edge on the hunt for a dead gringo as the mexicans call an american after waiting a few minutes i became impatient and crawled on top of a small knoll and on looking in the direction the shooting had come from i got a faint glimpse of what i took to be two half-stooped human forms retreating through the pinion brush at a lively gait suffice it to say i found my mule standing in a grove of trees with his front feet fastened in the bridle reins about two hundred yards from where he fell and between his forelegs on the ground was a small pool of sparkling red blood which had dripped from a slight bullet wound in his breast on examination i found that one bullet had cut a groove in the hind tree of my saddle and another had ploughed through a pair of blankets tied behind the saddle i arrived in the oaks on my almost broken-down mule about dark that night after an absence of nearly two weeks End of chapters 22, 23, and 24chapters twenty five twenty six and twenty seven of a texas cowboy by charles a seringo this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five lost on the staked plains about a week after my return to white oaks i received a letter from mr moore stating that i need not go to arizona to look after the slaughter herd as he had hired a united states deputy marshal by the name of john w poe now sheriff of lincoln county new mexico to go around by rail and tend to the matter but when poe arrived there the herd had been sold and driven to old mexico so that we never knew whether there were any panhandle cattle in it or not except what i learned from the mexican which appeared to me very good evidence that there were on the tenth day of march while making it easy waiting for the first of april to arrive so that we could round up the coughlin range according to agreement 
i received a confidential letter from mr george nesbeth of the coughlin ranch giving me a broad hint that mr coughlin was getting rid of our cattle as fast as possible before the first of april should arrive the letter arrived in the evening and next morning i took bigfoot along and struck out for stanton after giving chambers and emory orders to load up the wagon with grub and corn and follow bigfoot and i arrived in the post about three o'clock in the afternoon and went through the coughlin slaughter pens finding several freshly butchered l x hides which went to show that i had been duped and that the hint from nesbeth was true we then rode down the bonetta river nine miles to lincoln to go through the hides there and to look for a herd we expected the old fellow had hidden out somewhere along the river we stopped in stanton that night and next morning struck out on the white oaks road to meet the wagon and turn it towards three rivers we met the outfit at the mouth of nogal canyon and camped for dinner it was sixty miles around by the road to coughlin's ranch the route the wagon would have to go and about twenty-five or thirty on a straight line over the white mountains after dinner bigfoot and i struck out over the mountains while emory and chambers went around by the road to pilot the cook etc about twelve o'clock that night after a very hard ride over one of the roughest strips of snow-covered countries a man ever saw we arrived at the coughlin ranch we found the corral full of cattle but being very dark couldn't tell whose they were mr and mrs nesbeth got up out of bed and gave us a cold supper and he also gave us a few pointers in regard to his employer's doings etc he informed me that bill gentry the boss had just began that day gathering the remaining panhandle cattle that might still be left on the range to take to the stanton slaughter pens hence those cattle in the corral after breakfast gentry and his seven greasers turned the herd out of the corral with the intention of keeping right on with his work there was only five head of lx's all large steers in the bunch and i told gentry that i would have to take charge of those and also gather up the rest that were on his range he couldn't agree to that he said for his orders from coughlin were not to give up any of the panhandle cattle etc i told him that i didn't care what his orders were as i was bound to have the cattle just about the time we were arguing the case the rest of my outfit hove in sight they had been travelling all night after camping the wagon we all went out to the herd which the mexicans were guarding and proceeded to cutting our five head out gentry tried to get me to wait until he could send for coughlin he having already dispatched a mexican to tularosa after him but i wouldn't reason the matter at all as i was mad about the way i had been served we went right to work after cutting out the five head rounding up the whole range in search of more but after three days hard work we only succeeded in finding three head more but we left there with nine head the ninth one being one of coughlin's own steers which we butchered in the oaks on our arrival back there for the benefit of our many friends whom had been depending on us all winter for their fresh beef thus i had the satisfaction of getting even with the old fellow to the extent of one steer and a fat hog which we had butchered and stowed away in the wagon the night before leaving the mexican that gentry sent to tularosa with a dispatch had to go on down to las cruces on the rio grande coughlin having started down there the day before hence we not having the old fellow to contend with after looking over the carrezzo range which was owned by catherine and waltz and several small mexican ranges we pulled into white oaks with lots of experience but very few cattle on arriving in the oaks i wrote to mr moore telling him all about the way in which coughlin had taken advantage of me etc also advised him to have the old fellow prosecuted as i had sufficient evidence to send him to the pen etc mr moore on getting my letter sent john poe the united states deputy marshal that he had sent to tombstone arizona over to have coughlin arrested and put through the mill on leaving the oaks for good i bought a wagon load of corn chuck etc for which i gave orders on the lx company not having any money left 
the merchants had by this time become acquainted with me so that my name to an order was just the same as cash to them from the oaks i pulled due east around the capitan mountains to roswell on the pecos river i overhauled scores of little mexican ranches scattered through the mountains on my route but failed to find any of our stock at roswell though we found two large steers which swelled our little herd to ten head from roswell we went to john chisholm's ranch on the head of south spring river and got there just in time as he was rigging up his outfit for spring work they were going to start down the rio pecos to the texas line next day to begin work and i concluded we had better work with them in search of panhandle cattle which might have drifted across the plains i took my outfit back to roswell five miles where i made arrangements with captain j c lee who kept a store to board one of my men whom i wanted to leave there to take care of the ten head of steers until my return not caring to drive them two hundred miles down the river and then back again not having grub enough to last on the trip i bought a supply from the accommodating captain lee who took my note for pay he also sold me two horses on the same terms we were absent two weeks on this trip but failed to find any of our cattle we came back with the satisfaction though of knowing that there wasn't any in that part of the world on our arrival back to roswell we learned of the kid's escape from lincoln after having killed his two guards that night lon chambers wore a different hat he had swapped his star-spangled mexican sombrero off to one of chisholm's men this hat had been presented to tom o'falliard by the kid hence chambers not wanting it in his possession for fear he might run across the kid chambers of course denied the above saying that he never thought of such a thing but traded it off just because it being so heavy made his head ache but that was too thin we thought under the circumstances any of us would have done the same though no doubt knowing that the kid had sworn vengeance against all of o'falliard's murderers as he termed them we found emory and the ten steers doing finely tom hated to see us back for he was having such a soft time all he had to do was turn the steers out of the corral mornings and then round up and pin them up at night again after drawing on the whole-souled captain lee again for more grub etc we pulled up the rio pecos looking through all the cattle on our route to fort sumner a distance of one hundred miles we laid over in sumner two days and went to a mexican fandango both nights at the maxwell mansion in which the kid was killed shortly afterwards the kid was in the building while the dance was going on but we didn't know it at the time the way i found it out i had escorted a young woman after the dance one night to her room which was in the same building as the dance and she bid me good night without asking me in i thought it strange but never said anything that fall when i came back there she explained matters by saying that the kid was in her room at the time reading i had noticed that she stood outside of the door until i had turned the corner out of sight she also explained that the kid had the door locked and she had to give a private rap to get him to open it from fort sumner we pulled due east on the los potales road on our way to scour out the sand hills according to moore's instruction in one of his letters to me at white oaks before leaving the post the last settlement or store that we would come to before reaching the canadian river i sold one of the horses bought from captain lee for thirty-five dollars and laid in a small supply of grub with the money not being acquainted there my credit wasn't good hence having to sell the horse two days out from fort sumner we came to the little rock house at stinking springs where the kid and his companions held out so long without fire food or water chambers and emory of course had to explain and point out every place of interest to bigfoot wallace the mexican cook frank or francisco and myself the second day after leaving stinking springs we came to the kid's noted castle at los potales on the western edge of the great llano estacado 
los potales is a large alkali lake the water of which is unfit for man or beast but on the north side of the lake is two nice cool springs which gurgle forth from a bed of rock near the foot of kidd's castle a small cave in the cliff in front of the cave is a stone corral about fifty feet square and above the cave on the level plain is several hitching posts outside of those things mentioned there is nothing but a level prairie just as far as the eye can reach we found about one hundred head of cattle mostly from the canadian river but a few from as far north as denver colorado at potales which improved the appearance of our little herd considerably from there we went to the coyote lake about twelve miles further east where we found about fifty head more cattle a mixed lot like the first they were almost as wild as deer we then pulled into the sand hills which extend over a scope of country from ten to fifty miles wide and two hundred long that is two hundred miles north and south after about ten days hard work we came out on to the plains again our herd having increased to about twenty five hundred head we were undoubtedly a worn-out crowd horses and all to do that amount of work we should have had at least five more men and three or four more horses apiece we only had one horse apiece besides one extra and the four work mules which we had to press into double duty by using them to guard the cattle at night the next day about noon after getting out of the sand hills we came to a buffalo hunter's camp on the head of yellow house canyon a tributary to the brazos river there was one man in camp the other one being away on a hunt our cattle being nearly dead for water there being none there with the exception of a small spring just large enough to allow one animal to drink at a time i asked the hunter to give me directions to the nearest water from there on our route pointing to a cluster of sand hills about fifteen miles to the east he said you will find running water the head of canyon blanco just eight miles east of those sand hills as we learned after it was too late he should have said eight miles north of the sand hills instead of east we were all acquainted with the country from running water north but had never been south of it hence us having to depend on the locoed buffalo hunters directions we camped for the night within a few miles of the sand hills the cattle were restless all night on account of being thirsty which caused us all to lose sleep and rest the next morning after eating a hasty breakfast we let the moaning herd string out towards the big red sun which was just making its appearance giving the boys orders to keep headed east and telling the cook to follow behind the herd with his wagon i struck out ahead on my tired and weak pony croppy to find the water which was so near and yet so far i rode about fifteen miles and still no water i then dismounted to wait for the herd to come in sight but changed my notion and galloped on five miles further thinking maybe the hunter might have meant eighteen miles instead of eight the five miles was reached and still nothing but a dry level plain with no indications of water ahead as far as i could see thinking maybe i had bore too far to the south i then rode five or six miles to the north but with the same result i then after letting croppy blow a while started back towards the herd at a slow gait finally a cloud of dust appeared and shortly after the herd hove in sight the poor cattle were coming in a trot their tongues hanging out a foot the way the boys cursed and abused that poor old hunter at a distance was a sin after i had told them of our luck chambers wanted to go right back and eat the poor locoed human up alive without salt or pepper but i pacified him by saying that maybe he had made a mistake of a few miles meant eighty instead of eight at any rate we continued right on east about noon our ten-gallon keg ran dry and then we began to feel ticklish scared or whatever you might wish to call it but about three o'clock we spied a bunch of mustangs off to the right about five miles and on galloping over to where they had been before seeing me i found a small pool of muddy rainwater which they had been wallowing in after letting croppy fill up 
and eating a drink of the muddy stuff myself i struck back to let the other boys come on and fill up also sent the cook to fill the keg and to water his mules i kept the herd they being anxious to travel in search of water pointed east by myself while the rest of the boys were absent we travelled till midnight and then pitched camp to get something to eat after getting supper cooked it was almost an impossibility to find time to eat it as the herd kept milling and trotting around like so many crazy animals we remained there all night and next morning used the last drop of water to make coffee we found the keg after draining it to be about half full of solid mud i concluded that we had gone far enough east so that morning changed our course to north about eleven o'clock while the hot june sun was coming down with vengeance we struck a large lake about a mile wide if ever a crowd was happy it was us the poor cattle drank till some of them fell down and was unable to move we laid there resting up until the next day after dinner our grub had given out by this time therefore we had nothing to eat but coffee and beef straight when we left the lake our course was due north about noon the next day we came to the head of canyon blanco twelve miles below running water consequently we turned west and travelled twelve miles up the dry canyon before pitching camp from there we turned due north again and travelled two days before striking any more water on arriving at terra blanco fifty miles south of the canadian river we struck mr summerfield and his outfit from whom we borrowed grub enough to last us home there were also two l x boys in the summerfield camp and they having five good horses apiece divided with us our ponies were just about completely petered out we landed at the l x ranch on the twenty second day of june with the herd of twenty five hundred head of cattle after having been absent just seven months to a day chapter twenty six a trip down the rio pecos on my return i found that the l x ranch had changed bosses moore had quit and bought a ranch of his own while john hollicott one of the old hands had been put in his place hence in the future i had to be governed by mr hollicott's orders that is while working around the ranch one of the firm erskine clement had charge of outside matters now since moore had left i put in the summer running a branding outfit loafing around tascosa working up a cattle stealing case etc until the middle of october when clement received a letter from john poe who was prosecuting coughlin stating for chambers and i to come over to lincoln as witnesses in the coughlin case the time set for us to be there was on the seventh day of november therefore we had no time to lose it being five hundred miles over there by the shortest route hollicott and clement talked the matter over and concluded that i had better not come back until the next spring just put in the winter drifting over the country wherever you can do the most good was my orders chambers and i struck out from tascosa on the twenty second of october he had only one horse while i had two of the best animals on the ranch croppie and buckshot we travelled up the river to liberty new mexico and from there cut across the staked plains to fort sumner on the rio pecos the distance from sumner to the oaks was about one hundred miles on a bee-line across the country while it was one hundred and fifty around by the road we chose the former route although we were told that there wasn't any water until reaching the capitan mountains within thirty miles of the oaks we both wished though that we had followed the road for our progress being very slow on account of the loose dirt which would give way under a horse allowing him to sink almost to his knees we came very near perishing from thirst and so did our poor horses we landed in white oaks about noon of the fourth day out from fort sumner and had been on the road twelve days from tascosa we were welcomed back to the oaks by all of our old acquaintances especially those whom we had furnished with stolen beef all winter 
as we had five days to loaf in before court set in we went to work prospecting for gold everybody in the town being at fever heat over recent rich strikes the first day was spent in climbing to the top of baxter mountain where most of the rich mines were located and back the only thing we found of interest was a lot of genuine oyster shells embedded in a large rock on the extreme top of the mountain of course this brought up a discussion as to how they came there chambers contended that they grew there during the flood and i argued that they were there before god made the earth we both finally got mad each one over the other's weak argument and began to slide down hill towards town which looked something like a checkerboard from where we were the next day we tied the pick and shovel behind our saddles and struck out on horseback to prospect in the valleys at last we struck it a fine gold-bearing lead it cropped out of the ground about a foot i told chambers to go to work and dig the prospect hole while i wrote out the location notices finally an old miner by the name of stone came to us i was sitting under the shade of a pinion tree writing while chambers was sweating like a nigger at election what are you fellows trying to do spoke up mr stone after grinning a few moments we told him he then said why neither one of you fellows has got as much sense as last year's bird's nest that's nothing but a very common ledge of rock we took him at his word and went back to town that night mr stone gave us one of his mines if we would sink a twenty-foot shaft on it we done so that is chambers did while i carried water and rode into town every day at noon to bring him out his dinner finally our time was out and we had to pull for lincoln a distance of thirty-five miles poe had written to me to come in after night and on the sly as he wanted to make coughlin believe that we wouldn't be there to appear against him so he would let his trial come off instead of taking a change of venue i left croppy in a feed stable to be taken care of until my return arriving in lincoln poe sent us down the rio bonetta twelve miles to stop with a mr klein with whom he had made arrangements until sent for mr klein was a dutchman who had married a mexican wife and had a house full of little half-breeds around him time passed off very slowly to chambers and i although our host tried to amuse us by telling his hair-breadth escape from wild indians and grizzly bears we were indeed glad when mr poe rode up after we had been at the klein ranch twelve days and told us that we were free coughlin had smelled a mice and taken a change of venue to mesilla in dona ana county before leaving lincoln i had to sign a five hundred dollar bond for my appearance in mesilla as a witness against coughlin on the first monday in april eighteen eighty two which was the following spring mr chambers being sworn and not knowing anything of importance was allowed to return home we both received ninety dollars apiece for mileage and witness fees returning to white oaks chambers remained there a week making love to his mexican widow and then struck for the l x ranch by way of anton chico and down the canadian river the route he and i had come was too far between ranches for him travelling alone i remained in the oaks about a week after my pard had left waiting for some more money which i had written for from the oaks i went to roswell on the rio pecos a distance of one hundred and twenty-five miles by the route i took there i struck company a jovial old soul by the name of ash upson who was just starting to the texas pacific railroad two hundred miles down the river to meet pat garrett who had written to come there after him in a buggy ash was making his home at garrett's ranch a few miles from roswell we laid over christmas day at the mouth of seven rivers and helped kind mrs jones one of mr upson's old-time friends get away with a nice turkey dinner while sitting around our campfire at nights old ash would amuse us by relating circumstances connected with the bloody lincoln county war also gave me a full sketch of billy the kid's life a subject which i am going to devote the next chapter to as i imagine it will be interesting reading to some we arrived at paco station on the t p r r one afternoon about three o'clock 
and it being a terribly lonesome place we after leaving our horses and things in care of an old wolf hunter who promised to see that the horses were well fed boarded the westbound passenger train for toya a distance of twenty-two miles we put up at the alvarado house in toya it was kept by a man named newell who had a pretty little fifteen-year-old daughter whose sparkling eyes were too much for me to use a western phrase she broke me all up on the first round after supper ash went out to take in the town while i remained in the office exchanging glances with miss beulah it was new year's eve and mr and mrs newell were making preparations for a ball to be given new year's night toya was then one of those terrible wicked infant towns it being only a few months old and contained over a dozen saloons and gambling halls about midnight ash got through taking in the town and came back to the hotel he was three sheets in the wind but swore he hadn't drank anything but tom and jerry the next morning the town was full of railroaders they having come in to spend new years a grand shooting match for turkeys was advertised to come off at ten o'clock and everybody railroaders and all were cleaning up their pistols when ash and i got up we having slept till about nine o'clock miss beulah made a remark in my presence that she wished someone would win a fat turkey and give it to her now was my time to make a mash so i assured her that i would bring in a dozen or two and lay them at her feet when the shooting commenced i was on hand and secured the ticket which was marked number eleven the tickets were sold at twenty-five cents apiece and if you killed the bird you were entitled to a free shot until you missed mr miller the justice was running the business for what money there was in it he had sent to dallas six hundred miles east after the turkeys which had cost him three dollars apiece hence he had to regulate the distance and everything so that there would be considerable missing done everything being ready he placed the turkey on an iron box with nothing but its head visible and then set the box thirty-five yards from the line the shooting had to be done with pistols off-hand ten shots were fired and still mr turkey was casting shy glances towards the large crowd of several hundred men mr miller wore a pleasant smile when he shouted number eleven i stepped forward trembling like an aspen leaf for fear i would miss and thereby fail to win miss beulah's admiration i was afraid should the bullet miss its mark that the few dozen birds would be all killed before my time would come around again there being so many men waiting for a shot at last i cut loose and off went the turkey's head also mr miller's happy smile you see he lacked two bits of getting cost for the bird another one was put up and off went his head this was too much for mr miller two birds already gone and only two dollars and six bits in the pot he finally after humming and hawing a while said gentlemen i don't like to weaken this early in the game but you all know i've got a large family to support and consequently i will have to rule this young man out of the ring he's too slick with a pistol to have around a game of this kind anyway i hated to quit of course but it was best for i might have missed the very next time and as it was beulah would think that i would have carried out my promise if i had been allowed to keep on after that during my stay on the t p r r i was called the turkey shooter often while riding near the railroad track maybe four or five hundred miles from toya some one would hail me from a passing train by that name and whenever i would ride into a town there was sure to be some fellow on hand to point me out they all knew me so well by my horse croppy he being milk-white and both ears being off close up to his head he was indeed a notable animal as well as a long keen good one that night nearly everybody got drunk old ash excepting of course as he was already full the ball was a grand success the dancers on the women's side were all married ladies with the exception of miss beulah and a miss lee and those on the opposite side were a terribly mixed mob but mostly gamblers horse-thieves and cowboys the railroaders didn't take any stock in the ball 
maybe it was because there were so many on the floor wearing six-shooters and bowie knives around their waists it was indeed a grand sight next morning looking at black eyes and swollen heads every chinaman there being a dozen or two living in town skipped for parts unknown that night there was too many loose bullets flying through the air to suit them and it is said that the pigtails have shunned toya ever since that new year's night a few days after new year's a telegram arrived to ash from garrett who had arrived at pecos station stating come on the first train as i am in a hurry to get home ash got me to answer it as he having drank too much tom and jerry was unable to walk to the telegraph office i sent the following message can't leave here oh every man in town in a few minutes another one came an answer to the one just sent stating if you don't come down on the morning train i will strike out and leave you this one raised ash's spunk so he told me to write down just what he told me and then give it to the operator i done as requested which ran thus go to hick ha e it damn you the next evening garrett arrived on the westbound passenger and next morning after paying a lot of saloon bills etc took old ash back with him i had the day after new year's went down to the pecos and brought my ponies up to toya therefore i took a little spin out into the country to pass off the time every now and then or at least to look through a few herds of cattle in that vicinity after spending about two weeks around toya i struck out for colorado city two hundred miles east of course i hated to part with miss beulah and so did mr newell hate to part with me for he was losing a good cash border chapter twenty seven a true sketch of billy the kid's life the cut on opposite page was taken from a photograph and represents the kid as he appeared before the artist after having just returned from a long tiresome raid and the following sketch of his short but eventful life was gleaned from himself ash upson and others the circumstance connected with his death i got from the lips of john w poe who was with garrett when he fired the fatal shot billy bonney alias the kid was born in new york city november the twenty third eighteen fifty nine and at the age of ten he in company with his mother and stepfather antrim landed in the territory of new mexico mr antrim shortly after his arrival in the territory opened up a restaurant in santa fe the capital and one of his boarders was the jovial old ash upson my informant who was then interested in a newspaper at that place often when ash was too busily engaged about his office to go to dinner mrs antrim would send it by her little merry-eyed boy billy who was the pride of her life finally ash sold out and moved to silver city which was then booming on account of its rich mines and it wasn't long until mr antrim followed and opened up another eating-house there with ash as a boarder again thus it will be seen that my informant was just the same as one of the family for quite a while the kid's first man as told to me by himself was a negro soldier in fort union whom he shot in self-defense his next killing was a young blacksmith in silver city whom he killed in a personal encounter but not according to law hence it was this scrape that first caused him to become an outcast driven from pillar to post out of reach of a kind mother's influence it was a cold stormy night when he after kissing his mother's pale cheeks for the last time on this earth rode out into the darkness headed west for the wilds of arizona where he soon became an adept at cards and horse-stealing he finally landed in the city of chihuahua old mexico with a pocket full of arizona gold here he led a gay life until one night when a bullet from his trusty revolver sent a rich mexican monte dealer to his long and happy home the next we hear of him is in the friendly land of texas where he remained in retirement until the spring of eighteen seventy six when he drifted across the lonely guadalupe mountains into lincoln county new mexico 
then the outlaw's paradise at lincoln the county seat he hired out as a cowboy to a young englishman by the name of tunstall in the spring of seventy eight mr tunstall was killed by a mob headed by a fellow named morton from the rio pecos the kid hearing of his employer's foul murder rode into lincoln from the tunstall ranch to learn the full particulars concerning the killing he and the young englishman were warm friends and before leaving the ranch he swore vengeance against every one of the murderers arriving in the mexican plaza of lincoln the kid learned that morton and crowd had pulled back to the rio pecos so he joined a crowd composed of the following named parties r m brewer j g skurlock charlie browder henry brown frank mcnab fred waite sam smith jim french mccloskey and johnny middleton and started in pursuit this was just the beginning of the bloody lincoln county war which you have all read so much about but it is said that the kid killed every man connected with the murder of his friend before the war ended billy was caught in a great many close spaces during the six months bloody encounter but always managed to escape as though possessed of a charmed life there is one of his hair-breadth escapes i wish to relate just to show how cool he was in time of danger he and about a dozen of his men were housed up at lawyer mcsween's in lincoln when thirty-five of the seven river warriors and two companies of united states soldiers under command of colonel dudley of the ninth cavalry surrounded and set the large two-story building on fire determined to capture or kill the young outlaw the house was burning on the south side from whence the wind came and as the fire advanced the little crowd would move further north into an adjoining room there was a fine piano in the parlor the property of mrs mcsween who was absent and on this the kid played during the whole time just to amuse the crowd outside he said finally everything was wrapped in flames but the little kitchen which stood adjoining the main building on the north but still the coarse music continued to sail forth out into the night air at last the blaze began to stick its fiery tongues into the kitchen then the music ceased and the little band headed by the kid made a bold dash for liberty amidst the thick shower of hot lead the balance can be described best by quoting a negro soldier's words he being nearest the kitchen door when the dash was made i just tell you white folkses dis nigger was for gettin away from dar case dat billy goat was shootin wid a gun and two six pistols all both at the same time the kid and tom o'falliard were the only ones who came out of this scrape unhurt mr mcsween owner of the burned building was among the killed he had nine bullets in his body late that fall when the war had ended kidd and the remainder of his little gang stole a bunch of horses from the seven river warriors whom they had just got through fighting with and drove them across the plains to the texas panhandle at tuscosa on the canadian where they were soon disposed of at good figures after lying around the little town of tascosa for nearly a month squandering their surplus wealth on poor whiskey and mexican women they with the exception of fred waite and henry brown who struck east for the chickasaw nation where the former's mother and two half-breed sisters lived pulled back to lincoln county new mexico to continue their lawlessness from that time on the kid made a specialty of stealing cattle and horses although he would kill a man now and then for what he supposed to be a just cause let it be said right here that the kid was not the cruel-hearted wretch that he was pictured out to be in the scores of yellow-backed novels written about him he was an outlaw and maybe a very wicked youth but then he had some good qualities which now that he is no more he should be credited with it has been said and written that he would just as soon shoot an innocent child as a mule-eared rabbit now this is all wrong for he was noted as being kind to the weak and helpless there is one case in particular which i can prove a man now a highly respected citizen of white oaks was lying at the point of death in fort sumner without friends or money and a stranger 
when the kid who had just come into town from one of his raids went to his rescue on hearing of his helpless condition the sick man had been placed in an old outhouse on a pile of sheepskins the kid hired a team and hauled him to las vegas a distance of over a hundred miles himself where he could receive care and medical aid he also paid the doctor and board bills for a month besides putting a few dollars in money in the sick man's hand as he bid him good-bye this circumstance was told to me by the sick man himself who at the time was hale and hearty on hearing of the kid's death while relating it the tears chased one another down his manly cheeks to the end at which time he pulled out a large red handkerchief and wiped them away after the kid's capture at stinking springs he was lodged in jail at santa fe and the following spring taken to mesilla county seat of dona ana county and tried before judge bristol for the murder of sheriff brady during the lincoln county war he was sentenced to be taken to lincoln and hung on the thirteenth day of may on the twenty first day of april he was turned over to pat garrett who being sheriff was to see that the law was carried out there being no jail in lincoln garrett used his office which was upstairs in the two-story courthouse to guard the prisoner in robert olinger and j w bell two men who should have been hung before william bonney was born judging from reliable reports were secured to do the guarding the morning of april twenty eighth garrett was making preparations to go to white oaks when he told the guards to be very watchful as the prisoner not having but a few more days to live might make a desperate effort to escape olinger who hated the kid they having fought against one another in the lincoln county war spoke up and said don't worry pat we'll watch him like a goat so saying he unlocked the armory a small closet in the wall and getting out his double-barrel shotgun put eighteen buckshot in each barrel then setting it back remarked at the same time glancing over in the opposite corner at the kid who was sitting on a stool shackled and handcuffed i bet the man that gets them will feel it the kid gave one of his hopeful smiles and said you might be the one to get them yourself after garrett left the two guards had five more prisoners to look after but they were allowed to wear their pistols for fear of being mobbed by a crowd of tularosa mexicans who had chased them into lincoln they had given themselves up to garrett more for protection than anything else they had killed four tularosa mexicans in a hand-to-hand -hand fight the day before hence the mob being after them one of those prisoners was a young texan by the name of charles wall who had received two almost fatal bullet wounds in the fracas of the day before it was from this young man mr wall whom i became personally acquainted with afterwards that i received my information from in regard to the kid's escape etc about five o'clock that evening olinger took the armed prisoners across the street to the hotel to supper leaving bell to guard the kid according to what the kid told after his escape bell became interested in a newspaper and while thus engaged he slipped one of his handcuffs which he could have done long before if the right chance had been presented and made a leap towards his guard using the handcuff as a weapon bell almost fainted on looking up from his paper he broke for the door after receiving a stunning lick over the head with the handcuff but the kid was right at his heels and when he got to the door and started downstairs the kid reached forward and jerked the frightened man's pistol which still hung at his side he having never made an effort to pull it bell fell dead out in the back yard near the foot of the stairs with a bullet hole through his body kid then hobbled or jumped his legs being still shackled to the armory and kicking the door open secured olinger's shotgun which contained the eighteen buckshot in each barrel then springing to an open window in an adjoining room under which the other guard would have to come to get upstairs he waited patiently for his meat as he termed it 
he hadn't waited long though when ollinger who had started on hearing the shooting came trotting under the window kidd called in a pleasant voice hello bob robert looked up but just in time to receive eighteen buckshot in his breast the kid then walked out onto the balcony fronting on main street and emptied the other barrel into the dead body of ollinger then breaking the gun in two over the balcony railing he threw the pieces at the corpse saying take that you s of a b you will never follow me with that gun again the proceeding was witnessed by nearly a hundred citizens nearly all of whom sympathized with the kid although they didn't approve of his law-breaking there was a few of his bitter enemies in town though but they soon hunted their holes each one trying to pull the hole in after him so as to be hid from the outside world after being supplied from the armory with a good winchester two colts forty five pistols and four belts of cartridges he ordered a file thrown up to him which was done without ceremony he also ordered the deputy county clerk's pony and saddle brought out into the street which was also done in double quick time the shackles being filed in two he danced around on the balcony quite a while as though he was the happiest mortal on earth as he went to mount the fiery pony which was being held out in the street and which had once belonged to him broke loose and ran back to the stable but he was soon brought back and this time held until the kid was securely seated in the saddle after bidding everybody in sight adieu he rode slowly towards the setting sun the winchester still gripped in his right hand but when he arrived at the end of main street he pulled off his hat and waving it over his head yelled at the top of his voice three cheers for billy the kid then putting spurs to the pony he dashed out of sight after travelling about four miles west he turned northeast across the capitan mountains towards fort sumner about the first of july garrett who hadn't hunted much for the kid since his escape received a letter from a mr brazil who lived near fort sumner informing him of the kid's presence in that vicinity garrett after answering the letter asking mr brazil to meet him at a certain spot on a certain night secured the services of john w poe one of the whitest and bravest men in the territory and taking his deputy kip mckinney along struck out for sumner to capture the kid if possible the little party of three arrived at the mouth of taben arroyo on the rio pecos where garrett had written brazil to meet him about dark on the night of july thirteenth they waited there all night and mr brazil failed to show up mr poe being a stranger in that country and not known to the post garrett sent him to the town a distance of five miles to try and learn by keeping his ears open and mouth shut of the kid's whereabouts while he and kip would meet him at sunnyside a ranch seven miles above sumner about sundown poe met his two companions at sunnyside but was no wiser than when he had left them garrett then concluded that they would all ride into the town and if pete maxwell was at home he could maybe get some information from him arriving in an old orchard back of the maxwell mansion about ten o'clock that night they tied their horses and crawled around to the front of the building there was a long porch on the south side of the house and about midway was pete's room the door of which opened onto the porch garrett knew where the room was and there they headed for on arriving in the front yard opposite the door of pete's room which was wide open the night being very hot garrett told his companions to lie flat down in the grass while he slipped into the room he found pete asleep but awakened him he then laid down by the side of pete and they began talking back of the maxwell house was an adobe cabin in which lived an old mexican peon the mexican had gone to bed and by a greasy-looking table sat the kid who had just come in from the hills he had pulled off his boots to rest his tired feet and was glancing over a newspaper throwing down the paper he told the peon to get up and cook him some supper as he was very hungry 
being told that there was no meat in the house he picked up a butcher knife which was lying on the table and said i will go and get pete to rustle me a piece he started without either hat or boots while walking along on the porch butcher knife in hand he discovered the two men out in the grass and drawing his pistol asked in mexican quienes quienes who's there who's there not getting an answer the boys thinking he was one of the peons he backed into the door of pete's room and then turning towards the bed which was to the left of the door he asked pete who is that out there not receiving an answer again and being suspicious of some one being in bed with pete he began backing towards the opposite side of the room at the same time asking who in the hell is in here and who in the hell is in here pete whispered to garrett that's him pat and by that time the kid had backed until the light shone full upon him through one of the south windows giving garrett a good chance to make a centre shot bang bang went garrett's pistol the first bullet took effect in the kid's heart while the second one struck the ceiling the remains of what was once a fond mother's darling were buried next day in the old dilapidated military cemetery without a murmur except from one a pretty young half-breed mexican damsel whose tears no doubt has dampened the lonely grave more than once thus ended the life of william h bonney one of the coolest headed and most daring young outlaws that ever lived he had dwelt upon this earth just twenty-one years seven months and twenty-one days end of chapters twenty five twenty six and twenty seven Chapters twenty eight, twenty nine, and thirty of a Texas Cowboy by Charles A. Seringo. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wrestling with a dose of smallpox on the Llano Estacado. After leaving Toya, I followed the railroad east across the Rio Pecos out on to the Llano Estacado and through the sixty mile stretch of sand hills at sand hill station about midway through the sand hills i left the railroad and branched off in a northeasterly direction in search of buffalo hunters camps knowing buffalo were getting scarce and having heard of a great many hunters being in the vicinity of cedar lake i thought it a good idea to go out there and see what kind of game they were killing being nearly south of the canadian river country i thought maybe they were killing cattle which had drifted down in there during the winters but i was mistaken i found their camps black with genuine buffalo hides there being no ranches in that wild scope of country the buffalo what few there were left had nearly all congregated in there i played a single-handed game of freeze-out the first two nights after leaving the railroad for there came a terrible snowstorm which covered up the buffalo chips there being no wood in that whole country so that i couldn't make a fire to warm by after striking the first buffalo camp then i was all right for i could get directions how to find the next one etc i finally by circling round to the east and then south struck the railroad again and landed in the town of big springs where i was mistaken for a horse thief whom i answered the description of and told to skip by one of my friends a stranger who recognized me as the turkey shooter from toya i didn't skip and the thing was finally straightened up to their entire satisfaction i was out of money by this time but found a draft in the express office awaiting me not having any particular use for the draft i swapped it off for a hundred dollars in money to the express manager after looking through a few herds around the springs i pulled northeast for the head of colorado river to take a look over the lum slaughter range which extended from the head of colorado river down to colorado city on the railroad a distance of about sixty miles i went to all the sign camps and also the headquarter ranch but didn't let my business residence or name be known which caused the boys to believe i was on the dodge 
i rode into the lively little town of colorado city one afternoon about four o'clock and imagine my surprise at meeting miss beulah newell on her way home from school she and mrs newell had left toya shortly after i did they had left mr newell at home to run the hotel and mrs newell had accompanied beulah to colorado city the nearest place where there was a school so as to keep the wild rattled brain girl as she called her under her wing they had rented a little cottage and were keeping house i ran out of money shortly after striking colorado city my expenses being high having to pay three dollars a day to keep my two horses at a feed stable and one dollar and a half per day for my own boarding lodging etc but found a good friend mr snyder a merchant who let me have all i wanted on my good looks until i could write to the ranch for some while waiting for an answer to my letter i would put in my spare time taking little spins out into the country looking through herds of cattle etc the longest trip i made was three days down on the concho river and that was just two days and a half longer than i cared to be away from miss beulah the mail finally brought two hundred dollars worth of l x drafts wrapped up in a letter from mr erskine clement reminding me of the fact that his company wasn't a first national bank this of course was a hint for me to be more economical having to be in mesilla new mexico a distance of five hundred and fifty miles by the last of march and wanting to look over some small cattle ranges on the route i struck out i hated to leave colorado city on account of beulah but was anxious to leave on account of the smallpox beginning to spread there a forty-mile ride brought me to big springs where i lay two days with a burning fever the morning of the third day i pulled out across the staked plains for the rio pecos still feeling sick that night i stopped at one of the section houses which were located every ten miles along the railroad and the next morning after riding about five miles i became so sick that i had to dismount and lie down in the grass after groaning and tumbling around about two hours i fell asleep about sundown an eastbound freight train came along which scared my ponies and awakened me i felt terribly my lips were parched my bones ached and my tongue felt as though it was swollen out of shape i started to lie down again after the noise from the passing train had died out but there being an ugly-looking black cloud in the north which indicated a norther i concluded to brace up and ride to the next section house a distance of about five miles arriving there just as a cold norther was springing up and riding up to the fence i called hello in a feeble voice a gentleman came out and on informing him that i was sick he told me to go in the house that he would unsaddle and take care of my horses i walked into a large room where a nice blazing fire greeted my eyes there was a lady sitting by the fire sewing on looking up at me as i stepped into the door she gave a scream which brought her husband in on the double quick smallpox smallpox was all she could say the gentleman looked at me and asked are you from colorado city yes was my answer well you have got it and i am sorry we can't keep you here tonight i hate to turn a sick man out such a night as this but i have got a wife and three little children here whose lives are at stake i had never thought of smallpox since leaving colorado city until the good lady put me in mind of it oh how my heart did ache at the thoughts of that dreadful disease and having to go out into the cold night air it was pitch dark and beginning to sleet when i mounted and struck out west aiming to go on to the next section house ten miles and try my luck there about half an hour after the light over my shoulder had disappeared i began to grow weaker so much so that i could hardly sit on my saddle so finally dismounting i unsaddled and staking the two hungry ponies out to a telegraph pole rolled myself up in my blankets my saddle for a pillow and went to sleep i awakened just as day was breaking the ground was covered with snow and i was almost frozen i felt as though i had been sent for and couldn't go 
my mouth i could tell by feeling it was covered with sores in fact it was one solid scab and so were my shoulders and back strange to say there wasn't a sore on any other part of my body those sores on my mouth was what attracted the lady's attention the evening before although they had just begun to show themselves then with great difficulty i saddled up and continued on towards the section house this time i made up my mind not to let the folks know where i was from and if they had cheek enough to ask i intended to say fort concho to avoid the sores on my mouth being seen i tied a silk handkerchief around it and should they ask any question about that i intended telling them i had some fever blisters on my mouth etc i found only one man the cook at the section house this time the section hands having gone to work i was treated like a whitehead by the cook who no doubt took me for a desperado or horse thief by my looks he thought no doubt the handkerchief was tied over my face to keep from being recognized i informed him that i was feeling bad and would like to lie down a few moments etc he led the way upstairs where the section hand slept and told me to occupy any of the dirty-looking beds there i laid down and told him to bring me up a cup of coffee he brought me up a good breakfast and after he left i undone the handkerchief and tried to eat but couldn't on account of my tongue being so badly swollen i found a looking-glass in the room and took a squint at myself and must say that i was indeed a frightful-looking aspect my face from nose to chin being a solid scab and terribly swollen no wonder i frightened the lady so badly i thought after drinking the hot cup of coffee i went downstairs gave the cook a silver dollar for his kindness and pulled out i was very anxious to get to a doctor and toya was the nearest place to find one unless i turned back to colorado city which i hated to do on account of having to attend court in mesilla soon i arrived in toya about noon of the sixth day out from big springs i headed straight for the alvarado house and who do you suppose was standing in the door when i rode up miss beulah the smallpox had scared her and her mother away from colorado city the first thing she said was hello what's the matter with your face oh, nothing but fever blisters was my answer i didn't dismount for fear of giving the pretty little miss the smallpox but rode a few blocks to dr roberson's office telling her that i was going after some fever medicine and would be back in a few minutes etc the doctor informed me that the danger was all over with and that if i hadn't been made of good stuff i would have surely died being exposed to bad weather etc he gave me some salve to dry up the sores that being all there was to do at that stage of the disease he said and advised me to leave town for said he if the citizens discover that you have had the smallpox they will have you taken to the pest house where there are already three occupants although the danger of it being catching from you is past i assured him that i would fix it so they wouldn't find it out on arriving back to the alvarado house my face still tied up i hired a boy to take care of my ponies and then telling miss beulah that i wanted a room to myself i went to bed beulah would bring my meals into the room and sometimes sit down to wait until i got through eating but i would never commence until she left i would generally let her stay until she got ready to go telling her that i wasn't hungry just then but would try and eat it after a while etc she would finally get tired and go then i would lock the door and undo the handkerchief from my face i kept this up a week before eating my meals at the table with the rest of the boarders i finally struck out for el paso two hundred miles over a dry waterless plain and another hundred up the rio grande valley making three hundred miles in all i hove in sight of the rio grande river one morning but never got there until sundown when i arrived within a few miles of the river i noticed a covered wagon and what i supposed to be a camp down the valley about three miles out of my way i finally concluded to turn off and go and stop with whoever they were for the night i found it to be a mexican camp an old man two boys and a grown girl 
they had come from laredo and were on their way to el paso they gave me a hearty welcome next morning about daylight i got up and went out to change croppy he having been staked and buckshot hobbled the evening before in a fresh place but lo and behold there was nothing there but the stake i circled around and found both of the ponies tracks leading towards the river a few hundred yards west i followed and found they had crossed over after standing on the bank a few seconds dreading to get wet i went over too the water was only about waist deep near the water's edge on the other side i found some moccasin tracks in the soft sand i could see through the whole thing then from indications and etc two footmen who wore moccasins had stolen my horses and pulled into old mexico for safety where the tracks were visible in the sand there was no doubt they had dismounted and taken a farewell drink or maybe filled a canteen before leaving the river after following the trail there being just the tracks of two horses a few hundred yards out from the river i turned and went back to camp to try and hire the old mexican's horse to follow them on the old fellow only had one pony his team being oxen and i had to talk like a dutch uncle to get it as he argued that i was liable to get killed and he lose the pony by the operation i finally though put up the price of the horse as security and promised the old fellow ten dollars a day for the use of him when i returned this seemed to give satisfaction even with the two boys who would have to hoof it after the oxen every morning in case the pony never returned just about sundown as i turned a sharp curve near the top of the long chain of high mountains which run parallel with the river i came in sight of both of my ponies staked to a pinion tree grazing i immediately rode out of sight dismounted tied my tired pony to a tree and crawled to the top of a knoll where i could see the surrounding country for half a mile around but i couldn't see a living thing except the two horses and the one i had just left finally bang went a shot which sounded to be at least half a mile away on the opposite side of the mountains thinks i now there's either a ranch over there and the two thieves have walked to it to keep from being seen from the horses or else they have gone out hunting to kill something for supper at any rate i took advantage of their absence and stole my ponies back near where they were tied was a small spring of cool water the first water i had seen since leaving the river after taking a hasty drink myself and letting the pony i was on fill up the other two not being dry i took a straight shoot down grade for the eastern shore of the rio grande a distance of about thirty-five miles it was then nearly dark i arrived in camp next morning just as the big yellow sun was peeping over the top of the sierra blanco mountains and the old mexican who was awaiting my return was glad to see me back that night i stopped with an old fat fellow by the name of charles wilson in the little town of camp rice and the next night i put up in the beautiful town of san elizario which is situated in the centre of the garden spot of the whole rio grande valley the next morning i crossed the river into old mexico and took a three days hunt through the mountains in search of a herd which had come from the north and had crossed the river at san elizario about a week before i found it but was unacquainted with any of the brands that the cattle wore the herd had been stolen though i think from the way the men acted i finally landed in el paso and found a letter in the post office from john poe written at lincoln new mexico advising me not to go to mesilla until the day that court set as cochlan who was out on bond was there and might have my light blown out i being one of the main witnesses against him also it had been reported that he had said he would give five thousand dollars to get me out of the way he furthermore advised me in the letter to take the train from el paso as the old fellow might have some mexicans watching along the road for me chapter twenty nine in love with a mexican girl i found el paso to be a red-hot town of about three thousand inhabitants 
there was also about that number of people in paso del norte across the river in old mexico i spent several days in each place i finally after leaving my ponies in good hands boarded one of the atchison topeka and santa fe trains for las cruces two and a half miles from mesilla the county seat there being better accommodations in the way of hotels in cruces nearly every one who was attending court would stop there and ride to the county seat in one of the hacks which made hourly trips between the two places consequently i put up at the montezuma house in las cruces there were several lincoln county boys there when i arrived poe and garrett came down next day mr and mrs nesbitt also came as witnesses against coughlin mrs nesbitt had heard mr coughlin make the contract with billy the kid to buy all the stolen cattle he could bring to his ranch but the good lady didn't live long afterwards for she her husband a stranger who was going from cruces to tularosa with them and a little girl whom they had adopted were all murdered by unknown parties coughlin was accused of having the crime committed but after fighting the case through the courts he finally came clear a few days after my arrival in las cruces i went back to el paso after my ponies i ate dinner there and rode into las cruces about sundown a pretty quick fifty-five mile ride considering part of it being over a rough mountain road the cause of my hurry was we couldn't tell what men at the coughlin case would be called up for trial i had a little love scrape while loafing in las cruces i don't mention it because my love scrapes were so scarce but because it was with a mexican girl and under curious circumstances that is the circumstances were curious from the fact that we became personally acquainted and never spoke to one another except by signs and through letters her name was magdalena ochoa niece of the rich bankers ochoas in el paso tucson arizona and chihuahua old mexico and she was sweet sixteen she lived with her grandmother whose residence was right straight across the street from the montezuma hotel and who wouldn't let a young man unless he was a peon come inside of her house and she wouldn't let magdalena go out of her sight for fear she would let some of the young gringos make love to her i first saw her one sunday morning when she and her grandmother were going to church i was standing out in front of the hotel hugging an awning post and wishing i had something more human-like to hug when they passed within a few feet of me the girl looked up our eyes met and such a pair of eyes i had never seen they sparkled like diamonds and were embedded in as pretty a face as was ever moulded her form was perfection itself she had only one drawback that i didn't like and that was her grandmother i immediately unwound my arms from around the post and started to church too the church house was a very large building and the altar was in one end the couple i was following walked up near the altar and took a seat on the right hand side on the dirt floor there being no such thing as seats in the building which was reserved for ladies while the left hand side of the narrow passageway was for the men i squatted myself down opposite the two and every now and then the pretty little miss would cast sparks from her coal-black eyes over towards me which would chill my very soul with delight when church was over i followed to find out where she lived i was exceedingly happy when i found she was a near neighbour to me being only a few steps across the street i spent the rest of that day setting out under the awning in front of the hotel straining my eyes in hopes of getting a glimpse of her beautiful form through the large bay window which opened out from the nicely furnished parlour on to the street but not a glimpse did i get i retired that night with the vision of a lovely sunburnt angel floating before my eyes the next morning i went to mesilla and answered to my name when it was called by the judge and then told poe that i had some very important business to attend to in cruces and for him in case the coughlin case was called to hire a man at my expense and send him after me on arriving back to the hotel i took a seat in an old armchair under the awning i was all alone nearly every one being in mesilla 
finally magdalena brought her sewing and sat down among the flowers in the bay window it was indeed a lovely picture and would have been a case of love among the roses if it hadn't been for her old grandparent who every now and then appeared in the parlour at last i having a good chance no one being in sight but her and i threw a kiss to see how i stood in her estimation she immediately darted out of sight but soon reappeared and peeping around a cluster of roses returned the compliment she then left the room and i never seen her again till after dinner i then started into the hotel but was detained by a voice calling through the closed blinds of a window near by me catch you me catch you come to find out it was the proprietor's wife mrs duper an old mexican lady who had been watching our manoeuvres she then opened the blinds and asked me in broken english what i was trying to do oh nothing much just trying to catch on is all was my answer the old lady then broke out in one of her jovial fits and said you catch on me bet you ten thousand dollars you no catch him she then went on and told me how closely the old lady grandma achoa watched her young niece in fact she gave me the girl's history from the time of her birth her father and mother were both dead and she being the only child was worth over a million dollars all in her own name this of course was good news to me as it gave my love a solid foundation and spread a kind of gold-like lining over the young lady's beauty finally after court had been in session two weeks the coughlin case was called up his lawyers were colonel ryerson and thornton while the territory was represented by newcomb district attorney and a j fountain whose services poe had secured mr coughlin began to grow restless for the pen stared him in the face there were eight indictments against him but the worst one was where he had butchered the cattle after being notified by me not to his only hopes now was to sugar the prosecuting attorney and that no doubt was easily done or at least it would have looked easy to a man up a tree you see coughlin was worth at least a hundred thousand dollars and therefore could well afford to do a little sugaring especially to keep out of the penitentiary at any rate whether the attorney was bought off or not the trial was put off on account of illness on said attorney's part until the last days of court when the case came up again mr prosecuting attorney was confined to his room on account of a severe attack of cramp colic judge bristol was mad and so was poe they could see through the whole thing now that night coughlin made a proposition that he would plead guilty to buying stolen cattle knowing they were stolen if the one case in which he had killed cattle after being notified not to would be dismissed or thrown entirely out of court it was finally decided to do that as then he could be sued for damages so the next day he pled guilty to the above charge and was fined one hundred and fifty dollars besides costs fountain our lawyer then entered suit against him for ten thousand dollars damage i was then relieved my mileage and witness fees amounted to something over a hundred dollars this time of course that was appreciated as it was my own over and above my wages it came handy too as i was almost broke and needed it to take me home i had spent all of my own money besides nearly one hundred and fifty dollars borrowed from poe it was the first day of may i think when i mounted croppy in front of the hotel threw a farewell kiss to miss magdalena who was standing in the bay window and started east in company with charles wall the young man i mentioned as being a prisoner in lincoln at the time of kidd's escape i hated to part with the pleasant smiles of my little mexican sweetheart but then it had to be done i still hold a rose and a bundle of beautifully written letters to remember her by we stopped at san augustine the first night out from cruces and from there we struck southeast across the white sands for the mouth of dog canyon the noted rendezvous of old victoria and his band of bloodthirsty apaches i had heard so much about this beautiful dog canyon that i concluded to see it before going home 
so that if it proved to be as represented i could secure it for a cattle ranch it was a ticklish job getting there by ourselves as a telegram was received in las cruces the morning we left that a band of apaches had crossed the rio grande at colorado killing three men there and were headed toward dog canyon but i had faith in croppy and buckshot they being well rested and hog fat carrying us out of danger should we come in contact with them we arrived at the noted canyon after being away from water nearly two days it was a lovely place at the foot of guadalupe mountains after leaving there we went through the following towns la luz tularosa south fork and fort stanton at the last named place charlie wall left me and i continued on alone i remained in white oaks a few days looking over my town property i having bought some lots and built some cabins thereon and examining the old panhandle tiger gold mine the one stone chambers and i owned i had some of the rock assayed and it run twelve dollars in gold to the ton besides a few ounces in silver and about two million dollars worth of hopes from white oaks i went through anton chico san lorenzo liberty and tascosa and arrived at the lx ranch after an absence of nearly eight months and about a three thousand mile ride chapter thirty a sudden leap from cowboy to merchant about the first of july shortly after my return hollicott sent me to kansas with a herd of eight hundred fat steers my outfit consisted of a cook chuck wagon five riders and six horses to the rider we arrived in caldwell kansas near the northern line of the indian territory about september the first after putting the cattle aboard of the cars and giving them a send-off toward chicago we all proceeded to take in the queen city of the border as caldwell is called i immediately fell in love with the town also with a couple of young ladies and therefore concluded to locate i bought some lots and contracted a house built with a view of going after mother i then struck out with my outfit to attend the fall round-ups in the vicinity of camp supply indian territory returning to caldwell the latter part of november i boarded a train for southern texas after mother by way of st louis to visit my sister whom i hadn't seen for thirteen long years i arrived in st louis one evening just in time to let an old flop-eared jew take me in to the extent of a hundred dollars for a lot of snide jewelry and a jim crow suit of clothes not caring to hunt sister until morning i went to the planter's house to put up for the night and to note the change of twelve years after taking a bath and getting into my new rigging i took a straight shoot for the office to make inquiries about the old boys i found a long-legged youth behind the counter who on asking how many of the old hands of twelve years ago were still there pointed out jimmy byron the kid i had the fight with behind the cigar and newsstand across the hall he was very busy at the time dishing out cigars etc to the scores of old fat roosters and lean dudes who were hurrying out after having eaten their supper the rush was finally over and when i made myself known he was terribly glad as well as surprised to see me we had parted as enemies but now met as friends he informed me that there wasn't but three besides himself of the old outfit left and those were the old steward who was now proprietor old mike who was still acting as night watchman and cunningham the fellow who had slapped me and who was still clerk the latter gentleman i didn't get to shake hands with as he failed to put in an appearance during my stay the next morning i struck out to hunt sister i was armed with an old letter which gave the address and therefore had no trouble in finding her she was alone with her three pretty little girls her husband having gone up town to his place of business a drug store when i found her the first thing she asked after kissing me was where i got my new suit of course i had to acknowledge that i bought them from a jew on fourth street she then became frantic and wanted to know why in the world i didn't go to humphreys and get them who in the dickens is humphrey i asked 
why i thought everybody knew mr humphrey she continued she took me up town to this great establishment of humphrey's that evening and there i learnt how badly i had been bitten by the jew i remained in the city about a week and my brother-in-law spent most of his time showing me the sights before taking the train for texas i bought mother a trunk full of clothes knowing that she would be in need of them after having roughed it for nearly eight years i stopped in houston one day looking for aunt mary but learnt finally that she had moved to the country i then took in galveston and spent two days visiting uncle nick and aunt julia from there i went to indianola on a morgan steamship and became seasick oh lord i concluded i would prefer the hurricane deck of a spanish pony to that of a ship every time in the town of indianola i met a lot of my old peninsula playmates who were there from matagorda in their sailboats with freight there being no boats down from Trespalacious, i left my trunk to be shipped up the first chance and went to matagorda with the two williams boys johnny and jimmy nearly all the peninsula folks lived in the vicinity of matagorda now since the great storm of eighteen seventy five washed everything they had out into the gulf besides drowning about half of their number hence me going to matagorda to visit them there were three trespalacious boys in matagorda and one of them jim keller loaned me his horse and saddle to ride home on mother was happy when i told her to get ready and go to kansas with me there was only one thing she hated to leave behind and that was her woodpile she had spent the past two years lugging wood from along the creek and piling it up against her old shanty for old age she said i suppose her idea in piling it against the house on all sides was to keep it from blowing over should some kind of an animal accidentally blow its breath against it after spending about a week visiting friends and waiting for my trunk to arrive from indianola i struck out with mother for the enterprising state of kansas i hired a neighbor mr cornelius to take us to the railroad fifty miles north he hauled us in an old go-cart one that had been sent from germany in seventeen twelve drawn by two brindle oxen we arrived in caldwell a few days before christmas and after getting mother established in her new house i went to work for the l x company again i had secured a winter's job from mr beals before leaving therefore it was all ready for me to take charge of on my return the job was feeding and taking care of about two hundred head of horses at the company's ranch on the territory line near caldwell having lots of fat ponies to ride i used to take a dash up town nearly every night to see how mother was getting along and to see my sweethearts thus the winter passed off pleasantly about the first of march i received orders from mr beals who was then at his home in boston massachusetts to get everything in shape to start for the panhandle at a moment's notice that very night after those orders were received i fell head over heels in love with a pretty little fifteen-year-old black-eyed miss whom i accidentally met it was a genuine case of love at first sight i wanted her and wanted her badly therefore i went to work with a brave heart and my face lined with brass it required lots of brass too as i had to do considerable figuring with the old gent she being his only daughter just three days after meeting we were engaged and at the end of the next three days we were made one and three days later i was on my way to the panhandle with an outfit of twenty-five men one hundred horses and six wagons an eighteen days drive southwest brought us to the l x ranch after laying there about a week resting up hollicott sent me and my outfit south to attend the round-ups in the red river country we arrived back at the ranch about july the first with three thousand head of l x cattle which had drifted south during the past winter as i was anxious to get back to kansas to see my wife and mother hollicott immediately gathered eight hundred fat shipping steers and started me i arrived in caldwell september the first and after shipping the herd mr beals ordered me to take the outfit back to the panhandle and get another drove 
this of course didn't suit as i had only been at home a few days but then what could i do i hated to give up a good job with no prospects of making a living by remaining in town i finally concluded to obey orders so started the men and horses up the territory line while i and sprague went to town with the wagon to load it with chuck mr beals had taken the train the day before to be absent quite a while after getting the wagon loaded and ready to start i suddenly swore off cow-punching and turned everything over to mr sprague who bossed the outfit back to the panhandle the next day i rented a vacant room on main street and rolling up my sleeves and putting on a pair of suspenders the first i had ever worn started out as a merchant on a six-bit scale thus one cow-puncher takes a sensible tumble and drops out of the ranks now dear reader in bidding you adieu will say should you not be pleased with the substance of this book i've had nothing to say in defence as i gave you the best i had in my little shop but before you criticise it from a literary standpoint bear in mind that the writer had fits until he was ten years of age and hasn't fully recovered from the effects finis end of chapters twenty eight twenty nine and thirty End of a Texas Cowboy, or Fifteen Years on the Hurricane Deck of a Spanish Pony, by Charles A. Seringo.